Bakugo was going to die. And what a shitty death it would be, stuck in the middle of nowhere, frozen in his damn car, all because it was snowing too hard. No one would find him until spring at this rate. A very pissed off frozen popsicle with a last written will of no one gets any of my stuff. I leave it all to my ghost. He hated winter. He hated snow and cold and ice. He hated that instead of having the holidays in the city where he could sleep wrapped up in his blanket all day and only go to his parents for dinner, they all ended up in some snow mountain resort where Bakugo couldn't even go on decent hikes because the cold weather left him wet with chattering teeth in 15 minutes. He hated all the idiot families running around him, all the idiot tourist bullshit, all the scratchy resort sheets and shower heads with terrible water pressure. He hated winter. He wanted Christmas and New Year's and all the rest of it to be over already. Now he wouldn't even make it that far. He was going to die in his car all because of black fucking ice and his phone giving him shitty directions. Or refusing to follow said directions. But really it was all the same when you could barely read the roadsides with all the snow falling from the sky. Bakugo swore up and down he was going to haunt everyone so fucking hard because of this. All around him snow was still falling. He wasn't entirely sure how long he had been sitting there. When he crashed, he smacked his head hard as the airbags went off. He blacked out at some point, blinking back to reality with a throbbing head that, when he touched against his forehead, his fingers came away tacky with blood. It had to have been for only a few minutes, because he could still see out of his smashed windows. Sighing heavily, Bakugo sat back in his seat, wondering how long he'd have to wait for the sweet release of death to take him away from this hell. His head was throbbing, his body ached, nothing was broken, he figured at least, while wiggling his fingers and toes, but it was likely he had a concussion. And here, everyone he knew was always so worried he'd get lost while mountain climbing or fall down some rocky ravine and die, but no. He wished. At least with the mountains and rock walls he would have been able to look up at a blue sky and die while warm, sunburned probably but better than slowly losing feeling in his limbs while watching them turn black before falling off. He wanted to shout, to yell, but knew none of that would do any good. He'd managed to find his phone in his car, fallen on the ground, cracked a bit, but otherwise still looking fine except, of course, there was no signal out this far in the middle of nowhere. Typical. Bakugo wondered if it would be worth it to get out, see if he could follow the road to the nearest town, if that nearest town was near enough. Frozen dead in his car, frozen dead, lost in the woods. Both options sounded just peachy. Or maybe he'd just get lucky and a car would drive by and see him. Would have been easier if the crash just killed me. He huffed, throwing his phone back to the passenger seat, useless beyond not dying without a soundtrack. But music right now sounded too melodramatic for his taste. He closed his eyes, shifting to get as comfortable as his sore body could in the crushed up driver's seat hoping that at least if he fell asleep it would all come quicker. Bakugo pulled his jacket tighter around him even so, clenching his jaw to stop from chattering in the biting cold that seeped in quickly through the cracked windows and smashed exterior. He hated the fucking holidays. A dog barked and Bakugo's eyes snapped open. He wouldn't be surprised if Hell did have dogs, but as soon as he jerked and felt the sharp biting pain of cold all through his limbs, he knew for a fact he wasn't lucky enough to be dead yet. His headache felt worse now, throbbing behind his eyes and down his neck. He hissed, turning away from where the bark came from. The outside world was darker, both from the sun falling further behind the trees and the layer of white snow covering most of his windshield. The bark sounded again, followed by the sound of crunching snow growing louder, far too bold to be that of a dog. Another bark, and then muffled sounds, a voice calling. A tap on the window right by his head. Bakugo doesn't jump, but it's fucking close. Anyone in there? You alright? Comes the voice muted by snow, but still sounds far too loud to Bakugo's aching head. Yeah. He calls back, voice cracking from how dry his throat is. Just peachy. Would love to get the fuck out of here, though. He can't see anything out of the window besides an inky, shifting figure. The voice sounded like a man, but that man could also be a serial killer. What type of person is out in the middle of nowhere with the snow coming down like it was? A murderer, that's who. But hey, 
Bakugo figured he was irritated enough with the entire situation to get over the numb feeling in his fingers so he could make a fist and punch if need be. A hand came up to the window, wiping away what snow it could, unable to fully scrape away all the ice coating the glass. But at least now Bakugo could see a mostly man's shape with features and what looked like a shock of red hair under what he assumed was a winter hat. Bakugo glared back at the face peering in, hoping the guy could see the details just enough to know he was pissed. Uh, just let me see if I can get the door open. The guy says, and then there's a jiggle of the car handle that doesn't budge the door at all. Hold on. Another jiggle, and then a swift, strong yank that cracks ice and pulls at whatever bent-up metal was in the door hard enough that it swings open wide and fast. Bakugo winces, bracing himself for something, but nothing comes. So when he looks up now, the world outside is gray with dusk and snow flurrying around. He's even colder, sharp and sudden, but his rescuer stands in front of the door blocking the strongest gusts, bends down to look at him with wide eyes and a look of growing concern on his face. His eyes are red, and his nose is pink, and the few strands of hair that Bakugo does see are red as they escape from underneath the warm hat that he wears. The same color as his eyes, and sure, Bakugo shouldn't give a shit about what this guy looks like, but he still takes note. He's not thinking straight. He looks almost like some stupid red angel in Bakugo's pain-ridden head. He still might be dying. He wonders if he actually cares if this guy is the one who's come to take his soul away. Can you move? He asks. Bakugo pulls himself out of his thoughts and huffs. Probably, but I might need some help. Grab my... He was going to say arm, but there's no pause at all as this guy ducks down and shoves his arms under Bakugo's legs and behind his back lifting him up with apparent ease to pull him out of the car. Every part of his body is stiff and the movement makes his muscles hurt, but the hands against him are warm and the chest he's being cradled against feels much the same and at this point in his shit-tastic life, Bakugo could not care any less. The guy looks at him up close and frowns. You're bleeding. Bakugo rolls his eyes. Was. It dried up. Now my head just feels like it was cracked open. Also, I'm cold as shit. His better attitude doesn't seem to ease the guy at all, but it does get him moving. He hears a bark again just as the stranger turns away from his car. A dog, large and fluffy looking, darts out from the trees, bounding around in the snow, circling while still barking. Bakugo wants to kick it with how loud it is. Fucking hell, can you get that thing to shut up? He hisses, wanting to rub his temple, but that would require pulling his very cold hands out from where they're pressed between his and the other man's chest to keep warm. The guy gives him an apologetic look before whistling sharp, almost as bad as the barking for the second it lasts, but with it the barking stops too. Riot, quiet, come on. The dog follows as they crunch back up the small incline Bakugo's car had fallen down, away from the tree line. Instant relief floods through him as a truck comes into view, still running with the headlights on. Anything but a smashed up piece of shit. The man drops him off in the passenger's side as gently as he is able. The seat is covered in dog hair, but the heater is on and Bakugo will care about the hair later as he shifts as close as he can to the warmth. Melting into the seat as very slowly the bitter cold leaves his body. He's still shivering, he realizes entire body jittering as he thaws out, unable to control how he shakes, but slowly it eases. His muscles still feel tight and tense, but the heat helps a little, enough that he can let out a sigh, closing his eyes. He doesn't register that the guy doesn't return right away. When he hears the driver's door open and close after some time, he lets one eye crack open to see the guy shifting the truck back into gear, his dog panting happily in the back seat. Where the fuck were you? Bakugo manages to rasp out. The pain running through his limbs is shifting into exhaustion. He wants to sleep again now that he's warm, but he also knows that falling asleep with a stranger driving him who knows where is probably a bad idea. Murderer and all, right? The guy side-eyes him, but there's a slight smile at his lips. Just went back to grab some of your stuff I figured you'd want. Found your phone, suitcase in the back. You snowboard? Bakugo grunts doesn't answer, because he does, obviously, if he had a snowboard in the back of his car. It's the only thing he cares much to do while stuck in a ski resort for weeks on end. The guy's not offended by his lack of answer, just laughs. My name's Kirishima, by the way. Kirishima Ichiro. 
He bites his tongue before responding. Bakugo. The guy, Kirishima, is still smiling. Well, Bakugo, you're lucky I saw the tire marks and saw your headlights in the snow. The storm would have killed you for sure. Bakugo's rolling his eyes without even thinking about it. Gee, thanks. He doesn't want to talk anymore. He wants to sleep. He wants to be under his blankets at home and fall asleep on his couch, only waking up to move to his bed and fall asleep there. His head hurts. He might be passing out. He's not sure. Things are getting fuzzy and dark. Kirishima still might end up being a serial killer driving him to his murder cabin in the woods, but right now Bakugo doesn't think he'd mind as long as he did it quickly. His head hurts too much to care. Behind him, the dog, Riot, is panting too loudly in his ear. Uh, Bakugo, I'm not sure it's safe for you to fall asleep. Shut up. He grunts right before his body slumps against the truck window, cheek pressed against the cold glass, and he's out. Bakugo realizes he's actually awake when he's staring at a field of flowers. He has never, and will probably continue to never dream about anything like flowers, let alone fields of them. When he forces his eyes to focus on them, they're generic looking and a little faded. Nothing like the typical generic artwork scattered throughout the lobbies, lodges, and hotel rooms of the resort he's supposed to be in, which probably means he's not at the ski resort. He blinks, and with the soft throb behind his eyes, it all comes rushing back. The crash, the snow, the giant man who either rescued him or has him locked up in some room to feed to his dog later. All good, you're awake. A soft voice interrupts his thoughts. Bakugo blinks again, pulling his gaze from the strange pastel flowers down to a little woman with nearly closed eyes and a bun pulling her hair tight to the top of her head. She's small looking like a grandmother more than anything, but she's got a white coat on in a room that, when Bakugo glances at the walls behind her, are mostly white except for the occasional poster on how to cover your nose properly when you sneeze or how to go about washing your hands correctly. She must be some sort of doctor, which also means... You took a serious bump when you hit that tree. Right. The guy wasn't going to kill him. He took him to a doctor because he was in a car crash. Bakugo glanced back up at the painting of flowers hanging on the ceiling, wondering if that's so when people do wake up in a doctor's office they're soothed instead of freaked out. It doesn't really work, he thinks. Slowly, he sits up. His body feels a little shaky, a little weak, which he simply grits his teeth through without a sound until his back is against the pillow his head was resting on a moment ago. Yeah. He finally says, taking in a breath. The little old lady is smiling at him. Bakugo glares. Think I could have figured that one out, seeing as I was the one in the car. He gingerly touches at his head, but instantly regrets it with a hiss as his fingers find the gash he got, thread now pulling it closed. The woman laughs under her breath. Yes, well, Kirishima brought you to my office after he found you. Lucky for you, I was just getting ready to close up and head home for the storm. Nothing too major, thankfully. That cut on your head is probably the worst of it, and you do show signs of a concussion, though our current conversation tells me it's more mild than I originally suspected. Beyond that, you'll be bruised and banged up for a couple of days, but I think you'll heal up nicely. Candy? She holds out a bowl of what appears to be jelly beans, to which Bakugo only stares at for a few seconds before grunting his no. How long have I been out? He asks when he finally gets his head wrapped around it all swinging his legs over the examination table, paper crinkling loudly under him. The little old lady shrugs. Oh, only two hours or so. I was going to wake you up shortly if you didn't on your own. No place to be for a blizzard, you know. Now before I let you go... Where the fuck am I supposed to go? Hush, look at me. Bakugo is surprised by how strong her grip is when she grabs his chin, forcing his head down to her eye level as she shines a little flashlight into both of his eyes. If he was feeling like his brain didn't just get scrambled, he might have resisted more. But he was still tired and a little nauseous, and this wasn't exactly his first concussion. She smiles when she's done, letting him go. All right, I'm deeming you releasable, but under supervision. He glares. 
supervision who the fuck here are a few pills for the pain a muscle relaxer if you need it and make sure to drink plenty of fluids get lots of rest she wasn't listening shuffling around her office picking up odds and ends that she then shoved into his hands with a pat on the cheek come now out out need to get home before the snow gets too deep he's still confused and lost not just from the head injury now but this old lady and what the fuck was happening as she started pushing him up and out the door of the exam room. She keeps pushing as he stumbles down the hall, still trying to get his feet working properly, still trying to get his mind wrapped around it all. He's never wanted to fight an old lady as much as he has right now as she flips off the lights as they pass. Bakugo feels the need to punch the wall by the time they're out in the lobby. He doesn't get the chance as he stumbles out and finds the same giant, could-be murderer Kirishima sitting in the waiting room. He looks too big for the chair he's sitting in. You're all right, he says, immediately standing up. Bakugo is still glaring. He doubts the constant tension is good for his headache. Who the hell are you to care? Kirishima rescued you and called me up to make sure you weren't in serious danger, came the old lady. Bakugo got the impression if she had had a cane, she would have smacked him in the back of the legs with it. Now he's going to take you home and keep an eye on you for the storm. Doctor's orders. Huh? Kirishima looks sheepish, wrapped up still in all the winter wear, rubbing at the back of his head. Bakugo thinks there's color on his cheeks under the flaps of his dumb hat. Well, you shouldn't exactly be alone after that accident. The motel is locked up tight right now because of the snow. We don't typically get visitors besides some family this time of year. And I figured I've got plenty of room for you to stay. I already took your stuff over. My stuff? promise as soon as the storm passes we'll get you in an actual motel room just circumstances and all the guy looks embarrassed at the very least so this probably wasn't his initial idea but he still agreed to go along with it letting a complete stranger into his home staying with a complete stranger for who knows how long with how bad the snow might come fuck bakako tries to ignore how his stomach feels too tight at that thought he groans fine doesn't exactly sound like I have much of a choice now, does it? Bakugo sits in the back seat of the pickup truck, not being cruel enough to make an old lady sit behind him. Besides, he was perfectly happy sitting in the back, ignoring the other two still practical strangers, even if he now knew the woman's name was Dr. Shusenji. And she did have a cane, having tucked it between the car's center console and chair. Kirishima had helped her to the car and practically picked her up to get her into the seat. It was ridiculous watching the giant of a man lift the little old grandma into a truck. It was something close to irritating to watch. He'd climb in soon after, thankful of the four doors, having brushed off the offered hand of help from Kirishima, refusing to make any form of eye contact as he strapped himself in. There's dog hair all over the back seat. He suspects the semi-folded blanket on the floor across from him may have been there in an attempt to protect the cloth seats, but it was no use. There is, from what Bakugo can tell, another half a dog worth of fur back there, and Bakugo found himself cursing as he tries to keep it from sticking to his clothes. Stupid dog. The drive is slow going with how heavy the snow was coming down. It was dark out with only the headlights of the truck to guide them, but thankfully it seemed Kirishima was far too familiar with the roads and his truck was up for the challenge. Still, they travel at what feels like a snail's pace through the small town. In the distance, or in between flurries of snowflakes, Bakugo can make out the little stores and shops that line the streets, a majority of them with their lights off and abandoned for home. They turn and the storefronts broke off into houses speckled further off from the road, a neighborhood only established by proximity. Here, more lights show so Bakugo can fully feel the life that he felt was lacking in the mountain town thus far. Even with the snow blinding his vision, he can see the rainbow assortment of lights glowing in the distance, some flickering through repetitive patterns. They line the edges of every house they pass, some spreading from the main display to cover close by trees and bushes, all sparkling bright and happy even with the storm. It makes everything look like a distant fairy tale he can't quite make out or touch. It's annoying. Christmas is annoying. Bakugo's entire body jerks as the truck comes to a sliding stop that ends in a sharp push of the brakes. He's quick enough to brace himself against the seat in front of him, slamming his head against the back of Kirishima's headrest. I've already been in one accident, don't get me in another, bastard. 
Bakugo shouts even as Kirishima opens his door to leave the truck idle as he moves to help Dr. Shuzenji from her seat. The force of the cold instantly chills Bakugo down to the bone as the driver's door stays open, reminding him that he's still not dressed for the winter. He was only wearing a sweater when his car skid off the road, his coat in the back seat and all of his snow gear packed up in his suitcase. He's still only wearing the sweater. The heat blashing up from the vents is sucked away before it gets back to him with every gust of cold wind that blows into the car. He wants to scream. He holds it in, attempting to not make his head hurt any further, but doesn't know if the buildup of pressure is worth it. All of the circumstances right now are completely ridiculous, from the open door, to his too thin sweater, to the fact that he is watching a stranger say goodbye to another stranger after having helped her to her front porch and into her house while his car was probably buried five feet in a snowbank right now. The worst part, beyond the stupidity of it all, is how he can't control any of it. Bakugo can feel his anger at the situation grow the more he thinks about how there's nothing he can truly do right now to pull himself back up. He has a concussion, no vehicle, no phone. No nothing beyond the kindness of strangers in a strange town a week out from Christmas. He curses, kicking the front seat sharply, not minding the slight jolt of pain that goes through his leg with the action. He does it again and again and again until finally the front door is closed and the cold left with it. Kirishima staring back at him with a confused expression on his face. There are snowflakes all over his clothes, sticking to the strands of hair not tucked away under his hat. They melt quickly against his cheeks. He blinks back at Bakugo. You know, you could have moved up to the front. There's more room. Nothing about him kicking the seat. Nothing about his obvious frustrations. Bakugo huffs, crossing his arms, and slumps back against the truck bench, turning his head to look out the window at the gray-black world around him, all speckled with rainbow shards. Just shut up and drive. The drive out to Kirishima's home is longer than the drop-off of Dr. Shuzenji. He seems to live a little further out from town, not as surrounded by family homes or shops. Bakugo hasn't even realized they've still been driving on an actual road when the flurries give way to a shine of porch lights. His driveway is long and covered in snow, but Kirishima takes the path like it's nothing, pushing his truck through until finally they park in front of what Bakugo can only figure as his garage. Much of their drive was made in silence, not that it was Kirishima's doing. Bakugo refused to answer anything he asked more in depth than the few grunts he'd let out with a series of shrugs in between, not caring if Kirishima had heard or noticed them at all. At some point, he had given up attempting to ask anything, which Bakugo was grateful for. He was tired, after all, and Kirishima seemed far too awake and aware for the time. It had to be getting close to ten at night, he guessed but couldn't tell with how dark the storm was making it seem. Being close enough to fully see it now, Bakugo takes note that Kirishima's home actually does look very nice. Cozy, his brain first supplies, but immediately blocks it out. Bakugo is used to the city. He himself lives in an apartment by himself, closer to three different coffee shops than the nearest park. His parents have a house, and it's where he grew up in more of a suburb, but still it looks nothing like this. Where he's used to modern looks, sharp angles, clean, minimalistic styles with his parents, Kirishima's place looks like it'd been built by hand, which, out here in what seems like the middle of the woods, it might have been. It has the feel that it might have started as some sort of log cabin and through the years simply expanded into the grand cottage. Bakugo has little time to examine the exterior as he quickly darts from the truck to the front door, nearly slipping on an icy patch in the path he takes in his haste to get to the door. Kirishima is right behind him, getting the lock open as quickly as possible as Bakugo stands shivering on the patio, pushing his way in as soon as he can and almost instantly regretting it. God damn it! He shrieks, bracing himself against the heavy mass of fur and joy that barrels right at him as soon as he's through the threshold. Get your damn dog off me! The dog whines and lets out small excited barks shoving his front paws up onto Bakugo's stomach in an attempt to say hello before his owner comes through behind him, shutting the door to the snow outside. All right, come here. Did you miss me? Kirishima is down on his knees, petting at the wriggling ball of fur, yelping happily as he circles him. The dog props up on his shoulders, looking at whatever open patch of skin he can find, which is met with more pets and a deep laugh that feels like it shakes through Bakugo's very core. Okay, okay, riot, okay, down. He pushes the dog gently back, who still barks happily, 
tail wagging behind him as he turns his attention back to Bakugo, ready once more to charge. No. Thankfully, Kirishima is quick to catch him, pulling him back by the collar. We have to be gentle with guests. Gentle. For the most part, the dog seems to understand. Letting out a few more excited short yelps, but doesn't run to jump on Bakugo again. Kirishima stands then, wiping his face of dog slobber before starting to pull off his coat. Sorry about that. He just really likes people. He tries for a smile, but all Bakugo returns is a glare. Yeah, I can see that. They stand in the entrance for a second longer, silent except for the clicking of Riot's nails on the floor. Kirishima looks like he's biting the inside of his cheek the way the skin pulls. A nervous habit, Bakugo is sure. Which is just stupid, seeing as he is the one currently standing in a stranger's home. Uh, Kirishima pulls off his hat. Are you hungry? Bakugo stares, and he hates that he does. He had been expecting the red hair, sure, but not so much how long it is, how full. He doesn't expect it to frame his face like that or hang in his eyes without it all shoved under a hat, and when Bakugo finally looks down, he isn't expecting Kirishima to be wearing the flannel that he is pulled tight over broad shoulders and chest. His gaze quickly shoots up from where he's staring at a straining button, eyes sharp as he asks, Do you have a phone? Kirishima seems to falter at that. The slump of his shoulders made more obvious by how tall he is and how wide they are. Oh, yeah, of course. I did find yours and put it with the rest of your stuff, but the screen is cracked pretty bad and I think the battery died, so... He's rambling, though Bakugo realizes it's not as annoying as what he's used to. It's more trying to figure out how the conversation should end instead of getting lost in his own head. When Kirishima pulls his phone from his pocket and offers it up, Bakugo is quick to grab it with a short, grumbled-out thanks before he moves on into what he assumes is the den or living room. It dips a solid foot lower than the rest of the house, wood floor turning into carpet with a drop. It's nearly long enough to be shag. A TV is set up in an old, bulky entertainment center opposite of a couch that Bakugo is sure is older than he is. A simple, low-wood coffee table separates the two. He sits down on the couch, finding it less lumpy than he suspected it would be. Fingers tapping out the memorized number as his leg starts to shake. If he was standing, he's positive he'd be pacing around the room. Bakugo silently hopes that the call would go unanswered. No such luck. Dad. He starts out as soon as he heard the familiar hello. It's Kotsky. I... Kotsky, thank goodness. You should have been here hours ago. We were getting worried. He sighs, pinching at the bridge of his nose. I know, I'm fine. I hit a patch of black ice and crashed into... You got into an accident? Dad, fuck's sake. This guy picked me up and... Where the hell is that brat? Bakugo immediately winces, hearing his mother start up in the background. He'd hoped to get this over with either before she realized he was on the phone or lucked out and he'd have caught his dad while she wasn't around. The last thing he needs right now is some sort of lecture. Dad, shit. Tell her I'm fine. Dad. Again, no such luck. He hears a small little squabble and some clattering of the phone before he closes his eyes and tries to breathe as deeply and calmly as he can. Kotsky? Where the hell have you been? Not even calling us to say you're late and now you crashed your damn car? You make it sound like I crashed into a fucking tree on purpose, you hag. You're just lucky you're- Another little shuffle sounds. Some hushed voices and words Bakugo can't quite make out. He sighs again pinching harder so he can feel the throb of pain right behind his eyes. Thankfully, his dad is used to this, and after being married for years of dealing with his family's fighting, he's decent at de-escalating a situation. It still helps that they weren't in the same room. Kotsky, sorry. She's just been worried about you. But you're all right? Yeah. He continues, settling down a bit. Like I said, a guy saw me and picked me up, but there's a huge blizzard coming through, so it's not like I'll be leaving anytime soon. I think I'm about an hour out from the resort, but without a car. He hears the smile in his dad's voice when he speaks again. It makes him feel better. Don't worry. As long as you're safe. We'll figure the rest out later. Does your phone work? Is this number good to reach you later? Uh. Bakugo looks over his shoulder at Kirishima across the way in the kitchen, acting like he isn't listening to whatever bit of his conversation he can catch. Yeah, this one should be good. All right, be safe. The repetition has Bakugo gritting his teeth, but he's still grateful for it. 
Thanks, Dad. The call ends and Bakugo can't decide if he feels better for it. He lays back against the couch, feeling more exhausted now than when he sat down. He figures this wouldn't be the worst spot to fall asleep in, but he knows the knot he'll get in the back of his neck come morning will do nothing to help with the concussion pains. He hopes this dumb place has a spare room in it with how big it is and how it seems only occupied by a man and his idiot dog. Hey. He calls over his shoulder, looking up to find an upside-down Kirishima standing with a bowl of what he thinks is dry cereal in his hands, eyes owlishly wide. He doesn't think there's any milk in the bowl. I need to make another call. Oh, no problem. Go right ahead. Bakugo grumbles, slumping back down against the cushions as he keys out another number he has memorized and really wishes he didn't. Still, he'd much rather this one pick up than his parents. His voicemail will be ten times worse if he doesn't pick up. Thankfully, it clicks at the third ring. Hello? Deku, how's the cat? K Kachan, I didn't recognize the number. He snarls. No shit, nerd. This isn't my phone. How's the damn cat? Yes, right. Uh, she's good. From the corner of his eyes, Spakako can see Kirishima come around from the end of the island, sit up against the edge that faces the den. He's not even trying to pretend to not listen now when Bakugo wants to smack him. She's got her blanket and all that shit. It was snowing when I left. Gotchon, you've been gone for like half a day. Besides, I mean, she's outside and not even technically. Shut up, Deku. She's my cat. I feed her and she comes around every day meowing at me like a stupid bitch. You fed her, right? He hears a heavy sigh over the line and wishes he could reach through the phone to choke out the curly-haired moron. If Bakugo had a choice, he wouldn't have chosen Midoriya to cat sit, but he had little choice in the matter. Last time he let Shinzo watch her, Bakugo swore if he came home a day later, he would have catnapped her, the creep. Yes, Gachan. You literally label the containers for me. She's had dinner and is currently... There's a pause, the sound of a sliding door, and the Midoriya is back. Sleeping in the bed on your balcony. It makes him feel better hearing it and knowing that Midoriya wouldn't lie about that. Bakugo wouldn't stoop low enough to ask for a picture, but if he just so happened to get one, he wouldn't be too angry about it. Good. If anything happens, I will kill you. Yeah, yeah. You threatened me enough before leaving. Now, goodbye, Kachan. Have fun skiing with your parents. Midoriya hangs up before he can say anything else, making him curl a fist around the phone, squeezing it tight in his hand before he remembers it isn't his and he shouldn't break the phone that might possibly be the only working one in close proximity during a snowstorm. Besides, it's not like he needs to tell Deku of all people he got his head split open crashing into a tree. Bakugo counts to ten in his head instead, breathing in through his nose before he's able to finally stand up without feeling like he wants to punch the wall. Kirishima is staring at him from the kitchen island, munching away on his dry cereal. Bakugo glares, handing over the phone. So, you're a cat person? His nose curls. Don't listen in on other people's conversations, asshole. He turns away as his face felt like it started heating up. At his back, he can feel Kirishima beaming too bright for his own good. Bakugo refuses to give him the satisfaction. Now, where am I sleeping? I'm tired as shit. When Bakugo wakes up, he wakes up in a panic. His entire body jolts violently, sitting up like a shot, his arms raised and his lungs burning from how quickly he's inhaling oxygen. His brain supplies the little fact that he's hyperventilating. He's aware of this, but his body is still drawn tight, unable to fully process this information. His body is overheated. Sweating, with the sheets and quilt he was sleeping with tangled tight around his lower half, making the panic rise up further as he can't move well enough. Bakugo thrashes, pulling at the bedding until he's able to swing his legs over the bed and have his feet touch the cold wood floor. It shocks his body enough that he gasps, taking in a much-needed deep breath. He breathes. It's been a while since a nightmare has been that bad. It takes him a too long minute to recall his former therapist's words, instructing him on how to breathe, on how to focus. It's slow work, but soon enough he's closing his eyes. He used to be much better at this. He used to think he'd be over it all by now, too. Bakugo breathes. He's in the same place he fell asleep in. The bedroom is small, but comfortable. 
The bed sat on a sturdy wooden frame that didn't squeeze at all when Bakugo lay down on it, much to his surprise. A small nightstand stained a deep green sat beside the bed, pushed up against the wall with a dusty lamp on it. On the opposite wall is a closet, closed, with Bakugo's luggage in front of it. His snowboard leans against the wall. There's a window on the wall the bed is butted up to, green curtains drawn closed to keep the morning light out, but some still creeps in between the fabric, casting the room in a dim gray light. He can hear the snow still falling outside, the wind whipping up against the wall outside. Bakugo focuses on all of these details, eyes slowly lingering from corner to corner to take them all in, recalling each from before he fell asleep. He touches every finger to his thumb twice over, counting every single time. He breathes in deep, letting the tension run out of his body from his head down. He relaxes his jaw, his shoulders, lets his ribs fall back and his spine curve. He wiggles his toes and focuses. He is here, now, in the same room he fell asleep in. The one Kirishima had shown him to the night before. The one he had locked the door in and gone to bed. He looks... The door is still closed, still locked. Bakugo breathes and gets up. The night before, Kirishima had shown him to the bedroom, apologizing for how dusty it might be as he didn't use the spare room much. Bakugo didn't ask what the rest of the house was for with Kirishima being the only one to live there. He'd noticed at least four other doors down the hallway he was escorted down, though one was indicated to be the bathroom should he need it. His belongings were already there when Kirishima opened the door his cell phone placed on the nightstand. There were two quilts set at the foot of the bed, one crisscrossed with shades of blue and green plaid while the other had a gaudy floral print that was dull and faded from age, Bakugo could only assume. Hiroshima had done nothing but smiled at him before wishing him a good night, reminding him that if he needed anything the house wasn't that big and he'd come if called. Bakugo had grunted, closed the door on him, made sure to lock it before throwing his pants off and falling asleep almost instantly when he landed on the bed. He had woken up maybe two hours later, shivering, managed to crawl under the covers of the bed, pulling both quilts over him to fight off the biting cold, and dry swallowed two of the pain pills Dr. Shuzenshi had given him before falling back asleep. He figures now, with the head trauma and the unknown surroundings, that that must have brought the nightmare about. He can reason that now, but still hates that it happened happens. Bakugo snarls at nothing in particular as he grabs a pair of thick cotton pajama pants to pull over his legs and a sweater over his head before leaving the bedroom for the bathroom, cursing with how cold the floor is under his feet. He needs to get his socks on right after he pees. He doesn't know what time it is by now, only that it's morning enough with how the sun is shining bright to cast light through the windows with the snow still fiercely falling outside. The lights in the hall are on, and when Bakugo finishes in the bathroom and manages to find a pair of socks in his suitcase, he hears what he can only assume is his gracious host moving around in the kitchen. There's a small debate going on inside of him whether it's worth it to go out and greet the irritating redhead, but the decision is quickly made as his stomach rumbles loudly, reminding Bakugo that he hasn't actually eaten anything since nearly noon yesterday. Fucking dumb necessary bodily functions. He isn't surprised when he walks out to first, get attacked by Riot once more wanting to say hi, and second, after a sharp whistle that got the dog to back off, is greeted with a too wide smile and an overly warm good morning. Bakugo wants to snap at him that he's making far too much noise for it still being so early, he thinks, mainly just to pick a fight so he can get some of his aggression out, but his plan quickly falls to complete and utter shit as every word, fighting or not, flies out of his head with Kirishima standing in his kitchen completely shirtless, and a pair of boxers that cling far, far too well to his thighs. Yesterday, he hadn't fully noticed or even had the opportunity to see what exactly Kirishima had been hiding under all his layers of winter clothes, but now. Fucking Christ above, it was really too early for this shit. Aren't you cold? Is the first thing he manages to say when he finally regains the ability to speak taking note that in some regard he has to be because even from across the kitchen, Bakugo can see how goddamn hard his nipples are. Kirishima must be too stupid to be embarrassed or too confident to care because he's laughing at his question. He grabs up a blanket that was folded over a chair at the small kitchen table, throwing it over his shoulders to use as a shawl as if that was helping anything at all. Sorry, he says, moving back over to the kitchen island where he appears to be fixing up some coffee by the smell of it. 
I'm not really used to having guests over this early. I'll remember to grab a shirt next time. Next time, like there isn't time now to walk down the hall and grab a shirt from his bedroom. No, instead, he's using a blanket that does nothing to cover his chest or arms with how thick they are. Muscles built up tight, skin a glowing tan that didn't make sense in December at all. His damn stomach and abs and hips that narrowed in perfectly to his goddamned Bakugo glares. This house has too many blankets. Whatever. He mutters, reining in his eyes long enough to move into the kitchen, taking a seat at the small table by the window. Pour me a cup of coffee and tell me you have something besides dry cereal to eat and I might let it slide this once. Kirishima still looks like he's about to laugh again. At what this time, Bakugo's not entirely sure, but he's thankful that he doesn't. Instead, he goes searching through his fridge for something like forever when Bakugo still doesn't have a hot mug in his hands. After a few minutes, he comes up, humming softly as he suddenly seems to remember the first part of their deal and grabs a mug from the cabinet. Milk or sugar? Black. When the full mug is pushed in front of him, Bakugo finds himself feeling much better with the ceramic between his palms, heating his hands until they feel burned. The first taste leaves him simply wanting more, and the second makes him realize how rich Kirishima likes his coffee. He can appreciate that. He feels a little more human when he looks up at Kirishima next, his core warming with the hot liquid now pulling in his stomach. He's taking out eggs from the fridge, butter, a bowl from the cabinets, and a pan from beside the fridge. It's a little awkward actually watching him, Makago realizes, his actions stuttering when he moves to get the pan out and grumbling between different spatulas when he goes to grab them. The knife he gets out looks like he's preparing to cut up a chicken instead of a few cubes of butter. Makago can feel his eye twitching. Do you have any idea what you're actually doing right now? He finally asks after finding he can't watch this disaster unfold any longer. Uh... Kirishima gives pause as he stares between the kitchen table where Bakugo sits and the utensils he's pulled out for himself. I mean, I could totally make something. I just usually don't. More of an instant type of guy. Bakugo sighs, forehead falling to the table as he wants to bang his head against it, but resists as the pressure he's putting up against the stitches right now isn't exactly pleasant. After a quick countdown from ten, he's up again and pushing away from the table, rolling up the sleeves of his sweater. Well, you made decent coffee, so you're not entirely useless. Now move over. I can't bear to watch you struggle through whatever eggs you were going to make. He doesn't have to actually nudge him away from the island, but he does just a little bit as Kirishima quickly backpedals away. His bicep felt entirely too solid under Bakugo's fingers, a fact that he tries desperately to not focus on as soon as it enters his mind. It takes him a second to actually orientate himself within the kitchen, going through a few cabinets in the pantry to grab an item or two. The fridge is actually well stocked, much to Bakugo's surprise as the man before him doesn't seem the type to keep fresh vegetables or meat, and instead more of the expired milk and instant ramen type of guy. The spices Bakugo finds up in a high cabinet seems like they've been untouched for a while, left half empty so at least Bakugo knew that there was a time when they were used. He pulls down the salt, pepper, and cayenne regardless and finally gets to work. Kirishima is watching him from a bar stool, eyes wide as he watches Bakugo work. It's not as if Bakugo has experience in any sort of professional kitchen, but he decided at a young age that anything worth doing was worth doing to the best of his ability and beyond, which also came down to cooking on nights when both of his parents were out either for business meetings or date nights. He broke the eggs easily, whisking them together while butter melted in the pan, making sure to keep an eye on it so it never got too hot. He'd found enough cheese in the fridge to make a simple omelet for the two of them, quick and easy with how empty his stomach was right now. When he brought the bowl over to the pan, he felt more than saw Kirishima follow him. His height didn't completely tower over Bakugo, but still there was enough difference that he could easily look over his shoulder to watch him cook. The feeling of heat seeping through his sweater was immediately evident as he leaned in closer, unaware of what personal space was. With the small distance, Bakugo could understand why Kirishima didn't seem overly phased by the cold in the house, his body feeling like a furnace at his back. Get any closer and you'll drool into the food. Bakugo says, throwing a glance over his shoulder to directly meet Kirishima's eyes, who thankfully takes a step back. He was close, really close. Sorry, he replies. I just haven't seen many people so confident in the kitchen like that before. It's so manly. Bakugo snorts, rolling the eggs as he pours more in. 
They're just eggs, idiot. Well, they certainly look and smell like good ones. He takes the compliment easily, feeling the familiar swell of pride rise up in his chest. He knows he's good. He doesn't need to be reminded of it by anyone. But still, for some reason, those words go straight into him and twist up his stomach in a tight knot. He's glad when he's finally done, sliding each onto plates and spinning around to serve them both, peppering his with more cayenne than anything. Though Bakugo has made this time and time again growing up, honestly, it's just eggs and cheese. Hiroshima eats it as if he's never tasted anything so good before. With every bite, he has his eyes closed, makes these noises in his throat like he's really trying not to, but they come out anyway. Bakugo watches him from his own stool at the island, amazed with how quickly the other man eats and how excited he seems about the meal. By the time Kirishima finishes, Bakugo is still staring at him with the now cold bite held in his mouth and his coffee mug held loosely in his hands. Dude. Kirishima smiles, looking as though he's contemplating licking his plate. That was so good. Where'd you learn to cook like that? It takes a second for Bakugo to blink, swallowing quickly. I've lived on my own for a while, and when I was young, I hated not being able to eat what I wanted because I didn't know how to cook it. He takes another bite. Also, my mom's terrible in the kitchen. Kirishima snorts. My mom was great. She was always cooking or baking something. It never stuck with me. She always said I could never stand long enough to actually finish anything. When Bakugo looks, he's smiling like it's a fond memory. His eyes are staring down at his plate, distant, and Bakugo is reminded of the many spices still cluttered in the cabinets, all half-used. She was... He was quick to change the subject. Well, I need a shower. He pushes his half-finished plate towards Kirishima, knows his stomach is going to hate him in an hour, but doesn't really care right now. He doesn't want to finish and thinks Kirishima would appreciate the seconds. He downs the rest of his coffee in one big gulp. Finish that if you like it so much, and heads back out towards the hall. It's not a lie, needing a shower. When he focuses, there's the tacky feeling of dried blood in his scalp. He can feel the clammy feeling of cold sweat on his skin built up from his night of thrashing. He needs to brush his teeth, all of it, but mostly he just needed to get away. He's known Kirishima for roughly 24 hours at this point. He's still a stranger and Bakugo's trying to decide how much he wants to break that down. How many lines he does and doesn't want to cross if this is where he'll be stuck for the coming days. There's a reason Kirishima lives out on his own in the middle of nowhere in a house too big for only him. There's a reason he smiles down at empty plates and doesn't know his way around his own kitchen. Bakugo just thinks he's too afraid to ask right now. He's never been good with other people. He's barely good with himself. Bakugo locks the bathroom behind him, having gathered his toiletries and change of clothes from the spare room. There's already towels hanging with a washcloth neatly folded on top of them, soap and shampoo lining the tub when he takes a second look. He has to wonder if they were already there before he arrived or put out after he went to sleep the night before. He assumes the latter, and for some reason, that pisses him off. As he showers, Bakugo watches the little flakes of blood peel from his skin and hair disappear down the drain. He washes as gently as he can, trying his hardest not to tug on any of the stitches keeping his head pulled together. But still, there are spots of blood that come away on his fingers. The water clears them away quickly. He needs to ask for a bandage when he's done, if Kirishima has any. It's a process, but mostly because his body still aches from the crash. His shoulders are sore. His neck protests certain angles. He knows as soon as he can he should leave to go get fully checked out by his doctor. But he's not sure when that'll actually happen at this rate. He stays under the water for a long time after he's done washing up. He lets the heat of it run the chill from his limbs. Let's the steam grow thick and heavy in the room, fogging up the mirror. He should feel bad for using up all the hot water, but can't bring himself to care in the slightest. He thinks he could fall asleep again, given a little time. He doesn't. After dressing again in jeans and a long sleeve shirt with another sweater over top, feet clothed in his socks, he ventures out. Bakugo finds the kitchen tidied up once again, all the dishes washed and spices put away. He grabs his mug, cleaned, and pours himself the last of the coffee in the pot, drinking it in deeply while leaning against the kitchen island just as the front door slams open. Bakugo did not jump, and barreling in came Kirishima and Riot. Kirishima dressed in much more than just his underwear and a loose blanket this time. 
though snow was now clumped up in each of their hair. Bakugo watches as they both shook away the stray flakes from their hair like, well, like dogs. Man. Kirishima laughs, towing off his boots to kick by the door and hang his coat once more. It's seriously coming down out there. Gotta be two feet already. Can't see much at all. Thought Riot disappeared a couple times. The dog barks at the mention of his name, giving another good shake from head to tail before trotting off down the hall to one thing or another. Bakugo quirks a brow up at the dog, carrying the look over to Kirishima as he sips lightly at his coffee. Right. And whatever do you do to keep entertained while you can't see much at all outside? He immediately thinks about high stacks of old movies and worn-out novels on a shelf. Uh... Kirishima looks at him as if he's never had to think about that question ever. He looks almost nervous about answering. Do you like to work out? It's so predictable. God, Bakugo hates that he didn't actually think about that being an option himself. Of course, someone who looks like they were chiseled from marble to celebrate the gods would have some sort of gym at home. A fucking course. Bakugo hides his smile behind his coffee mug. I do, actually. Whatever unease Kirishima had seemed to melt away instantly with the answer. He looks giddy again, overly happy in a way Bakugo is starting to associate with him, even with the short period of time they've been together. Kirishima waves his hand, ushering him to follow down the hallway. They pass both the room Bakugo's staying in and the bathroom, pass the two other doors on either wall until they get to the end. The hallway, Bakugo notices, continues on down towards the right, but he doesn't keep his eyes in that direction for long. Kirishima swings the door open in front of them, letting Bakugo step into what he can only think of as a very well-kept personal gym. Shit, dude. He breathes, eyes wide at the variety of equipment kept in the small space. It might have been another old bedroom once before, or maybe even someone's office or study, but now there's a bench sitting to one side with a bar surrounded by a tower of weight plates. There's another collection of dumbbells close by, and towards the back by the window is a stationary bike squeezed in beside a treadmill. The other side has a couple of yoga mats laid out and a TRX set up, ready and waiting. I've got some other stuff in the garage, kettlebells and stuff, if you prefer, that is. I mean, whatever you want. Use it whenever you want. Bakugo shakes his head, huffing. No wonder you're so jacked. Kirishima flat out blushes, turning to look at his feet instead of Bakugo. Well, you know, physical health is important. And here I thought I'd be going nuts having to watch crappy old movies all day. The lights flicker. Kirishima curses softly under his breath, running off quickly back down the hall towards the kitchen just as the lights flicker again. Everything going dark and gray with only the dullness of the outside to light the way for a second before power returns. It doesn't stay long. The storm outside rages louder pounding, and the electricity bends sharp against it until, finally, it all snaps. The entire house goes gray, the power shutting down, and after a few breaths, Bakugo realizes it's probably not coming back on. Kirishima returns shortly after, coming down the hall with two flashlights in his hands, face cast in the soft light still filtering in from the gem's window. Well, he says with a smile still even now with the house completely and utterly quiet without the hum of electricity around. The snow and wind call outside, mocking. I'm glad you don't like movies. God damn it. It's cold and only getting colder. Bakugo can deal with the lack of light. Darkness didn't scare him, even if it was annoying to not know your way around a strange home which ended in a lot of bruised toes and shouted swears. But the lack of heat is going to get very, very annoying very, very quickly. It's only been an hour, and he's already grabbed one of the quilts from his room to wrap around his shoulders, quietly cursing the storm and every higher power that brought him here. He might not freeze to death in his car, but he will surely freeze to death in this house. Don't worry. Kirishima rolls his eyes with good humor, something that Bakugo found extra irritating. I'll start a fire. You can come into the living room and keep warm there. No need to start sharing body heat just yet. He doesn't think that Kirishima winks at him, 
but he might have missed it when his brain shorts out for that split second when he mentioned sharing body heat. Bakugo figures it's best to keep quiet about that, lest he bring attention to the way his cheeks heat up. He replaces the slight embarrassment and slight we will not discuss that emotion right now with his typical rage, letting out a t through tightly clenched teeth even as he follows his host down the hall, passing the home gym. The hall opens up into a large open living room, which makes Bakugo pause for a second, surprised by how big the house really is. He didn't get a good look at it the night before, given the storm, darkness, and his concussion headache. But now he's impressed and curious once more as to why a single guy lives in such a huge place with just a dog. There's a sliding glass door that leads out to a patio in the forest beyond, everything covered with white and gusts of more falling everywhere. The fireplace is surrounded by a couch and matching love seat, a small coffee table separating the two at the corner with another TV off-centered near the fireplace. Two doors border the living room, one which Bakugo could only guess would lead to the garage simply by the placement of it. The other, he assumed, either led to another bathroom or bedroom, maybe even some sort of study, he wasn't sure. He didn't care enough to ask right now as he watched Kirishima kneel down at the fireplace, grabbing for the stack of wood sitting near it. He gave a soft glare as he took a seat at the end of the love seat closest to the fireplace in anticipation of the warmth to come, but still cautious. Honestly, he couldn't help himself if he tried. When's the last time you got that inspected? Kirishima pauses as he's arranging the wood. What? He turns, looking genuinely surprised by the question. Inspected? The fireplace? I'd rather stay freezing than burn to death or die of carbon monoxide in my sleep. You didn't even look up Bakugo. Kirishima let out a short little huff of laughter. Are you implying that I'm going to accidentally kill us? Possible. You might be forgetting something or getting lazy. Kirishima scoffs. Snowstorms living in the woods. Being cold happens a lot. This isn't my first fire, you know. Not mine, either. That gets him to stop arguing back at the very least. Kirishima looks at Bakugo for a few seconds, sitting on the couch wrapped up in his quilt with his legs tucked up against his body. He lets his head hang with a heavy sigh, giving in. All right. He stands up, gesturing to the open fireplace. You're so worried. Be my guest. Bakugo doesn't hesitate to get up, throwing the blanket from his shoulders as he picks up the flashlight given to him earlier. He ducks his head down into the fireplace, moving the grate aside as he does looking up with the light, humming softly to himself. It looks clear, clean. He ducks back out, inspects the floor, cleaned off beside some stray ashes and smears of black left behind. The wood also appears good, old dry logs cut into small enough lengths. Your smoke and carbon monoxide detector have batteries. Change them twice a year. Bakugo looks back with a scornful look that is only returned with Kirishima looking smug. Bakugo squats back down, grabs up the wood to start stacking it up in the fireplace, knowing he'd rather just do it himself than watch Kirishima and judge him the entire time. Kirishima is close by watching him, leaning against the brick exterior, staring down. What'd you say you did again? Didn't. Bakugo grunts out, shifting a piece against another. Firefighter, if you must know. Ah. Uh, Kirishima nods. This all makes sense now. I don't need it to be my literal fucking job to know you have to have your fireplace inspected. And I do. He sounds legitimately offended this time around. I get everything looked at before every season. I'm not letting something as preventable as a house fire destroy this place. That would seriously just be a sad way for it all to go. All that hard work lost. There's something there, probably, but Bakugo focuses on the fire instead of on Kirishima's words. He doesn't want to ask questions. When the wood is set up how he likes it, Bakugo silently asks for the matches with an outstretched hand and is pleased when Kirishima gives them to him without any resistance. The fire is started in no time. The cover leaning against the wall is moved in front as it grows stronger, bigger, and the bright glow illuminates the room, the heat spreading. Bakugo gives a tight nod, watching the flames for a moment before turning back to grab up his quilt once more throwing it over his shoulders to keep all the warmth close. I could have done that. Right. Bakugo looks back at him. 
It's dark outside again, the day having disappeared quickly, which only leaves them even more in the dark besides the orange lights of fire and flashlight. So, mister, I'm so fucking prepared. I'm assuming you have some portable cookware or something so we don't starve to. Kirishima is back to smiling. You know it, Mr. Fireman. Bakugo's stomach twists. He thinks he's going to really regret getting personal on any level. Bakugo doesn't even ask when Kirishima pulls out the two portable little stovetops, pushing him aside even as the man comments that yes, they are safe for indoor use, but Bakugo already knows this, is familiar with the brand, and is quick to turn them on. Not having a full breakfast and no real food for most of the day yesterday is taking its toll, both on his body and attitude, even if the latter is only fixed slightly with food. He raids the fridge and pantry for a few minutes, pulling out some veggies, chicken, whatever spices he can find, and a half-empty bag of rice. Kirishima just watches him like he had during breakfast, only commenting when Bakugo seemed lost in finding certain things. Cutting board was next to the fridge. The good knives were to the left of the stove, helping him only when Bakugo seemed to be getting frustrated. When he finally has everything he figures he needs, and sure, there will be some improvising, because though Kirishima seems to have stocked up on his supplies, a lot of it doesn't seem very coherent. Like he didn't have an actual meal in mind when shopping, which he is almost positive is the case. Bakugo pauses with a tomato in hand, looking up at Kirishima. He squints at him. How spicy is too spicy for you? Kirishima shrugs. However you like, it'll be fine, I'm sure. I can handle a lot. Oh. Bakugo thinks, grinning wide, and starts chopping. He is far too pleased with that answer. Oh, he's going to regret that. Kirishima doesn't know him well enough to be scared when he smiles. A little fact that Bakugo is cruel enough to exploit. This'll be fun. It is. When Bakugo finishes the chicken curry, letting it simmer as the rice is just a minute behind, he's still smiling. Kirishima has been watching him cook for most of it though he's gotten up to check the fire a couple of times and make sure Riot is okay, but Bakugo doubts he has any idea what he's really getting into. His amusement is only slightly dampened as he knows he could have done better with better supplies. Some of the spices were expired, the peppers in the fridge not what he would have preferred. But Bakugo is nothing if not resourceful. Tasting it all as he cooked, he knows he's made it as well as he's able with what he's been given. As Kirishima comes back from the living room for the third time, Bakugo has plated the curry and rice for both of them, sliding Kirishima's meal across to him alongside a tall glass of milk that he was kind enough to pour for him. Go on. Bakugo isn't laughing just yet, but he can feel it starting to swell in his chest. Eat up. He takes a spoonful himself and easily swallows it down as if to show an old emperor that yes, the food wasn't poison, please enjoy. His cheeks hurt from smiling so much as Kirishima takes his first bite, swallows, and then takes another. It takes a second, two, and then Kirishima coughs, coughs again, swallows, which is almost immediately a mistake as he continues to cough, choking slightly, before grabbing the glass of milk to drink it down as quickly as possible. He doesn't learn immediately, or rather, Kirishima wants to seem tough, maybe. Bakugo loves it as he watches him put another mouthful on a spoon, this time mixed well with the rice, and sticks it into his mouth. He doesn't swallow it, though. Instead, after a few chews, he decides spitting it out is better as his eyes start to water with the heat on his tongue. Bakugo is dying, teeth tugging at his lips, trying his hardest not to laugh. He finally breaks when every time Kirishima looks like he's about to try for another bite, he spits it back out and goes for the glass of milk. Bakugo can't help himself. He laughs. Dude. Kirishima wheezes, finishing off the glass of milk and finally pushing the plate away. How the hell do you... A cough interrupts his sentence. Eat this. You said. Bakugo snickers, his laugh still caught in his throat as he finally takes his own first bite of the curry, swallowing it down easily and going for another. However I like it, this is how I like it. Like you're eating the devil's asshole. Bakugo really loses it now. Laughter forcing him to choke on his own food, which ends in him leaning heavy on the counter and he coughs, the sound mixed with broken bits of laughter. 
Bakugo can feel tears forming in his own eyes for an entirely different reason than Kirishima. It kind of feels good. It takes another minute for him to finally stop laughing, get his breathing back under control. His face hurts from smiling, his stomach much the same. He settles, they both do, but Bakugo's still grinning as he eats. Thought you said you could handle it. Bakugo. Kirishima whines, looking like a kicked puppy, staring sadly down at his food. This isn't normal handle. It tastes great, except for the constant burning and nose running. Bakugo rolls his eyes. Well, he turns, going into the fridge to pull out another plate with curry on it, a little more mild in color than what he served previously. He's dealt with people who can handle it before. This might be more your speed, then. It is, apparently, though he's slightly impressed when Kirishima mixes the two together a bit, getting the best of both worlds or to prove he can handle a little bit more than what Bakugo gave him credit for. They move from the kitchen back into the living room to eat and keep warm, though Bakugo thinks the fire now in his belly might even be better than that of the actual physical heat. It's a perfect combination that leaves him feeling okay for the first time since he left to go on this damn Christmas trip. Honestly. Kirishima breaks the comfortable silence they've fallen into as Bakugo scrapes the last bit of curry up with his last mouthful of rice. How are you eating that and not dying? It's just how I've always liked things. He says, setting his plate down on the coffee table for the time being. I didn't even have all the stuff to make it perfect, though I don't always make it this hot. You challenged me, though, and I needed to make a point. Don't feel bad. I put that shit on others. Your reaction wasn't the worst. Kirishima is smiling at him with humor in his eyes, not taking the little trick personally at all as he continues to spoon rice into his mouth. It's nice, seeing as the last time Bakugo did that he was lectured about it for hours. It wasn't his fault that Ida was a cocky son of a bitch that needed to be taken down a peg. Is everything about you spicy? Bakugo bristles a little and Kirishima notices. Not like, I didn't mean it as a bad thing. He doesn't. Bakugo can tell he doesn't. He's not entirely sure Kirishima has the capability to even be purposefully mean. His nature of always smiling and being cheery seems ingrained in him. Bakugo tries to brush it off. He knows in the back of his mind he should let it go. But he's heard this before, and even if Kirishima isn't trying to cut him down like some people have, he can't stop his mouth from opening like it always does. What about you? Bakugo throws out, quick and defensive, biting. This whole shitty nice guy thing more than a front. On the other couch, Kirishima is immediately tense. The atmosphere shifts quickly from pleasant to uncomfortably still, like the heat from the fire and the cold of the air clash all together in the middle to create a thunderstorm at the point of contact. Bakugo reacts immediately to that coiling in on himself as though he was too ready for some sort of attack. Kirishima was bigger than him, but Bakugo could at least put up a fight. Except there's no fight. There's not even a remark thrown back in spite or some sort of defense. Kirishima takes it, rolls his shoulders, and moves on. How's your head, by the way? He's nice. He's too nice. He shouldn't be this nice. Bakugo doesn't deserve to be there. He should be dead. He sighs, releasing the fight in his shoulders as he leans back until he's laying on the love seat, legs bent to fit his entire body on the small couch. He doesn't look at Kirishima anymore, finding the fire much more worthwhile right now. He pulls his blanket closer. Fucking fine. Only feels like I crashed my car a little bit. Which is true. His head had grown into a mild annoyance at this point even if every hour or so it throbs painfully to remind him there's still a huge gash there. He hopes his hair will be able to cover the scar that will form later. Well, that's good at least, says Kirishima, settling on his own couch, a lighter-looking blanket thrown over his legs. The dog is laying on the carpet in front of the fireplace. Where were you going anyway? If you don't mind me asking, I mean, I know you were talking to your parents, I think, yesterday. Bakugo doesn't want to make small talk when two seconds ago he was ready for some sort of fight. 
He'd much rather just sit in silence until the warmth spread through his body and sleep overtook him again. No such luck. He takes a second to finally answer, hating how Kirishima still seemed comfortable in his company. It's our stupid Christmas tradition, I guess. My parents have been taking me up to the ski resort here for years now, since I could remember. We do all the Christmas bullshit there because it's just the three of us, so we always figured it was kind of a waste to have a huge dinner and a tree and all that. The resort takes care of it all. I left a day later than them because of work, and now we're here. The fire crackles, flickering. It'll probably need another log or two soon. Sorry you couldn't be with your parents instead. Bakugo's gaze goes back to Kirishima. The idiot is also staring at the fire, his face looking too soft and too longing. Not like you're the one who crashed into the tree for me. Besides, I fight with my mom too much. He crosses his arms, dips lower into the couch. This is all fine by me. The sad part is that's not a lie. As soon as Bakugo was old enough to leave, he did. It may have just been running off to a college dorm, but it was still better than being home. It led to more fighting for the first few months, but after that it settled. They all got used to him being a little further away, even if there was still the air of worry whenever he came home. The silent words and overly soft touches to his shoulders, and maybe he would pick more than one fight with his mom then, but it was still better. He needed the distance. He needed to know that he could breathe on his own. Christmas time had always been their family vacation, but even then the tradition of it left Bakugo's skin crawling after so many years. He didn't mind the time off work or snowboarding down slopes for a couple of days, but being stuck with only his parents as real company got irritating quick. My family always loved the holidays. Kirishima cuts in through Bakugo's own thoughts, catching him off guard. Warning sirens are going off in his head, but there's no way to stop them. My mom would cook these huge meals and we'd have all sorts of people over. My dad would put up all the lights and have everything glowing so bright me and my brother could barely sleep at night with our curtains drawn. Bakugo doesn't need this information. He doesn't want it. Kirishima's looking too far off and it's too much of something Bakugo knows he doesn't want to touch. Still, his stomach feels too deep, his throat dry. He asks, Why aren't you with them? Kirishima looks at him, surprised, as though he wasn't expecting Bakugo to say anything, let alone ask something like that. There's silence that is too long, and the more Bakugo keeps looking at Kirishima, the more the other man keeps looking back. The fire makes everything about him glow like ambers. It's a good color on him. His eyes are shiny, wet, and Bakugo clenches his jaw tight when he notices. Uh, my brother lives a couple hours away now in the city. He moved after school when he met a girl. They're happy. After that, my dad moved down there to be with him. The harsh winters here were getting to be too much for him. It took some convincing. He loves the mountains, but it's for the best. Kirishima's eyes flicker down. His hands are curling tight in the blanket that he has with him. Riot looks up from where he's resting, back at his owner, feeling his tension. Bakugo doesn't want him to say anything else. Kirishima continues. My mom passed away a few years back. She got really sick. It's one of the other reasons my dad moved out, but I promise to stick around and take care of this place. Bakugo bites the inside of his cheek, tearing the soft skin under his teeth. Why? Well, you know. Kirishima shrugs like it's obvious, like there's not tears in his eyes, like Bakugo is some old friend who knows the story already. I grew up here. My dad built this place for my mom, for us. He looks up at the ceiling, at the rafters high up like he's looking for ghosts. I could never leave it behind. Like it's obvious, like it's logical, like Bakugo should understand how that feels. Like it's just the same old, same old holding on so tightly to the past. He doesn't understand it. He's always been good about not looking back. I wouldn't know the feeling. He says after a beat, glaring at the fire now like it offends him. He doesn't miss how Kirishima wipes at his eyes. Something thick makes his throat feel too tight, like he's done something wrong. I'm sorry. 
Bakugo stands quickly, not wanting to hear that word and whatever else might follow it. He doesn't need Kirishima's pity when the guy just cracked open his own ribs and threw his heart out on the table. He doesn't want another sob story. I'm fucking tired, Knight. Uh, oh. Kirishima chokes, standing with him, his hands up like he's trying to figure out what exactly to do with them. I mean, you could sleep out here so you're warmer with a fight. No thanks. Bakugo doesn't look at him when he leaves. He's fast to disappear down the hall, trying to not think of some happy family within the walls. Of a dad building brick by brick a house. Of it all falling apart. He closes his door so hard that it rattles in the frame and he tries not to think of it breaking. When he turns to collapse on the bed, he doesn't think about how this might have been someone else's bedroom. How the glow of lights would shine through the windows, or how there are no lights out there anymore. How he's going to bed in this big house occupied by only a single man, his dog, and a stranger they both saved in the snow. His stomach still feels deep and dark inside of him as he forces himself asleep. Their hands touching him, grabbing, pulling at his arms and his shirt. Nails dig into his skin. There's too many of them to fight off as every direction he moves, there seems to be more of them, all trying to tear into him. He tries to scream, but as soon as his mouth opens, one of the hands covers it and the noise dies down in his throat. He tries again, and this time the sound doesn't even start. He glares, pulling away, but the hands are quick to wrench his head back. Another palm slaps over his nose, smothering him, and in the panic, Bakugo's brain is frantic to get more air into his lungs to breathe, to scream, but the hand is solid and unrelenting, holding him, bruising his face with the harsh grip, and Bakugo can feel his entire body burning with the need to inhale. He tries again to pull away, but all the hands and fingers digging into every part of his body hold him down, still trapping him and pressing harder and harder into his skin till he can feel how his bones ache with the pressure. His vision starts to grow dark around the edges, fuzzy, and all he feels is trapped, alone, hurt. Fingers biting into his flesh, leaving indents. Panic, panic, panic. Bakugo wakes up and swings. He's not aware of what's happening until he hears the crash of the lamp falling to the ground and still he can't be bothered. He doesn't think as he throws the blankets off of himself and takes three long strides to the door, quickly, throwing it open to stumble his way through the dark into the bathroom. When he gets there, he dry heaves into the sink. Nothing comes out, but his throat still tightens and his stomach flips. Stomach acid burns its way up before receding. He takes a deep, ragged breath as his lungs fill up with air for what feels like the first time in hours. With one hand white-knuckled against the counter, he turns the sink on to splash water on his face, feeling the sharp icy chill shoot down his spine, forcing him into the present. He stares at his reflection in the dark. You're fine, Bakugo says after a few seconds, gritting his teeth as his heart is still racing in his chest. Get a fucking grip, you piece of shit. As his eyes start to adjust to the darkness, Bakugo can make out the finer details of his face. His hair is more of a mess than usual. There's a sheen of sweat on his cheeks. The cut at his head looks more bruised around the edges. His eyes are red-rimmed. They look heavy, tired. He looks like complete garbage. The sun isn't up yet. He's not entirely sure what time it is, if it's still technically night or just very early in the morning. The rest of the house is quiet so either both Kirishima and his dog sleep like the dead, or they can't hear him across the other side of the house. Everything is dark and still and cold. Bakugo breathes, splashes more water onto his face, and just deals with it all, just like he always does. It doesn't fully hit him how cold the house is until he's back in his room changing. The adrenaline of his nightmares wears off to remind him he's trapped in a house with no electricity in a snowstorm. He changes quickly in an attempt to keep the cold from settling too long in his bones. 
but it's still cold even in his tracksuit. Shivering softly, Bakugo grumbles to himself as he grabs up the flashlight from the day before and makes his way back towards the home gym. He starts on the treadmill to get his body temperature up. It's too quiet in the house as he starts off at a jog after a few stretches. Wishes that his phone wasn't dead and smashed up so he could listen to music. He should probably call his parents today. He should probably call Deku to check on the cat. He counts the days in his head and realizes Christmas is in three days if he's been here as long as he thinks. Bakugo sighs, turning the speed up to quicken his pace. Glancing out the window beside him, he notices even in the dark that it doesn't look like it's snowing anymore. The wind is still for the time being with no more throwing gust against the house or pushing tree branches at the outside walls. He wonders if the storm has passed or if this is just a period of calm before it starts up all over again. So far, it looks like there's a meter of snow piled up outside at least, maybe more. It reaches up into the view of the window as though it wants permission to come in. Bakugo turns his head forward and keeps running. It's been an hour and a half, maybe even two at this point, and Bakugo can finally say he's not focused on the cold. He's sweating, having had to stop for a second to go find some water from the kitchen and hand towel that he could use to wipe at his brow. Reminds himself to ask Hiroshima for some sort of cleaner when he's done to wipe everything down with. It was later than he originally expected as the sun started to rise after the first hour, basking the little room in far too bright orange light. But it was welcome in the dim dark of the house. Now he can thankfully see everything without the flashlight, not having to worry about tripping over equipment he's unfamiliar with the placement of. He's gone through his run, finished with his legs, abs, and now onto his shoulders and chest. It's been a good distraction, wasted time that didn't involve him going back to bed. The sun's so bright now he can clearly see the vast white ocean of snow that blankets everything for as far as he can see through the thick tree line outside. It's the first full view Bakugo has really had of where exactly Kirishima lives. He's a single house out in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't seem to have any neighbors near enough to shout at. Just the deep forest at all sides with a thin road to connect him to the rest of the small town a few minutes drive away. Bakugo looks up at the ceiling, breathes in, and then starts up on his first set of bench presses. He started off lighter than he typically would, the cold making everything stiffer than he prefers, and he's sure the last thing he needs after a car accident is hurting himself while weightlifting. And, well, technically speaking, he probably shouldn't be doing this at all. His body is still sore, and he spotted some bruises from the crash he hadn't noticed the day before. But still, the ache starts to feel good. It leaves his mind in a pool of static that's only interrupted with his counts to keep track of what rep he's on. He feels less anxious, less like he's going to punch something, less like he's being choked. There's a soft knock that Bakugo doesn't fully hear, but the voice cuts through a moment later. Well, you're up early. Bakugo pauses with the bar at his chest, tilting his head back to see Kirishima standing at his upside-down perspective. He's shirtless again wearing a pair of red plaid sleep pants that make him look like some sort of pornographic lumberjack. His arms look nice in the position they're in, angled out with his hands resting against his hips. There's only so much you can sleep. Bakugo grunts, returning to the weight still in his grip, trying to finish up the set before he's interrupted. Hiroshima is suddenly standing over him, staring down, and suddenly Bakugo is looking at him with the morning sun cast across his body tan skin shimmering in the warm orange light. His stomach is tight, a light happy trail falling from his belly button down to disappear behind the waistband of his pants. The hair is dark and Bakuga wonders how often he has to dye his hair to keep it that red up top. He imagines lifting a hand up to touch his skin, wondering if it's just as warm as it looks. Need a spotter? Bakuga swallows. Not technically. He's fine as is. The weight isn't at his max and he's just started up. Muscles still feel good. But Bakugo knows after what happened last night he should at least try to be a little nicer as some sort of way to apologize for running off. Plus, he can't deny that view. Ten more. He gives as a warning before starting up again. This time with Kirishima's hands following the movement of the bar as he presses it up and then brings it back down, barely touching the metal under Bakugo's hands. When he pushes up at the tenth, Bakugo lets Kirishima help take the weight off the bar as together they slide it back into the hold. He sits up quickly as soon as he knows it's in place, flexing out his arms, rolling his shoulders. 
He can feel Kirishima staring at him as he does so, making him almost wish he had taken his shirt off to give Kirishima something to actually look at. He turns around and Kirishima is still just looking at him. Been at it for a while. Bakuga wipes at his face, throwing the hand towel over his shoulder as he stares at Kirishima, slowly evening out his breathing and feeling his heart rate pound in his ears. For some reason, the question leaves his stomach coiling up, like sirens going off in his head that this is some sort of trap. He knows that's ridiculous, knows it's just the edges of his nightmare starting to creep back in because Kirishima has been nothing but nice towards him. He pushes the feeling down, refusing to let it take root. Bakugo shrugs. Woke up early. Figured this was the best way to warm up with it being negative 50 in here. It's only a half lie, which is fine. Bakugo can live with that. Bakugo moves over to the corner of the room with the yoga mat, sitting down to stretch out his arms and legs. With his back half turned to Kirishima, he can still see him looking at him out of the corner of his eyes. Part of his brain is easy to reply with a no shit he's staring as he eases down to stretch out his back. But he's not wearing anything remotely sexy right now and the way Kirishima keeps worrying his lip with his teeth indicates there's more than just some sort of longing on his mind. He lets his hip fall back to the floor, counting to five in his head in an attempt to not sound so annoyed when he opens his mouth. It sort of works. You got something to say to me? Kirishima bites down on his lip again, turning his eyes away as soon as Bakugo starts staring back. Uh, well, I was just curious. Last night I just went to go check on you real quick after, well, everything. After he ran off is what he wants to say. Bakugo's fingers dig into the foam of the mat below him. And I didn't go in, but I could hear. Kirishima trails off, a hand rubbing at the back of his neck as the silence fills in the rest. Bakugo can feel his blood running cold through his veins. How it suddenly feels like he hadn't just worked out for two hours straight as the chill in the house sinks down into his body all too quickly. It just sounded like a really bad. Bakugo bites his tongue. He doesn't want to get defensive, but then again, he's never been good with talking about it, about anything. It was nothing. And Kirishima has the audacity to look shocked about it. But I said it was nothing. Just drop. He's interrupted by a knock, loud and pounding, and both of their heads turn towards the front door. The knock comes again quickly, louder. Riot barks on the other side of the house. Who the fuck? Bro. Even through the door and down the hall, the call was loud, but Bakuga wouldn't complain too much about the distraction. Kirishima's attention was quickly ripped away from prying into his restless sleep and what might have caused it. Riot is quick to answer the call just as fast as Kirishima. He comes running from the direction of the living room, nearly barreling into the wall as he rounds the corner. The clack of nails on wood filling what little space was left in between the barking. The dog scratches at the door as soon as he gets to it, whining and barking with every jump up to paw against the wood. Kirishima follows after quickly, with Bakugo keeping his distance but still peering over his shoulder as he approaches the door. It's still early in the morning with the snowstorm having broken only a half day prior, if that, so who in their right mind or even capability was up out here in the middle of the woods banging on doors. Apparently, the same exact type of person who finds dumb Taurus broken down in the middle of the road during a snowstorm. Tatsu. The man on the other side of the door when Kirishima swings it open looks like some sort of strange Kirishima copy, but this one was running out of ink and had to convert to black and white that smudged slightly on the way out. Immediately, they're hugging. Bakugo already doesn't like him. You're alive. There's more barking, not from Riot this time, but from beyond the doorway. Riot seems more interested in that than the two men, wiggling his way in between legs before quickly disappearing out the door and into the depths of the snow beyond. Bakugo wants to roll his eyes. Of course, this guy has a dog, too. With the door open, snow having fallen through, and the bone chill of the outside now granted full entrance into the house, Bakugo curses under his breath and moves to grab the throw blanket from the couch and the den over his shoulders clutching it close as he turns back to the pair, still hugging, still smiling at each other. He's suddenly wondering if being trapped in the house without electricity would be better than whatever's about to happen with the two of them. He wonders if pushing Kirishima out and locking the door behind him would be too cruel. It probably is. 
Bakugo squares his shoulders and stands his ground as, finally, the pair release each other and turn towards him. The copy grins at him, and there's a sharpness to it that Bakugo finds very unnerving. And who are you? Bakugo Kotsky. Hiroshima quickly answers before Bakugo can even open his mouth. Rescued him from the side of the road before the storm fully hit. Bakugo. Hiroshima smiling as he smacks the other man on the back. This is my cousin, Tetsu Tetsu. Oh, that makes sense. For whatever reason, finding out that Tetsu is his cousin makes Bakugo feel just a little bit more at ease, like he doesn't have to fight for something later. He relaxes ever so slightly, or as much as he can with his teeth starting to chatter in his mouth from the cold pouring into the house. Tetsu Tetsu bows slightly. At your service, come to dig you out. Right. Bakugo finally speaks up, still staring between the two of them. You got a place with electricity. Tetsu snorts, shoving Kirishima hard in the shoulder. Thought you said you'd fix that shoddy wiring. Hey, I can't help it when the wind throws things around. They start bickering, and Bakugo can really tell they're related now. Their voices start to rise louder and louder as they continue, matching each other's volume from one word to the next, which only makes both of them worse. Bakugo pinches the bridge of his nose, shaking his head. One Kirishima was enough. He doesn't need to. Okay, okay, fucking hell. He nearly shouts to get them both to shut up, and they do, like well-behaved pets, blinking back at him with wide eyes, waiting for the next command. All I want is a warm shower. If you can give me that, we're leaving. Give us five minutes to change. He pauses as he passes Kirishima on the way back down the hall, giving him a full once-over before looking up at him dead in the eye and, without hesitation, flicks him on one of his pecs. He tries not to notice how nicely it bounces back. Keep walking around without a damn shirt on and your nipples are going to freeze off. As Bakugo walks away, blanket still hanging around his shoulders, he can hear Tetsu Tetsu whisper too loud at his back. Bro, you two share body heat already or what? He feels a little warmer as the bedroom door closes behind him, just barely missing the sound of Kirishima choking on his own tongue. He packs his backpack quickly, throwing his travel bag of toiletries and a clean pair of clothes wanting to go wherever the warm shower and electricity were as fast as possible. Bakugo does have to stop, however, halfway through throwing things into his bag, as he once more notices the broken lamp at the bedside sitting in shards on the floor. For a moment, he thinks of leaving it again, but after a few curses, he picks up the broken pieces, happy at least that none of them are very small or overly sharp. The last thing he needs right now is explaining to Kirishima not only why his lamp is broken, but that Bakugo hurt himself further trying to clean it all up. He throws the lamp's remains away in the small trash bin in the room, promising himself to tell Kirishima later when they're alone, when Bakugo can think about what else he might say to him to get him to stop prying so much, to not look at him with stupid fucking sympathy after, and then he's out the door. Bakugo stands with snow up to his waist, glaring. The wetness hasn't seeped in with his snow pants on, but the cold is making his bones shiver. Still, he refuses to move. There's no way in hell he's climbing in there. Apparently, Tetsu Tetsu is the town's mechanic, and apparently he likes putting modifications on the various trucks and cars he's scavenged and fixed up over the years. The truck he bought to dig them out is altered to have a snowplow attached to the front of the already massive pickup. Bakugo wondered if it's actually safe on the road as soon as he saw it. Just because Kirishima climbed in with no hesitation doesn't mean he's going to. Obviously, it's clear that they're both the same exact kind of stupid, but not trusting the truck is not the reason he is still standing out in the snow. Now who's the one who'll freeze his nipples off? Kirishima grins from the front passenger's window. Bakugo continues to glare, still refusing to move, arms crossed to make a point and to stop his body from shivering too violently in the snow. He's stubborn, and if he's decided to die in this spot, by God he will die right here instead of getting into the back seat of that truck. 
from said back seat, the two dogs, probably from the same damned litter if the cousins are as predictable as Bakugo might suspect, stare back at him, tongues hanging out, waiting for him to climb up and next to them to drive into town. No. No way in hell. Bakugo, come on. They're just dogs. Well-behaved good boys who want nothing more than to get pet. Bakugo curls his nose. And lick me. Tetsu leans forward so Bakugo can see him from Kirishima's open window. The sight of him makes Bakugo press his arms tighter to his chest in defiance. Just push him off, bro. Eat shit and die. He isn't Tetsu's bro, and he isn't a dog person. He really isn't a dog person with two big, fluffy, energetic dogs pressed against him in the back seat of a truck smelling like kibbles and bits with their wide-open, panting mouths. Not to mention their damp fur from all the snow they stomped through. Okay, okay. Kirishima puts up his hands in defeat before opening the door to step out, sinking down into the deep snow. It's cool. I'll sit in the back with them. Everyone's happy. Even as Kirishima moves to slide into the back seat, and almost immediately is sat on by both dogs, Bakugo takes note of Tetsu Tetsu's complete and utter irritation with the situation. He glares as Bakugo finally climbs up into the front seat, nearly slamming the door shut behind him. He turns his gaze back towards Kirishima in the rearview mirror, the anger not as intense in his glare towards his cousin, but there is still a level of frustration in his eyes. He's just as easy to read as Kirishima is, except in the opposite direction, it seemed like. They drive in relative silence, at least from Bakugo's perspective. They are easy to drown out once Bakugo's eyes fell across the deep, snowy world around them. The barren trees are all covered, the blanket piled high around their trunks as gusts of wind blow around loose flurries from hill to hill. The sun is orange and soft against his skin as he stares, forgetting the chill beyond the warm barrier of the truck for a second. Everything appears quiet as they go, still and undisturbed with not a trace of human or animal to disrupt the world around him just yet. All except for them, driving through. Tetsu's plow creating a road where there isn't one before, following already hollowed out trails when he can. A familiar path that is so unfamiliar to Bakugo, just seeing it all now in the daylight, and still the world is so altered that he isn't sure where he is or where they might be going. He thinks for a second he shouldn't be here. He thinks for a second he wants to be home. Kirishima might have called his name a few times, and Tetsu Tetsu might have asked a question, but Bakugo ignores them for the trip down into town not caring about how rude it might be, lost in his own thoughts and direction, wondering, not for the first time, what exactly he's doing here. Thick tree lines slowly thin out, giving way to what he can only assume is the neighborhood they dropped the doctor off all those nights ago. They pass another row of houses, a few closed up and snowed in storefronts. The journey takes time, the truck moving slowly through the thick white landscape, Tetsu taking the road as quickly as he dares. After twenty minutes, maybe longer, Bakugo sits up in his seat as they turn a wide corner and suddenly enter what he can only assume is the main street or downtown of the small town. The road can't be more than two cars wide with little buildings lining both sides. Almost everything is still covered in snow, from the rooftop shingles to the sidewalks. All the little brittle bushes and signs hanging over passes to signal which door is which. Half of the road is already plowed, which tells Bakugo that Tetsu Tetsu had already been there that morning. With the carved out path, it's easier to navigate down the narrow street, passing the dark windows of each shop. A bakery, children's clothing store, a bank, and with every window they pass, every little corner an inch of framework of the buildings. Decorations are pinned up, taped, stuck on, strings of lights currently dark are around every roof where they poke out from layers of snow. Inside the shops, Bakugo spots garlands, trees, Santa is standing in corners looking creepy and overly happy in the dark. Oh god. Bakugo whispers under his breath, sitting back, wondering what level of hell he just entered. Kirishima suddenly appears over his shoulder, grinning from ear to ear with his wide eyes. You haven't seen anything yet. Bakugo doesn't need time to interpret what exactly he means because suddenly they're making another turn and he can see the sudden sparkle in Kirishima's eyes light up in a rain of rainbow. He whips around, regretting it instantly as he finds himself near-blinded by the bright lights twinkling before them. 
The snow is bad enough with just the sun to shine off of it. But now he squints against the flickering assortment of Christmas lights that line the building before them, wire after wire overlapping from the rooftop, dripping down from gutters and the edges of walls, all flickering in a blaze of rainbow as if the spirit of Christmas had come down to this exact corner of the earth to live for the season. Bakugo is scared to see what they might look like in the dark if it's this bad in the day. As soon as Bakugo can blink the rainbow assortment from his eyes, he notices the sign, half covered by snow still and also bordered with bright Christmas lights, but he can still read it perfectly fine. Ashido Inn and Diner. He glances over at the two cousins, Kirishima still pushing forward between the two seats looking giddy over the light display. He looks. You brought me to a motel. Tetsu Tetsu cocks his head at him, looking miffed by the very idea that Bakugo was unsatisfied with it. Yeah, of course I did. They've still got all their lights on with hot water and warm food. What more do you want? Bakugo didn't miss the slight bite in his tone, but for now he lets it go. He can't argue when they're delivering everything he requested and more. His skin is still tacky from his workout and he really wants to wash his hair without icicles appearing on the ends. Also, Kirishima pauses as Tetsu parks and gets out of the truck, both dogs in the back seat barking far too loud for Bakugo's liking. Don't let Mina hear you call it a motel, all right? She's not fond of the word. His nose curls. Who the fuck is Mina? Kirishima just smiles wider. She runs the place. If Bakugo thinks the outside is obnoxious, nothing prepares him for the inside of the inn. The little lobby is plastered from wall to wall in Christmas decorations. Each corner of the room carries its own little scene, from plastic deer families bobbing their head to munch on non-existent grass to a whole setup of Santa Claus sitting in a big red armchair with his naughty and nice list in his hands. The front counter is covered in shimmery silver garland expertly arranged to drape perfectly from corner to corner. Behind the counter is a small radio playing holiday songs through the room, static interrupting here and there as they sing out. And there, right next to the check-in counter, is a Christmas tree that smells heavily of pine and is covered in ornaments. Glass bulbs and little handmade paper stars, cranes and various other shapes that show the efforts of children's hands with glitter and crayons all over the paper folds. Bakugo stands staring at the scene, covered in clumps of wet snow from the waist down, boots bringing in slush under his feet, frozen to the spot from nothing of the cold conditions in his body is facing. He doesn't know how to react to it all, stomach tightening up as he looks from decoration to decoration, so much more used to the perfectly crafted holiday decor of expensive hotels and resorts or the minimalistic takes his parents would take growing up, a minimum to show they celebrate, but it's never the biggest deal. His own apartment back in the city stood barren of anything related to the holiday besides the tiny little Christmas tree potted and set on his table that Deku insisted on him keeping when he brought it over a week ago. The sharp ding of a bell rips him from his thoughts, Kirishima and Tetsu at the corner, pushing frantically at the bell sitting on its surface. Mina! They both call out in unison. A crash comes from the back of the room right behind the lobby counter cursing quick to follow, before the door bursts open and a woman with pink hair stumbles through it, two presents under each arm. Her eyes are bright and a brown so light that Bakugo isn't exactly sure they look completely natural under the artificial lighting of the inn's lobby, outlined in dark makeup. She wears a colorful sweater, bright blues and purples like an old rug from the 70s, with a clashing animal print scarf around her neck. As soon as she sees the cousins, she gives a shout and nearly jumps over the countertop to hug them as though they haven't seen each other in years instead of what Bakugo can only guess is the few days everyone spent locked inside during the blizzard. So glad you guys didn't freeze to death. She pushes them aside relatively quickly to open her arms, peering down. And my two favorite boys. The pair of dogs bark at her as they do with everyone, it seems. Tails wagging a mile a minute as she kneels down to their level and is immediately slobbered all over. It doesn't seem like she minds it as much as she laughs, continuing to pet them both as best she can with only the two hands she has. Each dog tries to shove the other out of the way to get the most attention. Bakugo doesn't think they should be inside here in the first place, but supposes it would be cruel to keep them outside in the truck. 
It takes another few minutes for everything to calm down enough that when Bakugo clears his throat, he's heard. The woman looks up at him, her gaze nearly unsettling as a smile spreads slowly over her lips. You must be the kept boy. Kept boy. Kirishima is quick to elbow her. Mina, be nice. He hisses too loudly and all Bakugo can do is roll his eyes as he steps forward, arms crossed in front of him. This is Bakugo Kotsky, my guest, while the roads are all closed with the snow. Bakugo, this is Ashido Mina. Her lips curl up at him, hands extending to be taken. Hand extending to be taken. Nice to meet you, Bakugo. He stares at it for a second, but doesn't budge to take it. Sure. He looks up at her. He doesn't really care to meet more people in this godforsaken town. He can feel roots starting to crawl up his feet any time he stays still for too long to listen. I was promised a warm shower. He's shown to one of the rooms in the inn, Mina taking him back outside to trudge through the snow until they come upon the second room down the row. The inn is quiet, vacant, not a soul in sight besides those Bakugos already seen. He doubts anyone would want to be traveling up here through the storm, besides him, of course. And something told Bakugo if they were coming to stay in this little town is to visit family. No need to rent out a room in a motel. The inside of the room looks a little dated, but when he runs his finger over the edge of the desk, it doesn't come away covered in dust. The air smells clean instead of stuffy, and as the door is closed behind him, he realizes the inside is warm. He means to make the shower quick when he steps in, but as soon as he's rinsing the shampoo from his hair, gentle on his own head, Bakugo finds himself pausing. He stands with his arms at his sides, still as he watches the soap run from his hair down the drain. Steam fills the shower, the water hot, so much so that he waits until his skin turns pink and the water runs clear of any suds before moving on. Blinking himself out of the daze, he cast himself in. If given the chance, he thinks, he would stand under the water forever. He's lost in a place that is unknown, yet still welcomes him in. It's an uncomfortable feeling that Bakugo isn't used to, and one that he feels he has to tread lightly in. And yet, Kirishima destroys that feeling. He breaks it all down and grabs Bakugo by the hand, thrusting him into the world and refusing to let him fully drown. Still, he's lost, but at least for now he's warm. Bakugo leaves the shower after scrubbing the sweat from his body, trying not to dwell on any of the thoughts or emotions that bubble up from the drain. He takes his time getting dressed. He looks over himself for the first time, fully in the clear lighting since ending up here, since all the injuries have sunk in. There's some bruising across his chest and down by his waist where the seatbelt cut into him, forcing his body to stop. He's lucky his collarbone didn't break. There's an ache in his shoulder when he rolls it. His head has mostly stopped hurting, even as he pops one more of the pills the doctor gave him two days ago. The wound at his head looks to be healing up, as slow as the process is. He cleans it gently, hissing softly as pain flares up, pulsing at the front of his head before it dies down quickly. Bakugo covers it once more with a band-aid, making sure when he fixes his hair his bangs are pushed in front of it as best they can. It won't stay that way, but he's just vain enough to try. Halfway through pulling his shirt over his head, Bakugo realizes just how tired he is. Typically, he's good about sleeping. He knows how important it is, has always been good about going to bed early to get a full eight hours. Growing up, the only time he ever fought his parents on his bedtime was when he just wanted to start a fight when slamming the door closed behind him felt better than a good night. It was an empty effort and meaningless, because he was always under the covers by nine at the latest, asleep very close after that. The nightmares were the first thing he wanted to get rid of after everything that happened. He hated the fact that they were there at all, the one thing he simply couldn't force away or shove down, because his subconscious was far more truthful than his awakened self. He couldn't lie to himself when he was sleeping. He hasn't had them like this in years. Figured he'd left all this back at the beginning of his college days. But here they are back again, all because of this dumb little town. By the time he's done, feeling fresh and put together enough to go face the rest of the world, Bakugo's actually surprised Kirishima hasn't come looking for him to check if he's okay. He doesn't dwell too long on whatever tug that pulls from him. He sort of walks, sort of hops back through the snow, trying to follow the previous footprints still present to make it easier. 
when he gets there the lobby is empty except for the two dogs laying by some of the decorations but it's easy to find where everyone else is voices being heard through the archway into the little diner attached to the lobby they're laughing at something loud and crisp like friends do when they're catching up he's not certain of it but bakugo thinks he's starting to recognize kirishima's laugh deep but still bright full-bodied so you know he really means it kirishima tetsu and ashido are sitting at the corner and through the window into the kitchen bakugo can see someone with dark hair moving around the sound of oil sizzling in a pan unseen the smell of bacon coffee and tea fills the air drawing bakugo in closer along with the laughter the seat next to kirishima is open so he takes it for no other reason than he knows kirishima the best among the rest of the strangers a warm mug is pushed into his hands accompanied by a warm smile black kirishima tells him looking proud that he remembers and i think sarah probably makes a better pot than me bakugo doesn't know who sarah is but he takes a sip anyway it's not as strong as what kirishima made him not as biting with the edge which just barely burned as it hits his tongue he hates it he doesn't bakugo licks his lips before he takes another sip not elaborating any further on the matter he misses how quickly kirishima turns away from him how he coughs ashido is leaning across the counter before bakugo can really get a good look at the reaction hating the woman for making him miss the crimson at his cheeks so bakugo she has essentially climbed on top of kirishima to get to him the other man just holding her up and looking used to it i hear you're a fireman i am he mutters out from behind his coffee mug staring at her with a bored look in his eyes being this close he can see she's wearing christmas tree earrings dangling from her ears she smells like pine and peppermint this close up he wonders just how much kirishima has mentioned about him she makes an excited noise in the back of her throat at this climbing over kirishima to stand at bakugo's side can you firemen carry me he snorts into the mug rolling his eyes i can carry any of you it's the wrong answer he quickly realizes as mina is insistent on now getting carried around and tetsu likes a challenge bakugo argues of course saying it's stupid but tetsu tetsu smirks taunts him by saying he can't that he's just talking out his ass it gets bakugo up off of his stool immediately glaring hard at the other man before he grabs mina to get her into position she's an easy lift her weight balancing across his shoulders and back well she's light but still she squeals as she's turned in a circle kicking her legs against his grip in excitement making bakugo put her down quickly in irritation she's clapping as soon as her feet touch the floor again oh oh lift kiri he's bigger than tetsu that's the truth if only by a little bit and bakugo certainly won't argue about it having not wanted to get personal with the thick-headed rip-off any time soon he steps into kirishima's personal space grinning from ear to ear you want me to pick you up kirishima shrugs trying to hide a smile can certainly try if you want bakugo's never been one to turn away from a challenge especially one as blatant as that his heart pounds gonna make you eat those words kirishima is up close and personal with him right now closer than he's ever been before besides when he was carrying him from his rent car bakugo can fully appreciate how tall he is when he has to look up to meet his eyes instead of his chin his shoulders are so damn broad bakugo's almost jealous no one should be allowed to look that good while wearing a knitted sweater especially when it seems like he should be wearing a size bigger he smells like the snow outside and the hint of detergent from his clothes hits bakugo's nose the scent floral and light everything about him screams big manly masculine and still there are these soft edges that bakugo can spot that make him want to lean in all the closer see how comfortable it is to wrap his hands around his neck and lean up bakugo grabs his arm and tries really hard not to think about how wide kirishima's forearms are bends down to grab his thigh thinking about how thick they are strong how warm kirishima will be against his back all tight muscle and large should the guy who was just in a car accident really be lifting people like that they all freeze at the new voice a far too reasonable voice the four of them turn to look towards the kitchen door staring now at a new guy who holds four plates of food all balanced on his arms 
with a quirked-up brow that spoke more judgment than concern. Slowly, Bakugo lets his hands fall away from Kirishima, trying his hardest not to look disappointed as he feels. He's happy when Ashido doesn't hold back with hers. Aw, Honda, we were just having fun. She pouts, arms crossed tight over her chest as she slides back into sitting on the stool. Kirishima told us he has a concussion, Mina. The man rolls his eyes, putting down a plate in front of the woman, a bowl of rice, bacon, and scrambled eggs all piled high. Leaning down to kiss her head is some sort of apology Bakugo figures. Ashido still grumbles, but turns her head, asking for another kiss, which is freely given to her cheek. For the moment, it seems, she is stated. Bakugo sits next to Kirishima once more, who also seems to be grumbling his own disappointment under his breath. But as soon as his own plate is put down in front of him, more bacon than anything else, the wide smile returns as his eyes brighten. Thank you, Siro. Also, Tetsu Tetsu speaks up. He said it was mild. Siro rolls his eyes. Bakugo gets the feeling he does that a lot. Still a concussion and still a car accident. He puts a plate down in front of Bakugo, smiling at him from the other side of the counter, a toothy grin seeming to take up half of his face, almost as friendly as Kirishima's own. Sorry for being the buzzkill. I'm Saro Hanta, cook. Ashido slams her hands on the countertop. He's the head chef at the diner. Mina. The best in town, and my fiancé. Saro's face is red, eyes wide and frantic as he tries to stop her from shouting. Mina, please. Tetsu Tetsu snorts, pointing with his chopsticks towards the loud woman. Ashido's got her hopes up. There's still no ring and still no wedding date. Ashido huffs, settling back down finally. I'm optimistic. Hanta loves me. Still doesn't make you married. They keep bickering back and forth as Tetsu keeps riling Ashido up and she keeps taking the bait. They're hard to drown out, both loud as they snap at each other. Bakugo watches out of the corner of his eye, waiting for one of them to finally clock the other as the conversation crumbles into a full-on fight. Don't worry. Kirishima bumps his shoulder into him, grabbing Bakugo's attention from the pair. At this angle, with both of them sitting at the counter, Bakugo really does need to look up at him. It's infuriating and sends a shot of heat through his stomach all at once. They do that a lot. Mina likes to talk and Tetsu likes to argue. We're all friends, I promise. Bakuga glances back towards the two. No blows having fallen yet. Just spit food in between bites, it seems. You guys all seem pretty familiar, huh? He's not entirely sure why he asks, but for some reason he feels the need to know all the connections how the puzzle all fits together with them and how Kirishima gets shaped around them. We all grew up here. Kirishima starts, shoving a mouthful of rice into his mouth. Mina's parents owned the inn before they retired and passed it on to her. Sarah's grandparents started the grocery store here. His older sister mainly runs it now, but his grandma still greets everyone from behind the counter. Obviously, Tetsu's mom and dad grew up here too, so we're all here except... He swallows, looking around the diner for a moment before turning to Sarah, who's come out from the back, now carrying a tray with bowls of soup steaming atop them. Hey, Sarah, where's Dinky? Where? Sarah pauses himself, looking around before shaking his head, sighing heavily. He's probably still sleeping. I think he was up all night talking to the new boyfriend he can't go two seconds without mentioning. That automatically gets Mina's attention leaning towards the three of them with a big grin on her face. His first real boyfriend and Dinky's acting like he's never dated before. It's adorable. You just love the gossip, love. Maybe I do, but it's about time someone else started dating around here. She huffs, snatching a bowl of soup from the tray, nearly spilling it all over the counter and everyone sitting at it. After Tetsu got married, I need something else exciting to happen. Bakugo nearly chokes on his own mouthful of rice, breathing in a few grains wrong that leads him into a coughing fit that only ends when Kirishima's large hand comes down on his back twice before easing into soothing rub that is entirely unnecessary as Bakugo isn't a child needing to be burped. Nonetheless, he takes the help in the glass of water that's handed to him after the fit ends. After he takes a sip, Bakugo notices the heavy warmth still pressed against the middle of his back. 
feeling like a brand burning through his clothes. Hiroshima's hands are big, the pressure just enough to feel their expanse, and sit for a few seconds too long before finally falling away from his body. He turns, glaring at Tetsu Tetsu down the counter. You're fucking married. Tetsu grins back at him. Jealous? Oh, don't worry, Bakugo. Itsuka's way too cool for him. They won't last. Mina teases, tongue out as Tetsu slams his hands on the countertop, growling low with the accusation. Kirishima pushes his way between them, shoving his cousin back down into his seat. Don't be mean, Mina. They're perfect together. But sorry, Tetsu. She is the coolest person in town. Coming from his cousin, it seems to settle the other, taking the insult as a compliment instead. That's why I married her. Only person who could fix a car better than me. His voice takes on a dreamy tone as he gazes off into the distance, staring at the wall as he shoves two pieces of bacon into his mouth. Bakugo curls his nose, still surprised someone would ever want to marry someone like that, especially with a better version so close by. The conversation settles after that as they all eat breakfast. It's anything but silent, but no one is trying to jump over the counters or shouting in anger. There's still plenty of loud laughter and yelling about one thing or another, but it's all in good fun. They talk and Bakugo listens. He only speaks when prompted directly, but most of it is him grunting a yes or no before going back to eating. It doesn't help his feelings of discomfort or misplacement, but he's good at shoving them down too. It sounded like a reunion, even though they all seemed to live in the same place they were born and raised in. All four of their families have been there at least a full generation, with Ashido's parents being the youngest to have moved into the quiet mountain town right after they were married. They talk about their families, mostly how everyone is, where they all are. Ashido shows pictures of her parents visiting family in America. Saro keeps telling stories of all the times his grandmother had smacked him with a wooden spoon and Tetsu Tetsu talks about his own parents out traveling away from the harsh cold for the holidays. All of them talk openly about their families except for Kirishima. He's not quiet, Bakugo notices, always asking questions on how a certain relative is and telling his own stories of the cooking of Saro's grandmother and getting caught doing something stupid they shouldn't have by his uncle or aunt or Saro's sister. It's never overly close or personal, and all of them seem aware enough to know they're not asking, and Bakugo can feel the vibrations in the air to figure out that that is entirely on purpose. No one will be so blatant, but they're all reading well enough between the lines. It's not until they're towards the end of breakfast, when everyone's stuffed full and Saro's piling the dishes to take into the back, that Ashido finally nudges Kirishima gently in the arm and asks, So, how's your brother doing? I heard from him and your dad in a bit. Kirishima is good enough to smile and make it look real. He pops the last bit of bacon into his mouth and chews slowly, trying to make it last. He's all right, I expect, he says after a moment, helping to stack up his own dishes to do something with his hands, Bakugo figures. I should actually call him today or tomorrow, check in. I really don't talk to either of them enough. He makes the words sound all kinds of cheerful. Like forgetting to talk to your brother and father is a simple mistake anyone could do. But Bakugo can see the concern stretch across everyone else's faces even when they don't say anything. It makes his own stomach churn. Kirishima's good with breaking it all up. Saro, seriously dude, that was fantastic. Almost as good as what Bakugo made yesterday. Excuse me? Tetsu, we should get going now, yeah? Going. Bakugo slams down his coffee mug. He can relate to avoiding emotions and conversations revolving around them. Where the hell are you going? Hmm? Oh. Kirishima smiles at him even as he pulls his jacket on and Tetsu whistles for the dogs that had stayed in the lobby to relax. We're gonna go check on everyone else, see what kind of damage happened, if any, and help out if any people are stuck in their houses. You'll be okay here for a bit, right? Just a few hours, promise. He acts like he owes Bakugo something, like he's an actual guest being left behind instead of what is essentially an unwanted stowaway on a ship in open water. Kirishima's just too friendly to kick him overboard. Bakugo rolls his eyes. Of course I'll be fine, idiot. Won't be the one running around outside in the freezing cold. I know you will be. Kirishima laughs, mirth in his eyes as he pulls his hat tight over his ears. He leans in close for a moment 
a second of hesitation before he pulls back and turns. Bakugo stunned with the motion, staring at his back as he retreats out the door with his cousin and their two dogs already barking and yipping at their heels. Bakugo's not entirely sure what happened, but he swears for just a second Kirishima was leaning in to maybe. Mina, Saro, take care of him for me. The deep voice is thrown back and Bakugo barely hears the sound of the couple yelling back that they will. He stares at the empty space Kirishima once occupied, playing over and over again in his head what just happened. The thought of what might have happened if Kirishima didn't hesitate just then. Of what kind of goodbye he would have gotten but didn't receive. Bakugo realizes quickly he's blushing. Motherfucker. There's a long, long second that might actually be two or three in which Bakugo doesn't blink. He stares, trying to wrap his mind around the situation at hand and angry at himself for thinking there was a situation at all. There wasn't. There couldn't be. He's delusional and Kirishima is just too damn nice for his own good and maybe there's a small part in Bakugo that is reminding him that it's been too long since he's gotten laid. He needs to forget about it. Nothing happened and nothing will. As soon as he manages to get himself under control, Bakugo can feel eyes burning into the side of his head. He turns, glaring as Ashido meets his eye, unashamed of being caught staring. She looks smug, smile wide and knowing. Bakugo doesn't like how she doesn't immediately back down with his eyes hardened on her. See something you like? She clicks her tongue at the end of the question. He should have realized earlier that she was dangerous. Her attitude reminds him too much of Kami, and clearly that carefree fun is a cover for how closely Ashido likes to look at people. Play it up with the bubbly persona until it was time to strike. Bakugo curls his nose. None of your damn business what I like and don't like. She smiles, spinning around on her stool, but always keeping her head turned as to keep her stare strong. Mm -hmm, of course not. Kiri mentioned how you were driving up to the resort to see your parents. He cocks a brow. And what's that got to do with shit? It means you probably aren't spending Christmas with someone special. You think I can't get a date? She's baiting him. He knows that. But his anger management, especially with strangers, is still something he's working on. Even while aware of this fact, he bites. He's not going to just roll over and take it. Don't worry. She catches herself with a hand on the countertop, stopping the rotation with ease. Ashido winks, her eyes softer and her smile less sinister. He's single too. Bakugo can feel his throat tighten and he bites down hard on his tongue, hating how transparent it all is, how he is. Mina, are you playing nice? Sarah calls out from the kitchen and the mood shifts all too suddenly as Ashido jumps from her seat to follow the call of her boyfriend. You know I always play nice. Bakugo is left alone in the empty sitting area of the diner with the soft sounds of the couple doing dishes in the background. He is not reeling from the short conversation. Nothing Ashido said was a surprise, technically, but hearing it aloud was... He doesn't know exactly how to process it. There's nothing to do with the information besides let it bounce around his head, echoing from one corner to the other. Of course, Kirishima is single. He lives alone with his dog in a house his father built, and the only adjustment it seems to have had from the original design is the little gym. Bakugo doesn't know what the fuck he's supposed to do with that now. It isn't as though he lives here. He was passing through and got trapped. If this was a fairy tale, someone would have tried to eat him already. But no, nothing like that. Just a hot woodsman in his overly welcoming little town with his childhood friends talking too much and too loudly. As soon as he's able, Bakugo will leave. That's how this works. He doesn't stay here because a woman mentions someone being single. His parents are already worried about him. His cat is surely running amok with Deku watching after her. He has a job, a good one, with a plan to be chief in five years tops. He has an apartment and people he kind of calls friends. 
co-workers he drinks with after long shifts where ash is still smeared across their cheeks shooting the shit to distract with anything that wasn't fire and death he can't stay here dude you look like you're having a serious crisis right now bakugo jumps head whipping around to find a blonde man dressed in an oversized hoodie and pajama pants looking half asleep as he stands there yawning wide he has a blanket barely hanging across his shoulders and feet bare and wet with clumps of snow stuck to the frayed ends of his pajamas. He really doesn't like getting called out by some guy who looks like he's also going through a serious life crisis. At least Bakugo knows he showered this morning. Bastard. Who the fuck are you? Bakugo figured the little inn was vacant except for Ashido and Saro. The blonde snorts, taking a seat on the stool next to his own pulling the blanket tied up over his shoulder so it doesn't fall. I should be asking you that question, Mr. Mysterious. Also, please don't be so yelly this early in the morning, dude. It's past nine. Fuck. The man slumps against the countertop, groaning against the surface. He looks like he might actually fall asleep right there with the long pause he takes before, finally. That's so early, dude. He looks up, shouting. Saro, buddy, there's still food left, right? This is a restaurant, stupid. Bakuga watches Saro's head pop up through the service window, glaring out, sizing the blonde up with dark eyes. He's only returned with a very tired-looking smile, an expression of good faith Bakugo can only assume as Saro shakes his head and once more disappears from sight. He's not done, though. A moment later, Saro comes from the kitchen, arms carrying a lighter version of the breakfast he served the rest of them earlier. You're lucky we're friends. Kirishima and Tetsu ate all the bacon, so still sucks to suck. The blonde grins all the while, not seeming to mind the lack of protein and fat as he shoots up in his seat. Best friends. You say that. Saro rolls his eyes. And yet, the first time I see you in months, all you do is use me for food before crawling back to your room to talk to your boyfriend all night. The breakfast is very obviously cold, which Bakugo can appreciate that level of pettiness, seeing as how he very easily could have heated it up but kept a plate hot for him. Still, the blonde doesn't seem affected at all, happily thanking Saro before shoveling a huge mouthful of rice into his mouth, reminding him immediately of Kirishima the few hours before as he too devours his food. Ashido comes out a minute later, towel over her shoulder with a teapot in one hand and a collection of cups clasped between her fingers in the other. Let Vinky be, Hanta. He's young, dumb, and in love. What else do you want him to do? She's smiling as she pours the four of them tea. Kaminari doesn't seem to notice the insult thrown his way when Ashido offers him the cup. With his own cup pushed forward, Bakugo doesn't deny it out of politeness and the fact that his coffee mug has long been empty. By the way, Dinky, this is Bakugo, Kirishima's roadside man. Bakugo, Kaminari Dinky. Kaminari gives him a wide smile, rice stuck to the corners of his mouth. What's up, roadside? Fuck you. Hey, Bakugo. Saro asks after one pot is empty and another is being filled. Kirishima mentioned you were a good cook. Bakugo cocks a brow. Yeah, so. You any good at baking? He pauses. It's been a while. He's not typically the one to bring baked goods around the firehouse. Surprisingly enough, that usually fell into a Nasa's category of poorly formed cookies that were a hit or miss with being overcooked, but always with enough sugar and butter put in that not many people mentioned it, beyond Bakugo, of course. Especially because everyone knew it was a poor excuse for flirting with the obvious half and half that went so unnoticed it was embarrassing for both of them. Kami always gave the worst dating advice and Bakugo was always too entertained by the disaster pair to say anything. Regardless, Bakugo didn't bake very much. Not to say that was something he was going to admit, because he's for sure fantastic at it anyway. Yeah, why the hell wouldn't I be? Sarah smiles at him. A bright light in his eyes. It looks like a challenge. Perfect, you can help me with the cakes. Mina and Dinky are both terrible and banned from using the oven. Hey! 
both Kaminari and Ashido pout, but Sarah easily waves them off. Probably so used to it at this point, it doesn't even face him anymore as he gestures for Bakugo to follow him back into the kitchen. If he's being honest, it's a nice change of pace. The kitchen is cluttered, but clean and tidy with more room to move than he would have ever expected from the small outer appearance of the diner. It's also much warmer here than out front, which should be obvious, but Bakugo still finds himself relaxing as the heat melts into the fabric of his clothing, actually making him hot. It's a nice warmth comforting. He's glad to be back here, feeling less overwhelmed by the constant chatter and conversations around him and the appears of another new face what felt like every ten minutes. Bakugo welcomes the escape, following Saro back towards a wide table that's currently cluttered with every baking basis and then some. You ever made a sponge cake before? Saro asks, washing his hands in a nearby sink that Bakugo soon follows after. Who hasn't? Bakugo's quick to respond, though it's been some years since he's ever done so. Probably for one of his mother's birthdays when he was much younger. Still, they were simple. Basic. He would be fine. As though he could feel the half-truth in the air, Sarah smiled. Well, if need be, I have a recipe you can look at. We need to make twenty-five batches. Don't ask. For what? Oh, we give them out to the people around town. Zero starts cracking egg after egg into a bowl. Christmas cake, you know. Some people like to make it themselves with their kids, family, traditions. But for those who can't, or some people simply like the gift, we make them. Well, I, my grandma and Mrs. Kirishima did them before. Bakugo's stomach immediately drops at the mention of Mrs. Kirishima, past tense, always in the past. It feels as though her ghost is starting to linger, or maybe it always has been and Bakugo is just now starting to see her, in the house, in the town, in this little diner kitchen that, up until now, had no connection beyond knowing that Kirishima had his own connections there with friends. Now he can only wonder if she had actually worked here or if she simply helped an old lady make cakes every year because she was that type of person, kind, giving, the type of person Bakugo knows Kirishima is. He doesn't know Kirishima's mother, has barely heard anything about her. No pictures shown to put a face to her spoken memories, but can still imagine how bright her smile must have been as there can only be one place Kirishima could have gotten his from. Bakugo's glad, for now, that the redhead isn't here. He doesn't want to see the gutted look in his eyes. The conversation falls silent for a moment, with Bakugo not knowing what to say that won't lead down another path of remembering the dead. It's awkward in that time but he figures he can deal with awkward instead of sad. He bites his tongue, weighing out sugar. This place is seriously into Christmas, huh? It sounds safe to him, even if he doesn't want to talk about this holiday at all. He's never really enjoyed Christmas, never enjoyed many holidays in general, but Christmas was always so cheerful, so happy. Everyone wanted to spend time with their families, their partners go look at flashy lights and take romantic walks through frozen streets. It was shit. The insane amount of decoration on the way in didn't give it away. Sarah teases, which makes Bakugo's anger spike for a second or two before Sarah's laughing. Bakugo, relax. No one here is trying to be a dick. That might be the truth, but Bakugo still feels on edge. Christmas has always been a huge deal here, ever since I can remember. Saro shrugs. Everything's always been about snow and lights and food as soon as December rolls around. People start prepping immediately. Giving presents is this huge deal that so many people stress over, me included. That ring talk from earlier is no joke. I've been planning for two years at this point. He's talking about Ashido, about a proposal, about marriage. He's open with everything, just like it seems the rest of the stupid town is. There's no secrets among strangers because none of them see each other as such, just friends and family, all close-knit and welcoming. Bakugo hates how tight his throat feels, how uncomfortable the whole talk makes him. It shouldn't fucking matter, after all. He'll be gone in a few days. And that's mild compared to how much Kirishima loves it, though. Fuck. That's an open-ended statement. He's supposed to ask about that, or Sarah's supposed to be elaborating more, and there's a part of him that wants to know. 
something that's nagging at him to get every answer he can because he wants to know more, everything, whatever he'll be able to have about the redhead. But he doesn't. He refuses. Bites his tongue because he can't keep digging a deeper hole, otherwise he'll get swallowed up in the snow. His stomach feels hollow, but he ignores that. Sarah apparently is pretty good at ignoring it too, not delving deeper than what the surface shows. He can read a room and the topics to avoid. For the rest of the time, Sarah seems to curb his talk whenever Kirishima is brought up beyond his relevance to their friendship as a whole. It feels like cheating. Bakugo is grateful in his silence. Bakugo doesn't say a word, much like he did with breakfast. Content to zone out and only focus on the task at hand as they slowly work the eggs and sugar together, moving on to the flour, butter, salt. It's a long process that moves quickly with the pair of them. Saro doesn't talk the entire time either, but he comments here and there, either on Bakugo's technique of whisking or to throw in some other trivial fact about the little mountain town in Christmas. Bakugo can't find much to contribute with besides his muttered out curses when corrected by Saro's sharp eye. He's done the same thing for Christmas since he was little. It's never been a holiday he feels he needs to celebrate, or rather, put an effort into celebrating, as it has mainly been about his parents. The only reason he still comes up into the mountains is to tag along, mostly because when all you do is work and have very few friends, people start to talk. He hates it. They sound so empathetic about it, like he should feel sorry for wanting to be the best and not having time for anything else. Bakugo grits his teeth pulling his arm too hard and too fast, his huge bowl of cake batter splashing up and out across the table. Hey, Bakugo. Sarah interrupts his thoughts with a hand on his shoulder that Bakugo is very quick to pull away from. Sorry, you good? You zoned out for a while. He opens his mouth with a sharp word on his tongue, then snaps his jaw closed tight with a clack, reconsidering. He can try. Sarah really hasn't been trying to be an ass. Yeah, he says, taking a deep breath. Yeah, I'm fine. They separate out the batter into pans, putting them into the oven before cleaning up. Sarah doesn't say much else why they do, but he keeps looking at Bakugo from the corner of his eye with the same concern Bakugo's caught on so many other people's faces in the past. He does his best to ignore it, but he can't seem to get the feeling from itching across his skin. It makes him feel so much worse. You two finally finished? Ashido is back behind her desk in the lobby, Kaminari on the floor next to her with little squares of paper beside him and a growing pile of little paper cranes at his feet. Saro smiles at her. For now. Everything's in the oven and we still need to prep the strawberries and make whipped cream, but that can wait. Nice. Up for helping me finish decorating? Bakugo doesn't want to, but there's little else to actually do besides go find an empty room to take a nap in. But he's not tired at all, and staring at a wall seems just a little bit more boring than helping out with decorations. Thankfully, he's assigned a crane folding duty with Kaminari instead of snow shoveling that Ashido batted her eyes at Saro to get him outside in the cold. Unthankfully, he was assigned a crane folding duty with Kaminari. It takes him roughly two seconds of semi-silence to start up immediately talking about his relationship like a broken record. Ashido is terrible and indulges him. I still don't understand why you didn't bring him up with you. Ashido whines. She's wrapping what Bakugo can only assume are empty cardboard boxes and colorful Christmas wrapping paper. Bows expertly curled on top for decoration under her tree. I really want to meet him. We could have double dated. Bakugo rolls his eyes, trying his hardest to drown the pair of them out as he continues to fold paper crane after paper crane in his hands. Well, I didn't want to rush anything, you know? We've only been serious for three months. I feel like I could still scare him off at any time. Yeah. Bakugo mutters near silently under his breath. I'd get scared off, too. Ashido huffs. Nonsense. The way you talk about him, he's so head over heels for you. Come here, let me see that picture of you two again. Kaminari has his phone out quicker than anyone Bakugo has ever seen, and it takes him no time at all to pull up a picture of his boyfriend. Probably because he has his entire phone memory filled with idiotic selfies or candid shots of him. 
all bad lighting and blurry edges, and Bakugo pauses with a little slip of blue paper between his fingers, half-folded awkwardly looking to make a slightly squashed crane as he finishes, but he doesn't care as he catches a glimpse of the phone screen as it passes from one idiot to the next. The half-formed origami falls from his fingers, uncaring, as his brain catches up with the glimpse of the purple he just saw. His sudden shot goes unnoticed as the two keep talking, Ashido giggling loud at the phone. Bakugo feels like his eyes twitching. No fucking way. Hey, Pinky, Pikachu, shut the fuck up for two seconds. They stop, looking up from the phone to stare at Bakugo. Confusion written all over their faces. Damn it, he really doesn't want to confirm what he thinks, but he needs to know for certain just in case any future fights he may or may not pick while grabbing his late night coffee and sandwich. Plus, he needs to avoid any future meetings with Kaminari at all costs if he wants to keep his sanity intact. Bakugo glares at the other man. Your boyfriend. He works at the 24-7 cafe across from the pet store. Kaminari blinks, tilting his head like a dog trying to figure out human language. Yes? Looks like a dumbass zombie with a bad purple dye job. I did his hair. Hatoshi? Dude, yeah, what the fuck? Bakugo snarls, standing up to snatch the phone from Ashido's hands just to make sure. Staring back at him is the exact same asshole who serves him his far too early morning coffee when he has a few extra minutes going into his shift. He looks happier than Bakugo can ever remember him seeming at all, but it's for sure him. No one else has eye bags like that. Hitoshi Shinso, insomniac barista, snarky asshole. He's the bastard who tried to steal my cat. There's a long, long pause where Bakugo can actually hear the gears turning in Kaminari's head before suddenly something sparks behind his eyes. He slams his hands on the countertop, grinning, looking far too snarky and bright. No way, you're the explosive dick that likes shitty coffee. He's the one that makes shitty coffee. Bakugo hisses right back, hands slamming down longer and stronger than Kaminari did. He won't deny that first part, but no one is allowed to insult his taste. Ashido looks as if she's just discovered an actual gold mine, biting her lip hard trying to fight the smile on her face. Dinky, your boyfriend tried to steal Bakugo's cat? Yes. Kinda. Fuck you. That asshole watched her once, insulted my ownership ability, and said she was better off with him. Kaminari shrugs, looking a little more sheepish now. Well, in his defense, he did say you kept letting her get out. She's a sneaky bitch who used to live on the streets. I had her for a fucking month before... Fuck's sake, she's fine now. Bakugo can feel his headache returning quickly. Why is he trying to explain himself? He also said she didn't have a name. Her name is Cat. Bakugo, babe, totally on your side here. Ashido is snickering. But that's not a name. I'll show you a fucking name. Bakugo reaches across to grab them both, Kaminari by his shirt, Ashido with a fist wrapped in her scarf. And he's overly satisfied to see they look just a little more scared when he jerks them both closer and... Above the door, the bell chimes. The three of them all look back to find Saro, shovel in hand, accompanied by Kirishima having returned, standing in the doorway looking just a little bit startled by the scene they just walked into. There's complete and utter silence for a full minute before finally Kirishima clears his throat. So, uh, what I miss? Nothing. Dinky's boyfriend tried to steal Bakugo's cat. Both Bakugo and Kaminari turn to glare at the woman. Kirishima blinks. Right, uh, that'll need some explaining soon. But I was wondering if anyone wanted to go snowboarding. Bakugo figures it's probably better than double homicide. Probably. I left for this hiking trip. You hike? Mountain climb specifically. You asked for the story. Don't fucking interrupt me. They're driving through unplowed streets. 
Apparently, Tetsu and Kirishima decided to switch cars with Tetsu Tetsu needing to go check in with his wife in their mechanic shop instead of coming with them. Bakugo isn't exactly complaining about that. Kirishima's taking the roads like a pro, pushing through to make large, towering snowbanks on either side of them. Bakugo's riding shotgun. Ashido's in the back seat with Riot. She's leaning so far forward over the console she might as well be in the front seat as Bakugo tries to explain the cat thief incident. So I'm out of town for four days, nothing insane, but I asked the purple-haired asshole to watch my cat. He didn't even have to stay, just check in with her every day, food and water, all that shit. I had officially had her for barely a month at this point. Oh, officially. Kirishima doesn't take his eyes off the road. Bakugo doesn't yell at him like he did Ashido. Yeah, she was a stray I'd been beating for a while until I managed to snap her up and get her checked out by a vet and shipped. She fucking hated it. I called her my flight risk because she wasn't used to being inside yet and always tried to run out. Apparently Shinso saw that as me being a piss poor owner. Sarah and Kaminari are in another car behind them. Following as Kirishima cuts a path for them all up through the slowly thickening forest as the buildings all fade out. A hidden trail leading them through and up the mountains. Bakugo isn't sure how Kirishima keeps to the road so closely besides having everything up the hillsides perfectly memorized even when the snow has covered everything laid out before them. Kirishima has thrown Bakugo's snowboard in his own into the truck bed before he came back to the end to pick everyone up. The other three had piled in a pair of skis, a sled, and another board on top of it all, excited to race out into the cold air. It still took some time, waiting for the cakes to come out of the oven, and Ashido insisted they make another ten paper cranes each for the tree before they started changing into snow gear. Kirishima had even brought Bakugo a spare set of his own, saying he didn't feel comfortable going through Bakugo's bags to find his own. It was dumb, but Bakugo appreciated it. Now, he wore a snowsuit a size or two too big for him, but it was warm even if he looked a little clumsy in the black outfit. He found himself sinking back into the oversized collar, inhaling deep and feeling a sense of calm he didn't entirely understand. It should have smelt of mothballs or stale air, but instead smelled so comforting. He decided, seeing as I was gone, it was the perfect opportunity to take her and give her a good home. Oh my god. Ashido gasped softly. Dinky is dating an asshole. Bakugo barks out a sharp laugh at that, missing how Kirishima takes his eyes off the road to look at him just that once. I came home a day early and he was trying to force her into a carrier. A mutual friend of ours actually had to stop me from punching him a few times. Cat clawed the shit out of him, though. Bastard deserved it. He gives Ashido a wide grin, rolling his shoulders as he slumps back in his seat. She's transfixed by the story. Needless to say, I got her back and she's perfectly happy with me now. Still a grumpy bitch sometimes. But I made her this nice patio setup so she can still go outside without running off to get hit by a car or some shit like that. Ashido leans against his chair, batting her lashes at him. Her smile isn't nearly as annoying as it should be. Aw, aren't you just a good cat, Daddy? Bakugo rolls his eyes, shoving her back as she laughs with Riot jumping atop her, licking at her cheek. Bakugo's still smiling, though. He can feel it in his cheeks. He's been smiling a lot since they got into the car, he thinks. It's strange. Ashido is annoyingly loud, but she fills in the conversation when it grows quiet and is good about making sure Bakugo is included, even when he curses and grumbles about it. That makes him feel like a proper guest, like he's welcomed in and not just some displaced tourist. The rest of the drive is filled with conversation and, for once, Bakugo doesn't mind it so much. He learns more about Kirishima, more about Ashido, more about their friends. The outgoing girl dragging an apparently shy Kirishima around with her, helping him come out of his shell. Bakugo can't imagine Kirishima as anything except loud, boisterous, with a headstrong attitude that leaves him opening his mouth to speak long before he can think about it. Apparently, he was nothing as he is now for a long time up until he got into his teens, getting into high school by the time he finally came into himself. At some point, Bakugo and Ashido gang up on Kirishima poking and teasing until Kirishima comes back with a vengeance, reminding Ashido of terrible dates and embarrassing moments when they were idiots in school. Bakugo just laughs at them both, 
rubbing it in that they have nothing on him and quick to mention that he was just as amazing in high school as he is now. It's nice. He feels good here in this moment and it shows in the soft roll of his shoulders. The easy way he lets his eyes crinkle up when he actually laughs. He can't remember the last time a holiday, let alone Christmas, felt this lively. He keeps stealing glances at Kirishima and it seems the redhead is doing much the same as their eyes keep catching one another. It takes them a while to get up to the spot on the mountain that opens up for them, a smooth downhill slope with few trees and a clear view of the buildings and houses far below, dotted through the forest. The town is scattered and carved out way off in the distance. The sun is high and bright in the sky now, the afternoon creating a perfect blanket to fight off the harsh chill so far up in the sky. When Bakugo hops from the truck, his boots sink into the soft powder of the mountain, crunching with every step he takes. Everything is untouched still, looking just as fresh as it did in the morning. The sun shines down on the snow, harsh reflections bouncing back, making Bakugo squint, pulling the goggles he's borrowing down over his eyes as he stares off down the hillside. At night, he bets the town looks beautiful from up here, all glowing with the speckles of rainbow Christmas lights all over the place. Typically, he finds stuff like that stupid. Why aren't you guys busier for the season? He asks as he starts pulling their gear from the truck. Seems like this would be the perfect spot for the holidays. People swarm all over the resort. It's nuts. This shit is way better. We don't advertise. Sarah shrugs next to him, helping pull the set of skis from the truck bed. Years ago, some developer came around wanting to buy everyone out to make another resort, but everyone told him no. Every once in a while, someone else pops up, but they never stick around long. Eventually, some lawyer will get involved and we'll all be screwed, I bet. Kaminari pipes up, starting to drag the sled off. You don't even live here anymore, do you? Here or not, it's still my home. Bakugo rolls his eyes, helping with the other boards and gear thrown in the back. Saro and Ashido take their own stuff, following Kaminari up the slope, leaving Bakugo looking around to hand off Kirishima's own board. It takes him a moment having to come around the other side of the truck to spot him. He's standing out in the middle of the incline, Riot by his side, just staring down the mountain at all the trees and the little buildings below. He's got his hat pulled down tight over his ears. Long red hair still whip around his face, but he doesn't seem to mind. His eyes look distant. Bakugo is silent as he walks closer, Riot looking back at him but doesn't bark. He stops a few meters off, just watching Kirishima. The sunlight looks good on him. His nose already red, his cheeks tinged pink. His eyelashes are long and so noticeable from this angle. There's a smile tugging at the corner of his mouth. Bakugo doesn't want to interrupt, doesn't want to look away. He could stand here just staring at Kirishima for a long while and not mind the cold as much as he always does. Would you give all this up for money? Kirishima's voice cuts through the silence of the winter around them. Bakugo takes pause for a moment, glancing around at the scenery, and then his eyes find their way back to Kirishima, back to this man who looks so fully at peace right in this moment on the side of a mountain with his dog, calf deep in the snow. His throat gets tight in a way that has nothing to do with the high elevation or the chill. No, he says, knowing it to be the truth in this moment. I don't think I would. Kirishima turns back to him, smile even wider as he shakes off whatever warm melancholy he got lost in. Come on. We don't want everyone else destroying the snow before we can get on it. He gets close enough to take his board from Bakugo's grasp. Gloved hands touch, and Bakugo feels scorched. They walk together, following the footprints left behind and the noises of Kirishima's friends growing louder the further up they go. Turns out, Kaminari doesn't snowboard or ski, but he tries. He looks like an idiot doing it. Ashido and Saro are very patient with him, sharing their board and skis respectfully and letting him make a complete ass out of himself as he tries to get further than a few meters without falling straight on his ass. Bakugo's pretty sure they only let him do it to laugh at him, and Kaminari doesn't seem to mind the embarrassing falls either as he sits up, shakes snow from his hair, and keeps trying switching back and forth after Ashido and Saro take a run. Bakugo watches them together sitting off under a tree. 
his board in place and waits for Kirishima to get situated himself. He seems a little bit rusty with the awkward way he struggles to get his boots strapped in. After a moment of watching him, Bakugo huffs and leans forward, shoving his feet into place and pulling the binding tight. Don't tell me you're going to look like him in a second. Bakugo jabs a finger at Kaminari, who falls face first into the snow, shaking clumps from his hair and hat. Kirishima scoffs, shoving at Bakugo. This is my mountain, bro. You'll have a perfect view of my back in a second. Oh, you fucking wish. They wrestle each other as they get up, pulling and tugging at clothes, tripping each other with their boards. It leaves Bakugo red in the face from excursion, getting thrown back with a solid shove that leaves him breathless as he lays in the snow thinking about the arms that just put him there. He's irritated that winter requires so much clothing right now. Cheater. He shouts as finally he gets his footing under him and starts moving towards Kirishima to which he can hear his laughter catching in the wind. He picks up speed quickly and somewhere in the back of his mind a small voice is telling him to stop being an ass because he doesn't know this terrain, this mountain. But he's also been ignoring that voice for almost all of his life, so it's easy to tell it to piss off and keep moving. In front of him, Kirishima looks more comfortable moving than he did sitting down, but still Bakugo can tell his balance is shaky. His weight is off, and it's easy to get next to him. They turn to look at each other, smiling, and then Kirishima is quick to cut in front of him, spraying snow in his wake. Oh, you asshole. Bakugo yells out, brushing the flurry from his face and continuing on after the other man. Apparently, Kirishima wasn't as much of a beginner as Bakugo originally thought. He runs after him down the slope, quick once more to catch up and even quicker to get in front of him. He weaves in and out, taking down his speed, but forcing Kirishima to do the same as they start winding in between each other, back and forth, like a dance within the snow. Bakugo takes the lead once more, speeding down until the slope plateaus into a small ledge and comes to a sharp stop, carving into the fresh snow. It only takes Kirishima a second to catch up, doing much the same as he pivots and comes to a stop beside Bakugo, panting. Dude. That was amazing. Your control is insane. You're not too bad yourself. Bakugo says, pushing his goggles up and grinning from ear to ear. There's a warm thrumming in his chest that he can't pin on any of the other snowboarding runs he's taken before. He knows how it feels for his lungs to burn with the need for air, even if it leaves icicles in his throat, or how his legs are like lead after a long day up and down a mountain. But this, he's never felt this kind of surge before. The space between them is filled with heavy breathing, but the lack of words doesn't bother Bakugo at all. He wants to bottle up this emotion and keep it forever, adrenaline driving through his body like he just pulled someone out from a collapsing building. But this time, it's that rush without feeling like he might actually die any second. No, right now he feels so much more alive. He wants to close the distance. He wants to pull Kirishima in and make sure he feels this too. He... Out of the way... Both of them have half a second to stumble back, falling into the snow, before a blur of color topped in a shock of yellow rushes past them. They look on as the sled hits the plateau hard, and instead of slowing down or keeping on its downward path, it flies up a few meters with a loud shout before plummeting to the ground in a mess of sled and body. The pair stare at each other for another beat before they're both ripping the bindings from their feet, darting off into the snow to follow the crumpled path that Kaminari just made. Dinky. Holy shit. There's some more yelling behind them getting closer, but Bakugo and Kirishima don't pay it any mind as they fall to their knees at Kaminari's body half buried in the snow. Don't move him. Don't. Oh. A groan interrupts Bakugo, his hand still right above the lump that is Kaminari as the man shifts, rolling over onto his back to look up at them, blinking snow from his eyes. Okay, how solid did I look right before I crashed? Bakugo just stares at him wide-eyed, not knowing what to say, and Kirishima falls back into the snow with a groan of his own, rubbing at his forehead. Dinky bro, what the fuck? Are you okay? Ashido and Saro come sliding into view, screaming at the same time as they fall around Kaminari as well, completing the little circle around his body. He gives a thumbs up and laughs as well as he can, but ends up coughing halfway through it. Fine, totally fine, except... 
don't think I'm going to be going down anymore today. Sarah looks just about ready to pull his hair out. One of us already has a concussion, you idiot. You could have killed yourself. Kaminari sits up slowly, wincing only slightly as he rolls his shoulders before peering up at the faces of his worried friends. But seriously, how cool was that? Ashido hits him. They make their way back up the mountain slowly, with Ashido still yelling at Kaminari, roughly pulling at him for someone so worried. But thankfully, he doesn't seem injured much beyond being sore and very likely earning a few bruises from his fall. Kirishima carries both his board and the sled, the weight looking easy on his shoulders. It makes Bakugo bringing up the rear of the group worth it to watch the way his arms shift to balance it all together. Getting back up to their cars, everyone takes a moment to rest when Saro breaks out thermoses of tea, pouring warmth back into their bodies with every sip. It's still early, but the cold sinks in deep and fast, especially the longer they keep still. Bakugo is content to sit on the hood of Tetsu Tetsu's pickup with Ashido by his side after turning down the offer of another run, slowly drinking his tea, mostly keeping his gloved hands warm with it. He figures it's best to take it a little easy with his body still trying to piece itself back together after the car crash. The pressure behind his eyes is telling him he should probably rest soon, or at the very least take another pain med, but he can push it back a bit longer. His eggs ache from the first go, but everything else feels pretty okay right now. He watches the three other men once more try to teach Kaminari how to stand up properly on a snowboard. They're more careful about letting him slide off too far this time like parents keeping an eye on their child. Kaminari is goofy-footed standing, trying to figure out how he should hold his hips and how to maneuver using his own weight and balance. Kirishima is in front of him and Saro at his back, ready to catch him if he starts to fall too far in one direction. They snicker and laugh as Kaminari trips himself up and topples into Kirishima, who catches him quickly against his broad chest. Kaminari is quick to shove at him but it only results in him tumbling back the other way too hard, and though Sarah catches him, it sends them back down into the snow in a fit of laughter. Bakugo burns his tongue on the tea, keeping the hot liquid in his mouth for too long, having forgotten to swallow. Ashido. He starts, keeping the little cup near his mouth so his voice doesn't travel. Christmas is Kirishima's favorite, right? Ashido blinks at him, her dark-rimmed eyes wide and owlish. Uh, duh. You really need me to confirm that? He doesn't. He doesn't need to be asking this either. Then why is this house not decorated? She stills, saying nothing. The silence carrying on for so long that Bakugo turns towards her, eyebrow raised. She bites her lip before saying, The last time his house was decorated like it used to be was the Christmas before his mom died. Yeah. Bakugo looks down into his cup of tea, barely seeing the ripple of his reflection looking back at him. That's what I thought. He's mostly busy now. Ashido is quick to fill in, as though she needs to make an excuse for her best friend that isn't sad. During the holidays, he helps everyone out. Well, he does that no matter what the season is. But during the winter and Christmas, he goes into overdrive. A lot of people who live here are older or they don't have anyone else around to help so he always makes sure everyone is set up before ever thinking about himself. Does he ever? She blinks, sighing heavily before looking up at the trio now all down in the mass of white. Riot is barking at them as he hops through the snow. No, not really. I think it's sort of like his way of repenting or something. Helping everyone makes him feel better, or at least lets him ignore whatever else he's supposed to be feeling. I love him, but... Bakugo dumps the rest of his tea into the snow, watching the ice melt under the heat. You wish he was more selfish sometimes. Well, in an instant, she can't speak as a white mass slams into the side of her face, exploding, filling her mouth with ice. Nailed her. Tinky, you are dead. She has another second of wiping snow from her eyes before another snowball hits her right in the chest. Bakugo throws his head back to laugh when a snowball smacks into his chest. His glare as he turns to face them could melt the slush right off his face, murdering them where they stand. The three of them stand with snowballs in hand, armed and ready. Sarah points at Kirishima. Bakugo grins. 
Oh, you're fucking dead, shitty hair. Kirishima balks. Shitty. There's not time for him to object as Bakugo and Ashido are quick to retaliate, jumping from the hood of the truck to use the parked cars as a barrier while they quickly form together snowballs and start pelting the others. A battle starts up quickly with the trio running off to take cover behind the tree line, which leaves their backs open for solid hits for each of them before they can disappear among the tree trunks. You form them all nail them between the eyes. He hisses out, both hands curled around a perfectly formed snowball. Ashido salutes him. Roger that, Captain. He's starting to like her more and more. They become a dominating machine. Ashido is exceptionally good at forming the snow into tight, near-perfectly spherical balls that don't fall apart when Bakugo throws them and hits directly where he wants. His eyes are sharp, zeroing in on any movement he sees among the trees and quick to dodge any ammo thrown his way. Two against three never felt so matched as Saro, Kaminari, and Kirishima struggled to keep up. Bakugo hits Saro in the head, a rapid fire that turns into two more throws with one landing at his shoulder. Kaminari nearly gets Bakugo his payback, but he's quick to duck behind the trunk and Ashido is right at his back, throwing one right at Kaminari's face. They get smarter after that, and soon, Bakugo is suddenly assaulted by a charge of all three of them, yelling as they run from the trees with hands loaded and Bakugo isn't fast enough for all of them. Saro tackles Ashido back into the snow, rubbing one of his snowballs in her face to which she squeals in shock as the cold hits her hard. Kaminari only gets one of his in with a solid hit to Bakugo's chest. Bakugo moves to give some payback, but before he can form one up, Kirishima throws two immediately, both hitting Bakugo in the side of his face, one right after the other. Time seems to stand still as snow falls from his cheek and ears, some sticking to his eyelashes and brow, blurring his vision, but it doesn't matter as all he can see is red. Kirishima bites back his smile. Oops. They both move at the same time. Kirishima is yelling as he runs off into the woods. Bakugo quick on his tail, stomping through the snow as quickly as he can, chasing after his prey. Come back here, you idiot, and take your lumps like a man. He shouts, arms moving up to shield his face from three branches when Kirishima weaves and ducks around them. His heart is pounding, limbs burning with the cold. His nose feels like it might actually fall off. Kirishima knows his way better, but Bakugo is pissed off and determined, a combination that hasn't let him down yet. It's more about stamina at this point, and after a few minutes of shouting, laughing, and more shouting, Bakugo starts to catch up. It's when they shift slightly downward that he makes his move, coiling his muscles, and when he sees Kirishima's footing grow a little unstable, he pounces. Gotcha. Bakugo tackles Kirishima down taking hold of his shoulders as they both fall into the snow. It's deep out here, and it's hard to see much of anything as their arms and legs go flying, grabbing at each other and wrestling through the slush. They roll a few times with neither of them giving the other the upper hand, but it's brute strength against stubborn skill and Bakugo can only keep pushing the mountain of muscle off of him so many times before the pure strength wins out. Kirishima gets a grip at his forearms and his knees at his thighs, using his full weight to keep Bakugo down. He shoves as soon as Bakugo tries to get up, leaning down with a bright white smile on his face. What was that about gotcha? Bakugo can feel the warmth of his breath against his own lips, and suddenly, suddenly time stands still. The forest around them is silent. The breeze disappears, letting the trees fall quiet. There's not a bird call or a branch breaking herd. Any noise from Kirishima's friends, from the area of parked cars, from the town far beyond the trees and world far beyond that, it's all gone. There's nothing. Nothing except Bakugo's heartbeat, except Kirishima's panting. Of how Kirishima straddles him, their chests pressed together, and only an exhale of space between them. They stare. They're still. Bakugo looks and suddenly realizes how much brighter Kirishima's eyes are compared to his own, how close he is, how warm he feels against him, below him, how much he wants to kiss him. He wants and wants so badly. And Kirishima isn't moving, isn't pulling back. He's staring at Bakugo just as much, if not more so, and there's a sudden look in his eyes, 
like he's contemplating, uncertain. And just as it comes, it's gone, and he looks content, settled. And Bakugo is so aware of how his weight shifts forward from his legs to his arms as he leans in more, mouth closing just enough. And Bakugo is leaning up to meet him, too, and... Snow comes crashing down on Kirishima's head. The world turns sharp and sudden, spinning once more. Bakugo hears an echo of the yelling even after it's done. Kirishima topples down beside him, just barely missing Bakugo's body as he shakes off the huge crumble of snow like a dog, turning back sharp with his cheeks red with a fire that burns bright under his skin. He looks about ready to kill for the first time since Bakugo's met him. Kaminari, what the hell, dude? Being as dense as he is, Kaminari doesn't seem to notice what he just rent. Just smiles as he laughs, hands at his hips. Mina made a truce with me and Saro. How the tides have turned. Kirishima stands up as soon as Bakugo does, both growling, both ready to hide a body in the woods, both of their hearts beating far, far too quickly. Bakugo turns his glare at Kaminari, ready to take all of his frustration out on the idiot that interrupted what could have happened. You'll be lucky if they find your body before spring, Pikachu. What Bakugo is now hell-bent determined to make happen. They all run. The afternoon seems to go by in a flash. There's more snowboarding, more skiing, more shoving snow in each other's faces. When they get tired, they all sit down and drink more tea in an attempt to keep their hands warm, but in the process, their butts go numb from sitting in the snow. It's good. It's fun. Bakugo finds himself enjoying the time more than he ever thought he would. It feels like a less stressful firehouse environment where instead of being aware that at any moment he would have to run off to put out a blaze, he was blissfully unaware of the rest of the world moving around him. It's a vacation where he finally feels like he wants to stay. There isn't another moment alone with Kirishima, however. Any time Bakugo attempted, it was quickly ruined, whether it was from one of his friends catching up or Riot running over, trying to tackle either of them down into the snow to play. It was frustrating, to say the least, especially now that every single time he looked at Kirishima, all he could focus on were his lips, red and chapped from the cold. Probably terrible right now to kiss, but Bakugo really wanted to see that for himself. Anytime he caught Kirishima's eye for longer than a moment, he could see a red tint rise up in the man's cheeks, telling him that this wasn't just a fluke. Kirishima was well aware of what happened, what almost happened and Bakugo desperately hoped they'd be able to continue sometime soon, even if the idea made him feel guilty about having it. It feels wrong, as if he's leading Kirishima on with something that won't actually stick. He's not staying, after all. He still needs to leave. This isn't his home. These aren't his friends, and Kirishima is a one-night stand, maybe two at best. Whatever fairy tale bubble this space is in will pop eventually. Still... Bakugo can't help himself. He hates it. He's greedy. The sun starts to dip lower in the sky, the bright blue softly giving way to a warm pink as the shadows grow long across the mountain. They pack up, finally, tired and worn with hungry stomachs and noses ready to fall off from the cold. Ashido moves towards Saro's car, stating she'll drive back with him this time, which Bakugo quietly thanks her. Nothing's been said, but he figures she's taken note as the day has gone on. As soon as Kaminari turns towards the truck, she's quick to grab his arm and yank him back, shoving him into the back seat of the car as he whines about being delicate and bruising. Again, Bakugo thanks her, knowing for a fact that he would kill the blonde if he came between him and Kirishima again. When Kirishima notices the car arrangement, he pauses with his hand on the door handle, looking back and forth, mouth gaping, and for a second, Bakugo thinks he might have misread the situation entirely. Impossible. Just get in, shitty hair. Bakugo rolls his eyes, slamming his own door shut as he slides into the passenger seat. The nickname is sticking. Kirishima follows along into the car quickly. 
It doesn't feel right to jump a guy while he's driving, especially while trying to navigate through thick snow, and even more so with his dog in the back seat. It becomes even more of a bad idea with Bakugo knowing the trio is following close behind them, and any jerking movements from the truck would signal something is wrong. Still, as they make their way down the mountain, Bakugo thinks about it. He thinks about Kirishima in his house, walking around without a shirt on near constantly, never seeming to get cold and wonders just how warm he would be in bed. Bakugo might not even need a blanket with that warm, muscled weight on top of him. He thinks about his bright smile, even brighter eyes, and can feel his chest tighten at the mental image. They're close, so close right now in his truck. All Bakugo has to do is lean across the console and take him. It's bad. He shouldn't. Bakugo would never call himself desperate, but he's starting to understand what people mean when they say it. Uh, hey. Bakugo startled out of his own thoughts by Kirishima breaking the silence between them. He looks to the redhead, quirking a brow up at him in response. If you wanted, you could stay at the end until you leave. Kirishima is biting at his lip, hands ringing against the steering wheel. We can go get your bags and... Bakugo interrupts him. Why the fuck would I want to do that? He knows he's not very good with bedroom eyes or whatever the fuck, but he figured Kirishima wasn't dense enough to think he didn't like the advances they've made. Maybe Bakugo should have said something when they got into the truck alone. Maybe he shouldn't have just stared out the window again. Or maybe he should have jumped across to straddle his lap. At the very least, he hadn't figured the silence would scare him away. Or maybe now that Kirishima did have time to think about it, he realized his own mistake. Well, you know. Kirishima says, still biting his lip, not making eye contact with Bakugo's burning gaze. I'm not really sure I have electricity still, and you could have your own space, so you're more comfortable. You think I'm not comfortable with you? Bakugo scoffs, crossing his arms now, feeling all those warm, tingly feelings quickly disappear. Kirishima hesitates, obviously not wanting to say more, lest he makes Bakugo more irritated. Of course, this was too good to be true. The afternoon went too well, and Bakugo got dazzled by all the happy-go-lucky bullshit surrounding everyone. It was stupid to even think Kirishima would want to do anything. He should have known he was reading the whole thing completely wrong. Whatever. At the very least, he didn't have to worry about feeling guilty anymore. If you don't want me to stay with you, just fucking... It's not that. Kirishima's voice is loud in the small space. Bakugo feels like he wants to punch him. Then what? Your nightmares. I figured, well... The anger in his veins dissipates immediately, replaced with an ice that leaves the rest of his body feeling hollowed out and heavy. The wind is knocked from his chest as though he's in a car crash all over again trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I'm sorry. Kirishima is quick to apologize as soon as he sees Bakugo freeze. I just thought it wouldn't help. Bakugo says, turns away from Kirishima, slumping back down into his seat feeling gutted and guilty. He shouldn't have snapped so quickly, so easily. Kirishima was just trying to be considerate. He wanted to help him, but good God, he hates whenever people do. He sighs, pressing his cheek against the truck's window, feeling the cold sink back into him. His head is really starting to pound. It would probably make them worse, actually. Worse. Kirishima asks, and Bakugo knows that tone of voice, knows where this question leads. He doesn't want to deal with this, not from Kirishima. He doesn't want worry from a stranger. Pity. Why would it make things worse? Bakugo thinks about what his therapist would say. Thinks about the long, drawn-out sessions back in his teens and early 20s. About how to deal with his emotions in a healthy way. About communication. About how he doesn't always have to explode at people in defense. It's annoying. He doesn't want to. But he knows he also owes Kirishima just this small amount after snapping. Still, he can feel how his throat tightens before he speaks. Fuck emotions. They come out with new environments. Sleeping in strange places. Going to stay in some dumb little hotel with cramped walls, I don't know, will make it fucking worse. At least I kinda know where I am with you. 
He really doesn't mean it like that. Not on purpose. But Bakugo can tell it was a good thing to say. Kirishima seems to relax a little bit more beside him. His knuckles gaining back color as the grip he had on the wheel loosens. His shoulders let down the weight of this conversation and it makes Bakugo feel like he can breathe easier now. Know where I am with you. It's not wrong, but it's not right. Bakugo feels like he dodged a bullet, but the air around them is still thick with a different kind of tension, as though they're back laying on top of each other in the snow. The drive ends far too soon while still feeling too long. When they enter back onto Main Street, Bakugo can tell. It's not the buildings that give it away, but the lights. There's a rainbow hue in the air surrounding everything. Fairy lights flicker in bushes, raveled up trees, hanging from every roof and gutter his eyes can see. Giant luminescent candy canes glow all along one storefront while another has a full display of Santa and his sleigh waving from the rooftop with all nine reindeer ready to fly off into the sky. The town seems so much quieter in the daytime, dead and dormant, and now with the sun finally setting into a single thin line of orange on the horizon, the town wakes up. It shines. Bakugo doesn't think he's seen anything like it and doesn't think he ever will again. It's blinding and bright, and even if the radio is not on in the car, he swears he can hear the cheering of Christmas music playing softly in the distance. He wonders if that's real or if his brain is just filling in the gaps. Holy fucking shit. It's awe-inspiring and terrifying all at once. Kirishima looks so pleased as they keep driving down Main Street to the end at the end of it all. Yeah, I had to fix a couple things this morning to make sure nothing was super damaged from the storm. But I think it's pretty good this year, huh? Bakugo feels like he needs to shield his eyes. You put all this shit up. He knows Ashido mentioned him helping people out with their decorations, but this seems ridiculous. He shrugs. Mostly only the big stuff on the roofs or things that require ladders. I lend a hand here and there when I can. What bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. Baka goes dead positive that the overly helpful ray of fucking sunshine in Santa's official holiday elf would put all the lights and statues up even if no one else was around. He'd decorate the entire town on his own if need be and he'd probably enjoy it. And for some odd reason, that thought makes Bakugo's heart start beating faster against his ribs like the traitor that it is. Kirishima honestly can't be real. Come on. He says, parking in the same spot he had that morning. We can eat here with everyone, just in case there's no power when we get back. Saro's car is just coming down the street with the rest of their ragtag group, and Bakugo figures they'd have to wait, but apparently no one here locks doors either. Even with no one at the inn, no one manning the desk at all, Kirishima enters without issue, the bell chiming happily above to welcome them back. Bakugo does spot a little sign at one of the windows that he knows is part of the diner that says closed, but obviously that doesn't matter too much. The lights are on inside still, though Kirishima is quick to go plug in the Christmas tree. His face brightens just as the tree does, sparkling with the little spots of pinks and greens and blues all dotting around the pine branches, weaving in and out as they twinkle in an unsynchronized rhythm. All the little cranes hiding along the needles are seen as soon as the nearest light shines on them. Bakugo thinks they look like little monsters peeking out, but he doesn't comment. Zero. Ashido and Kaminari say together as they too come in from the cold. Kaminari is already peeling off his thick outer layer, getting wet snow everywhere in the lobby. We're, We're hungry. hungry. Sarah rolls his eyes, heading into a safe haven of a kitchen, flipping them both off as he passes them by. The air still smells slightly of sugar and vanilla from the morning. And I still need to prepare cakes. You two can feed yourselves. The pair whine again, throwing themselves down into booths in the restaurant, flopping dramatically out of the long seats. Bakugo kicks them both, seeing as they've made it so easy. Oi, idiot children. I can cook. What the fuck do you want? They all talk at once, Kirishima included, to which Bakugo very easily ignores them all because they're loud, jumble, and he's kind of used to it from also working with a bunch of loud idiots. Typically, if he's working a shift for dinner, he'd cook for everyone, too. Mostly because no one else really could, and they've had to put out more than one fire in their own kitchen at the firehouse when certain members got too close to the stove. 
Those nights they enjoyed because they knew they'd be fed well, and it also normally meant Bakugo was in a good mood, willing to sit around the table with them to eat. They're all still shouting out suggestions as Bakugo heads back to check what's available in the fridge. Kaminari wants burgers. Ashido keeps slamming her hands down on the countertop with cries of some sort of vegetable combination that's apparently left over in the fridge, and Kirishima sounds like he'd be okay with anything that was previously alive. When he meets Saro's eyes in the back kitchen, he's given a sympathetic look even as Bakugo's eye twitches. Future hint, never give him a choice. He winks before turning back to slicing the huge bowl of strawberries for the cakes. Bakugo takes the advice to heart and gets to work. He's not being nice, he says, just that it's easier to make them all hamburger steaks in the end. Nothing about appeasing Kaminari or Kirishima. He does find the veggies that Ashido is screaming about, too. Lotus root, mushrooms, turnips, cabbage. He much prefers cooking in the summer when there's more in season, but he makes do as he always does, even if he knows the colors are off. Cutting and frying and getting everything together. It takes some time. The trio in the sitting area have quieted down to a soft rumble of conversation beyond the kitchen walls. Sarah is focused on finishing the cakes, or as many as he can, and once more they move around each other well. Bakugo asks where pans are, where he keeps seasoning, and is always answered with a sharp gesture towards one cabinet or another. At some point, Kirishima wanders in, drawn by his nose, Bakugo figures, and starts to hover. He finds a stool to sit on eventually when Bakugo has to smack him for getting too close, so he settles and just watches. Even in the industrial kitchen, him being there feels domestic. He watches and doesn't try to force conversation, appearing to just want to be close and provide company, even with Saro already on the other side of the kitchen taking up space. Bakugo doesn't mind. He should. He hates when anyone is in his kitchen while he's working, but he doesn't. When he's all done... Burgers made, vegetables fried, rice sitting steaming in the cooker. He gets Kirishima to help him carry all the dishes out, setting them out on one of the larger booths in the diner. They gather Saro, pulling Kaminari and Ashido from the small nap they were taking on the counter, and gather close to eat. They thank Bakugo for cooking, for the meal, and dig in. The meal is loud and jovial. The dark winter night outside the window glowing bright with all the lights, the little town street quiet beyond the windows of the diner where it seems the only life on earth thrives. Softly, it starts to snow. Bakugo and Kirishima sit shoulder to shoulder, the booth not quite large enough for all of them to sit within comfortably with all the plates and bowls on the table, but it works. Kirishima keeps bumping his elbow into Bakugo as he reaches for more, and every time Bakugo turns, he runs quickly into Kirishima's side. Neither of them say anything. It's close and warm, and their tired, well-worked limbs thawed out with the food. Bellies full and happy. It's nice. The little bell of the inn chimes, cutting through their conversation, which makes Riot start barking, running from his position under one table to greet the new guests. Though it doesn't take a second longer to realize who it is as Tetsu Tetsu comes yelling through the diner. You wait without us. We're inside, Tetsu dear. No need to yell. Besides, I fed you an hour ago. Of course, Kirishima scrambles up to greet his cousin in a big bear hug, which nearly looks like it may end in a wrestling match on the floor if it went on any longer. But thankfully, they pull apart, and Kirishima is soon scooping up a red-haired woman into his arms. It's good. I'm so glad you made it out. She laughs, patting Kirishima on the back, not looking uncomfortable at all in his tight grip. We're not exactly busy at the garage. I figured I could take a break to come say hi to everyone and meet the mysterious stranger. Bakugo rolls his eyes, again with the mysterious stranger bullshit. That's fine. We're all friends now, right, Baku bro? Kaminari throws him a thumbs up and Bakugo scoffs. Tetsu Tetsu huffs himself. Don't listen, he's an ass. Takes one to know one, dick. Kirishima is quick to get between them, Itsuka also keeping a tight hold on her husband as she pinches his arm with a smile on her face as she pushes through the men to finally get to Bakugo. Tetsu Tetsu Itsuka, nice to finally meet you. My husband's been talking about you all day. Again, Bakugo rolls his eyes, but takes her outstretched hand anyway. 
Her grip is firm. The calluses on her fingers and palms rough against his own, telling of how hard she works. He can appreciate that. Bakugo Kotsky. I'm sure that's been annoying as shit to listen to. She smiles. He's not as rough around the edges as he might seem, I swear. Just doesn't like strangers. Especially ones that get close to his family. The smile on her lips doesn't just look friendly now. It looks knowing. Bakugo bites at his tongue and tries not to think too hard about that. He wonders if Ashido and Itsuka talk a lot or if every woman in this town can just read him far, far too well. Either way, it's a little unnerving. He drops her hand. Whatever. There's still plenty of food if you want some. Hey, Kirishima. The man perks up. Can I borrow your phone again? Oh, yeah, of course. He excuses himself, getting up to make room for the couple to pile in. The booth still isn't big enough. A chair needs to be pulled up, but no one moves to make space at another booth. They make it work. Bakugo grabs the offered phone with a grumbled out thank you as he walks off towards the lobby for some sort of privacy. He doesn't need all of them listening into his personal life, gossiping, and God forbid his mother hears any of them in the background. He'd never be able to hang up. After a few rings, his mom picks up even though it's his dad's number. Even if he already realized this would happen, Bakugo's not entirely prepared to hear her voice again. This better be you, Brett. He sighs heavily into the phone, pinching the bridge of his nose. You know, I could just never call you instead, hag. His mother sounds tired. It's getting late. They've probably already eaten themselves, which means they've probably already polished off a bottle of wine between them, working on a second. They always drink wine on winter holidays. Still, the bite isn't as harsh in her voice as it typically is. She's probably been worried. Not that she would ever admit to something like that. He gets his stubbornness from his mother, after all. Listen, I just wanted to let you and Dad know that I'm fine. Kotsky, you were in a goddamn car wreck and snowed in in some weird place. How the hell am I supposed to know you're fine? Do I sound like I'm dying to you, huh? I could take care of myself. I'm a fucking adult. Don't speak to me like that, you brat. I'm allowed to worry about my son. And I said I'm fine. Bakugo hisses, turning his back to the entrance to the diner and taking a few steps away, just in case. In the background, he can still hear everyone talking, but it seems to have gotten a little softer now. He refuses to turn around, just in case they're all staring. I'm still staying with the guy who found me. I met all his stupid friends. I just can't leave with all the snow, so whenever I can, I'm just going home after all this shit. There's a pause. A long one which means his mother is thinking, and that's dangerous, and he realizes his mistake a second too late. You met his friends. God damn it. Mom, don't do this shit. Shut up. When the hell's the last time you made a friend? Is this guy cute? You were always good on bringing condoms, but... No, no, shut the fuck up. I'm hanging up now. Bye. Kotsky. He clicks the end call button before anything else can be said. He's positive she'll be gushing about how much progress he's made with his dad or some shit, and the very last thing he needs is his mother asking about his sex life, which she has before, multiple times. It's horrible. One more call. This one might even be worse. It only rings once before being picked up. Midoriya's phone, Uraraka speaking. The universe really wants him to break something. Roundface, why the fuck are you answering Deku's phone? Oh, Bakugo, how's your trip? I hit a tree and bunked up with strangers. Where's Deku? She pauses. Bakugo growls. How are you just breezing over being in a car accident? Does Midoriya know that? He doesn't need to know Dick. Only thing he needs to do is take care of my cat. Which he is, thank you very much. She huffs in his ear. He's actually feeding her right now, and honestly, who spoils a cat with fresh fish every day? She eats better than I do. If you're so jealous, tell Deku to stop being a cheap ass and take you out for a real fucking meal. He takes me out plenty. You're the one spending half his paycheck on a cat. She's mine. What the fuck do you care how much I spend on her? They go around like this for a few more minutes, back and forth. Most of their relationship exactly this. Uaraka is one of the only people he knows that will actually snap back at him, 
giving just as much shit as he does. It's grown into something of a mutual respect for one another over the years, and he still can't believe Deku, of all people, is dating her. He leans against the nearest wall, the Christmas tree right beside him. He flicks at a few of the lights, watching them dance. Cat's good, though, right? Bakugo hears the smile in her voice. Yeah, she's fine. Scratch Midoriya a few times, but I think she's warming up to him. Traitor. She snorts. And how are you? Sound okay for a guy who apparently ran into a tree with his car? He shrugs. A guy dragged me out and brought me to the town he lives in. I'm crashing at his place for a bit. It's nice. Nice? Bakugo winces as the word is repeated to him. Since when is anything in your life nice? This guy must be something special. Fuck's sake, I've only known him for three days. That's not a no, Bakugo. What's his name? No way. Oops, look at that. Gotta go, round face. Bakugo? Tell Deku he's a nerd for me. You're a jerk. He hangs up without actually saying goodbye. Letting out a heavy sigh as he lets his head rest against the wall. He doesn't need to have anyone else getting involved in his life. No details are needed when he's not going to see Kirishima or anyone else again by the end of the week. All he's got to do is get through Christmas, rent a car from somewhere, and drive back home. Easy. No one needs to get excited over something that won't happen. He opens his eyes, not realizing he closed them, and ends up meeting Kirishima's own gaze across the way. He's standing in the doorway between the lobby and the diner. His expression carries too much concern, and Bakugo doesn't like the tug his stomach makes at that realization. He shouldn't want. He can't want. It's not like he'll be able to keep it. Everything okay? Bakugo pushes himself up from the wall, letting his eyes drop as he hands the phone back to Kirishima. Yeah, everything's fine. Think I'm just getting tired. Kirishima gives him a smile. It's perfectly warm and welcoming and genuinely happy, just like they all have been. Bakugo feels like he's doing something wrong being able to see it, like he doesn't deserve this. Uraka is right. Kirishima is special. It's just Bakugo who's not. Wanna go home now? He likes the word home. The pull of the cottage in the woods far, far away from everything and everyone sounds perfect with its multiple blankets, warm fireplace, and the handsome man who lives there. Bakugo can't like that. Yeah. He says, returning Kirishima's smile as much as he can. It feels like a lie. Let's go. The snow outside is starting to come down in a heavier blanket as they drive. It's not like the storm. The wind isn't harsh and visibility isn't terrible, but it's enough to mute the outside world around them. Just Bakugo, Kirishima, and Riot once more driving through the town past all the bright lights and back into the darker woods towards the cabin beyond. Kirishima takes it slow. He eases into the curves of the road and makes sure he brakes as softly as possible to make the drive smooth. Bakugo doesn't want to think that's for him, but he can feel Kirishima glance at him from time to time, taking notice of how relaxed he is leaning up against the window, using his arm as a pillow. He knows Bakugo is tired. He's considerate. He's letting him rest while they go. Bakugo says nothing and neither does Kirishima, but this time around it feels nice. A comfortable silence that matches the atmosphere of a snowy night through the mountains. The only lights around are the truck's headlights and speckles of little houses still awake in the distance sitting on roads not taken. He's growing used to Kirishima's quiet comfort. For as loud as he is when he gets talking. For as bold as his movements are. As prominent his person is. Bakugo's starting to ease into it all and Kirishima seems to be doing much the same with him. It's strange. He doesn't remember the last person's presence he has accepted so easily, or who has actually ever accepted his. 
He takes Bakugo's angry snapped words with a smile and his lack of social skills with kind gestures. They're starting to move around each other easily. It's dangerous. When they pull into the driveway, Bakugo doesn't immediately move, and there's a hesitation as Kirishima turns off the car, hand outstretched but not moving past the halfway point of the truck console keeping them apart. Don't worry. Bakugo grumbles out softly, easing his body up from leaning against the door, stretching out as much as he can in the small space of the interior. I'm awake. No need to carry me in. Kirishima lets out a little huff, withdrawing his hand. Still can if you want. I know you're probably sore from today. Bakugo rolls his eyes. You act as though I've never been sore before. No, I just really wanted to offer. Bakugo freezes as he swings his door open, the words echoing in his ears as though he needed to hear it again just to confirm. Kirishima doesn't notice this pause opening the back door for Riot to jump out and move towards the front door, the walkway slowly being covered in more snow. It takes Bakugo another few beats to remember where he is, that it's cold outside and he's halfway out of a truck and his host is flirting with him. He's not so much of an idiot to not notice, but he has to be stupid enough to actually like it. He'll lean into this just like he's done all day with everything Kirishima has thrown at him. He finds that he can't help himself all of a sudden, Kirishima has a gravity all his own. The house is still dark, still cold, but there's no wind as the door closes behind them, all three of them shaking off the excess snow, stomping boots and paws trying to dry them off. Riot is quick to trot off into the dark, taking the hall towards the living room very likely ready to go to bed just as Bakugo is. Kirishima has flashlights at the ready, handing Bakugo one as he turns his on, dimly lighting the dark kitchen. Wanna go get some pajamas on? Get comfortable. I'll start the fire for us. There's a slight argument on his tongue. Bakugo's tired. He figured he might just go to bed in his own room and wait out until morning when the sun was up again to try and figure everything out. The request of comfort and fire, however, is tempting. The idea of staying up with Kirishima, sitting in front of the warm fireplace, didn't sound as terrible an idea as the night before. He can stay up a little bit longer with him, he figures. It won't hurt any. He goes without complaint, moving a little slow in the small span of light the flashlight gives him. It's a little awkward getting undressed in the semi-darkness. He doesn't realize how much his body actually aches until he's pulling his shirt over his head, shoulders protesting the movement so much he bites his cheek to force down the hiss wanting to pass his lips. His lower body isn't as bad though as soon as he's sitting on the bed, it hits him how he doesn't want to get up. His legs are heavy. His body tells him it's time to sleep. It's dark. The bed is right there under him, but he can't disappoint Kirishima like that. Even if he would probably understand, Bakugo would much rather be sitting in the dark with him right now. By force of will alone, he powers through, slipping his pajamas on with a thick sweater over top and socks to keep his feet warm before he shuffles out of the spare bedroom and down the hallway to the living room. The fire is already burning, bright orange light illuminating the space with Riot laying out on the carpet right next to the couch already looking to be asleep while his master finishes making sure the fire is big enough to not go out. He puts up the gate and turns, smiling in a manner that's quieter than his previous ones as he sees Bakugo come around the corner. He's dressed down in the time that it took for Bakugo to change. He's wearing flannel pajama pants just like the other day, shirtless with a blanket acting as a shawl over his shoulders. Bakugo doesn't care at all that he stares for a time that is all too unnecessary. He's beyond being polite if this is how Kirishima is going to be. How are you feeling? He asks as Bakugo settles at the corner of the couch legs immediately curling up under him as he tugs a blanket laying over the back cushions over himself. It's soft, a fuzzy, well-worn felt that smells just like the rest of the house. Tired. Sore. Bakugo says, his voice soft to match the mood. Don't know if car accidents and snowboarding go hand in hand very well. Do you need anything? Kirishima immediately looks worried crowding Bakugo's space as he crouches down in front of him as if he's going to fight back Bakugo's tired muscles with his big puppy dog stare. 
the fire halos out of his hair as it burns behind him and Bakugo swears no one is allowed to look this tempting right in front of him. It's not fair. Bakugo grumbles. I'm fine, shitty hair. Stop looking at me like I'm dying. He nudges him gently with his foot and there's a second of Kirishima pushing back at him before he's standing again. I'll make us something warm. What? We just ate. Don't worry, I'll be right back. Just stay right there. Where else am I supposed to go? Kirishima says nothing else as he disappears back down the hallway towards the spare rooms and kitchen, leaving Bakugo alone with the fire and Riot, who isn't moving at all beyond the slow rise and fall of his stomach, sound asleep. He's ever so slightly jealous of the dog. It's quiet except for the fire crackling across from him and the slight movement of Kirishima he can hear through the walls. They're thin and old and hear everything that has ever happened within them. He thinks about his own childhood home. How modern it was with high ceilings and white walls that never seemed to see a spot of dirt unless Bakugo put it there out of childish excitement or adolescent fury. With its wide, clear windows that covered half the house, that would be open in the spring to bring in the soft breeze and all the furniture that changed so quickly over the years with the new seasons and new designs. Everything changed. Nothing lasted except for the people that lived there. It was nothing like this place. Bakugo doesn't realize how comfortable he's grown here until Kirishima's hand is at his shoulder, gently shaking him awake as he is dozed off with the growing warmth of the room. The hand lingers, moving to curl across his throat, barely cupping his jaw as his eyes blink open to meet Kirishima's own. You know, you're allowed to go to bed if you want. Shut up, I'm fine. You're the one who left me. There's a soft snicker and the heat of Kirishima's hand at his skin disappears before Bakugo can lean into it. He doesn't go far, however, sitting on the cushion right next to Bakugo, handing him one of the mugs that Bakugo can now see he was balancing in the other palm. Bakugo blinks, taking it. You made tea? Hot chocolate, actually. A fucking course it is. He looks down at the mug swirling the contents inside to see the deep, rich liquid move within. There's no marshmallows or whipped cream, just dark chocolate that steams within the mug. It looks too thick to have been made with a quick kettle boiling and powder, which makes Baka go wonder how long he was resting his eyes before he was woken up. He grunts. I don't typically like sweet things. Moves to put the mug down onto the coffee table, but Kirishima catches him by the wrist before he can. Try it. I made it with you in mind. It's terrible how easily he gives in to the request, knowing full well that in any other situation with anyone else he would have told them to piss off, but not with Kirishima. He looks so damn earnest as he watches him sit back with his mug and finally takes a sip, anticipation written all over his face as he waits for Bakugo's reaction. Which is good. He pulls back, surprised, and licks his lips of the first drink tasting the little spice hot on his tongue. Kirishima's eyes don't leave him. Did you make me Mexican hot chocolate? He asks, cocking a brow at how excited Kirishima looks. Yes, I figured you enjoy that more than the normal stuff. We drink it all the time as kids after playing outside in the snow. It warmed us up quickly. Bakugo hides his smile behind his mug as he goes in for another drink. I thought you said you weren't good at making anything. Kirishima laughs, soft as it rumbles in his chest. This was the one thing my mom taught me that really stuck. Bakugo freezes. He's suddenly hit with a moment of deja vu with how familiar all of this is. His stomach rolls with it, sinking. His first instinct is to run, snap his tongue with something wicked on it and then disappear, just as he did last time but he stills his body before it gets its way. He doesn't need to run. He doesn't want to. As terrifying as the thought is, Bakugo wants to lean into the pool of Kirishima just to see how it'll feel and lies about how far it'll fall. He takes a breath, inhales the sweet smell of chocolate with the underlying kick of cayenne that tickles his nose, and tumbles down head first. When did she die? Bakugo can see the way Kirishima's entire body tenses with that question, his eyes wide as he stares at him, 
searching him, hoping he finds nothing but honest curiosity behind the words. He's trying, really he is, and Bakugo wants Kirishima to know that he wants to hear him, and this time he won't disappear so easily. After a few moments, finally, Kirishima speaks. It'll be seven years coming up. I was still in high school and she'd been sick for a while. We all knew that. Kirishima pauses, taking a second to put his mug down and Bakugo really wasn't prepared for how his voice would sound. How small in a manner he's never heard from Kirishima since he pulled him from his car. She had cancer and for a while it seemed to be under control. She was tired a lot. A little slower to move around, but other than that, nothing really different. She still smiled and cooked and did everything she could for everyone else, even when people told her not to. She just hated sitting still and hated people looking at her like she couldn't do anything anymore. His voice breaks. He takes a breath, fingers curling into the legs of his pants and his shoulders tremble. And then it just spread. It happened so fast. One day she was fine, and next she wasn't. We barely had time to prepare before she died. Me and Isuke never wanted to admit we might actually lose her, and then we did, and... The tears are quiet. They seem to take Hiroshima by surprise when they actually start to fall, touching his face lightly when the first drops down against his clenched hand. Bakugo shifts. Moving because even if he knows he's terrible with people, with emotions, he's not a monster. He leans against Kirishima, draping the blanket he has over them both. It's not a hug, not really, just a weight against him to make sure Kirishima knows he's still there with him. Having a solid presence has always helped him in the past, anything that keeps you grounded. He lets his head fall against Kirishima's shoulder, finding one of his hands under the blanket with his own and squeezes it tight. What was her name? Kirishima's hand relaxes, turning over so their fingers touch, curling together. Akiko. Sorry you had to lose her like that. Yeah. Kirishima sniffs, trying to dry his eyes as best he can. Me too. And this house was hers. That's why you're still here. Kirishima looks up prompting Bakugo to do the same, looking across tall wood pillars in the brick fireplace, to the wooden floors and warm carpets, the couches that had frayed edges at the arms and cushions pressed down with time, all the blankets and pillows making sure anyone who entered was warm and welcomed no matter what the season. Of course he stayed for all this, for her, for every single ghost left living in the walls. Kirishima's eyes are filled with tears, but he smiles. It was my dad's engagement gift to her. He said he'd give her a home. It was a symbol of his love if only she loved him back. That's the story we were told at least. And then he made it bigger when we came around. I think mom always wanted more kids, but she only had us two. Still, she had the house she always wanted, just like my dad promised. I'm sure she loved it. Bakugo hums, quiet but making sure Kirishima knows he's been listening, mulling it all over. It sounds nice. They sound nice. Having this happy little family out in the woods, perfect until it's not. It's storybook and sad all at once. A tragedy like that isn't something Kirishima and his family deserve. But it's not as though all that matters with how nice and kind and loving someone is. It just makes it all worse when it happens. He tries not to dwell too much on who is truly deserving of grief. Hey, he says after a long, long pause between them. It's a comfortable, uncomfortable silence. The subject matter has fallen off into a heavy tension in the air, but neither have pulled away from the other. Their hands still tangled, Kirishima's thumb running over his palm gently, following the lines he can't see. The fire crackles, still alive and burning. Riot is snoring softly. The room is warm and Bakugo can feel his eyes drooping downward. I could get used to this. He thinks and wants so badly to believe that to be true. I'm gonna fall asleep. Oh. Kirishima replies. 
Do you want me to? No. Bakugo, make sure he tightens his grip. I'm going to sleep here, and you're going to stay with me. Got it. You want me to? Stop asking so many questions and close your eyes. Bakugo feels the laughter more than he hears it. It feels good. If he focuses long enough, he can hear Kirishima's heartbeat right alongside it. He lets his eyes fall shut, giving in to the sleep that's been slowly seeping into his bones, and goes under. When he wakes, it's violent. When he wakes, he jerks with a swing of his fist and makes contact with a solid body that freaks him out even more. It's dark. He stumbles back, and in doing so, with his legs tangled up, Bakugo falls from the couch with a crash of body and ceramic, but doesn't hear too much of either as there's a ringing in his ears and the distance muffled call of his name. A dog barks. Bakugo can't understand why until there are hands gripping both of his arms too tightly and he pulls away in panic. Fist clenched again, shaking, but when he looks, there's only red hair and worried eyes filled with so much concern it makes Bakugo feel sick. Bakugo. He hears, finally, the words matching up to the movement of the mouth, not sounding echoed or distant. Bakugo, come on. It was a nightmare. Are you with me? He blinks. The hands holding him are work-worn, but gentle. They aren't bruising or digging in or trying to grab at every part of him. They're caring, kind. He hates it as he feels the lingering, unwanted touch still crawl across his skin. Kirishima. He looks like he might just cry again. Fucking hell, bro. You scared the shit out of me. Started freaking out while you were sleeping. Fuck. Fuck. He's quick to get his hands under him, realizing that he's among pieces of shattered mug around him. He's careful to avoid cutting himself, even as he still shakes. God damn it. I shouldn't have slept like that in the damn mug. Fuck, I even punched you. His voice is tight. He hates that it is. He hates that his brain is still screaming. Hey, hey. Kirishima is quick to get down on his level, kneeling right next to him, not caring about the broken shards mixing with the carpet. All he does is cut Bakugo's face, holding his head in his hands, forcing him to make eye contact and focus. Just breathe, all right? I can clean this up, but are you okay? His heart is racing. His mind is still trying to distinguish the shadows of the living room that aren't real and the lingering darkness of his nightmare. He feels like he might start panicking at any second, but the only thing keeping him from spiraling is the heat of Kirishima's hands and the grip he holds him in. His eyes are bright and alive right in front of him, so different from anything he's ever seen in a dream. So they must be real. He must be awake. Bakugo's hands shake as they touch Kirishima's own, just in case just to be sure. He feels a sudden swell of want inside his chest. Kirishima is right there. It's manic, but he doesn't care right now. Every feeling from the past few days, from the past few hours, floods inside every part of him so quickly he feels dizzy with it. He doesn't care. Kirishima is the most beautiful thing he's ever seen in this exact moment, and he doesn't care. Kiss me. Kirishima falters. What? what Kiss me, you stupid, shitty-haired idiot. Uh, I'm not sure. Fuck it. He leans in before he can rethink it, knowing it's probably a bad idea, knowing Kirishima will likely think he's just freaking out even more because of his nightmare, and sure, that's partly right. His therapist would be angry. But fuck everything right now because he needs this. Regardless of the consequences that may follow, He needs and he wants and he's tired of overthinking it. Tired of holding back. He wants to taste his lips and know how Kirishima will feel against him. So like everything else in his life, he takes exactly what he wants. And kisses him.
Hiroshima doesn't pull back. He doesn't shove Bakugo away. Instead, he keeps his hold, smooths it down so his hands are at Bakugo's waist and leans into him. He doesn't know fully what's happening, Bakugo is sure. But at the very least, he seems to want this just as much as Bakugo does and that's enough. He pulls away for just a moment, takes in a sharp breath before diving back down towards his mouth, correcting the awkward angle of their first kiss to make the next near perfect in its desperation. Kirishima is hot. Physically, bodily, actually hot. The skin under Bakugo's hands feels as though it might scorch from the heat radiating off of the other man. With the fire down to embers and still without a shirt, Bakugo knows the overwhelming heat is all Kirishima. Fire is how he makes a living. This is one he's not afraid if it consumes him. They kiss until they're breathless. Kiss until all Bakugo can taste is Kirishima on his tongue until his lungs burn from not coming up, until Kirishima has to pry himself away and gets a bite at his lip because of it. Still, the distance isn't so bad. Their panting intermingles between them, air humid and warm as they don't move far. Looking into Kirishima's eyes, Bakugo finds that they are dark with desire and need, glimmering in the last orange glows of the fireplace. Do you realize how long I've wanted to do that? Kirishima asks in between his soft puffs of air. Bakugo can't help but chuckle. Before or after you've invited me to stay. Is it bad if I say before? Bakugo grins. He grabs him by the shoulders, fingernails digging into his skin to feel the solid muscle underneath. Expanding his reach down Kirishima's back, he can feel the shift of his shoulder blades under his grip. Understands the power they hold and wants to know it against his own body. I'll forgive you as long as you show me exactly what you wanted to do to me. Kirishima goes red almost immediately, eyes wide as he looks embarrassed, now trying to look anywhere but Bakugo. That bad. Bakugo's grinning, pulling Kirishima back to look at him. Think I might like that. We shouldn't. His hands tangle in Kirishima's hair, pulling until he hisses. Head jerking, trying to relieve the pain, but Bakugo just holds on tighter. If you think I'm gonna let you get away with just a kiss, you actually are an idiot. He growls out, glaring, and maybe Kirishima might like that as he lets out a deep, throaty noise that sounds like a choked-off moan. Bakugo tugs at his hair and hears it again, thinks he might like to hear it a lot more. Now, take me to bed. What he's not expecting next is for Kirishima to grab him by the thighs and hoist him into his lap. Whatever embarrassment he feels is easily pushed away as he forces Bakugo's legs around his waist, arms holding nearly all of his weight even so as he takes him by surprise and stands. Oh fuck me. Bakugo groans, loving how easily Kirishima lifts him, moves him, gets him exactly how he wants and doesn't apologize after. Bakugo can only hold on for the ride locking his legs around his back as soon as his brain catches up to the situation, arms doing much the same around his neck as he dives back in to taste Kirishima once more. Their arms are quickly tangled around each other, legs coiling as they somehow manage to get the blankets up under them to settle in bed. You know, we should probably shower. If you think I'm doing anything else besides sleeping after that pounding you gave me, you're an idiot shitty air. Ichiro. What? Kirishima laughs, nuzzling his nose into the top of Bakugo's hair to inhale sharp, breathing him in. He pulls them closer, making sure their body heat intermingles and their skin touches. I think after that, you're welcome to call me Ichiro. Bakugo finds Kirishima's eyes in the dark, looking at them. Somehow they're still bright, still honest, welcoming and warm. Bakugo bites at his tongue, remembering how his brain keeps screaming at him, don't. He settles in Kirishima's hold, getting comfortable with his head propped up against his shoulder, tucking himself into his side. Bakugo makes sure the blankets and sheets are pulled up tight around them, even if he doesn't need to with Kirishima so hot right next to him. His cum tacky as it dries on his skin. 
go to sleep, Ijiro. Kirishima smiles, kissing him one more time before listening. It takes some time, but he does. They do. Or rather, Bakugo should. He's tired, exhausted, fucked out and body heavy, wanting to sleep, and yet he's awake. He's staring at Kirishima, looking at him in the darkness, trying to make sure every detail is etched into his memory. The sharp cut of his jaw, the little scar above his eye that up until now Bakugo had never noticed before. He wants to touch him some more, less like they have and more like he might if this was anything important. He breathes, relaxing as he lets his hand settle over Kirishima's chest. He can feel him breathe, can feel his heart. It's a terrible thing to want. Call me Kotsky. Bakugo whispers into the quiet space. No one else does. And wishes Kirishima was awake to hear it. For once, the sun wakes him up. It shines bright as it comes in through the window, stirring him. Bakugo groans as soon as the light hits his eyes. He rolls over, irritated as he pulls the covers up tighter around his body and buries his head under the pillows, trying desperately to not admit his body is likely awake now. Also, he's cold. The blankets only do so much, and with a stretch of his arms, reaching, he comes to the realization that the other side of the bed is empty. Feeling more aggravated, Bakugo looks up from under the pillow to confirm that the bed that was once occupied by two is now down to one. It's a little jarring. Kirishima didn't seem like the type to not want to wake up together, but Bakugo tries not to blame the other man or let it get to him too much. Still, he grumbles. He sits up in the bed, glaring as he stares around the room and tries not to focus too hard on the cold side of the bed. It looks different than daylight, like an actual room and not just a collection of vague, shadowy furniture around the borders of his vision and between kisses. He takes in the cream-colored walls and the burnt red curtains open at the windows. The bed is big, the furniture a dark-looking oak, all thick and worn. Bakugo wouldn't be surprised if they were all hand-carved. It seems like it would match with everything else. There's a basket of blankets in the corner, filled with wool and quilts and throw pillows. It all looks cozy and warm. Looking across at the dresser, there's picture frames all scattered along the top. There's a lot of them, all in different sizes and different styles of frame. Bakugo moves without realizing it, swinging his legs over the bed. He admittedly winces. Pain shooting up his back as the full weight of the night before settles across his body. His ass hurts, his lower back throbbing. Looking down, he can clearly see his hips are a little darker with crescent moon cuts into his skin. His throat is sore and he needs water on top of all the other injuries he's suffered in the past few days. Maybe, just maybe, they went a little too rough last night. Not that he cares, as that was some of the best sex he can remember having in ages but his body sure does want him to maybe rest just a little bit. Before he can even stand up, however, one of the unknown doors connected to the bedroom opens up and out curls a humid cloud of steam in a barely towel-wrapped Kirishima. It takes him a second to notice Baka goes up as he's drying his hair with a towel, shaking out the strands like a dog when he pulls it away. Oh. He stops as soon as he notices Baka goes staring back at him. A few stray drops of water now clinging to the other's skin from his shake. You're up. Of course, Kirishima is loud in the morning. His smile is bright, charming. There's a lot of bruising around his chest that's shaped like Bakugo's mouth. He's still damp and nearly naked. Bakugo really, really wants to kiss him. Instead, he huffs because he's cold and irritated and woke up alone. Where were you? Kirishima's smile falters, the corners of his mouth twitching downward at the harsh tone being taken with him. Bakugo only feels slightly guilty about it. Well, I woke up early to take Riot out, and then you were sleeping so well I didn't want to disturb you because you've obviously not been sleeping well. I took a shower real quick, hoping you'd stay asleep a little longer. 
Bakugo feels more guilty. Because of course Kirishima was only considering his dog and then him and his actions. He was probably going to make Bakugo coffee or some shit before he woke up too. Maybe even crawl back into bed with him so he wouldn't wake up alone and hear Bakugo was running his plans and being a little bitch about it. His shoulders lose that sharp tension in them, slumping back against the headboard. You could have just woken me up. He pouts. I'm sorry. Kirishima apologizes like he's actually done something wrong. He hasn't at all. He's been a good pet owner and been a good host. Fuck buddy. One night stand. He's not sure which phrasing works in this sort of situation. Next time, I'll make sure you know I'm getting up. He's moved over to the bed, leaning in until he's bracketing Bakugo at an angle. Good morning. Kirishima pauses close to his face, making sure Bakugo actually gives him permission, which he does with another huff and moving to grab the redhead's shoulders. Still damp. His hair is in his eyes, wet and heavy. Bakugo really does have to resist the urge to brush it aside. Kiss me and I might forgive you. He already has, but that doesn't matter. Kirishima smiles before their lips meet, their hands on each other in a familiar manner as the night before, except opposite in force. There's a part of Bakugo that wants to go back to last night, that level of desperation, the part that has his chest pinging as a warning, but he resists. He smooths his hands out to cup the back of Kirishima's neck, sliding through the strands of wet hair instead of gripping, pulling, forcing Kirishima's head where he wants it, trying to remind himself how to touch without wanting to hurt. Kirishima cups his jaw, thumb rubbing across the soft skin of his cheek as they kiss. There's no tongue, no teeth, just a soft hello of lips that part long after the greeting is finished, their noses brush. Am I forgiven? You're definitely getting there. They kiss again just because they can, just because they're both there and both leaning into the other for more. In the process, Bakugo wraps his arms tighter around Kirishima's neck, trying to then drag him back down on the bed. He figures there can be even more of an apology they'll both enjoy down there, but instead of willingly falling into him, Kirishima breaks their kiss and pulls Bakugo's arms from around him. Can't. Too much to do today. Besides, you should probably shower too, and I need to change the sheets. That's true, sure. Every time Bakugo moves, he can feel the dried flakiness of cum on his skin. It's slightly uncomfortable and unsanitary, and maybe he smells too. Maybe he needs to brush his teeth if they want to kiss more, but he doesn't care about that. He wants Kirishima on top of him, warm and heavy. We can shower together afterwards. Bakugo tries to argue, but Kirishima gives him a look as he moves off of the bed before Bakugo can persuade him. It's Christmas Eve, you know. Bakugo pauses. It is. Honestly, he doesn't know. He's never paid too much attention to the days leading up to it besides his typical travel. He's only aware of dates by when people tell him, and even then, all he can wonder is where the time went and how long until it's all over. Now, at least he has more of a reason besides his poor attitude to have forgotten. The days get a little jumbled together when you pass out in your car for a bit and haven't gotten much of a decent night's sleep since then. Kirishima takes it as him joking and moves on, probably for the best. He watches from his position on the bed as Kirishima moves to the dresser, dropping his towel on the way. It's then that Bakugo realizes how awake he truly is, particularly below the waist. There's never been a point where he can say he's ever had a true preference for certain body parts. Besides good sex and a general attraction, he's never much cared about anything else in any form of past relationship he's had. But here, looking at Kirishima's back, he's starting to reconsider those thoughts. First, he notices the scratches. A small bloom of pride swells in his chest at the sight of them, knowing full well he put them there. Multiple lines of nail marks crisscrossing the backs of his shoulders and down the blades. Red welts leaving evidence of where he was that night. A claim laid for anyone else that might see Kirishima like that in the few days to come before they fade away. Mentally, he wants to make sure they stay for a while longer. 
The muscles rip under tan skin, dewy in the morning sun as he searches through a drawer. Back perfectly sculpted, strong, tapering down into a waist that Bakugo wants to feel again, curving into an ass that he's blessed to see in the sunlight. He's almost glad they fucked in the dark, knowing full well if he was able to see all of Kirishima clearly in his glory, he would have never managed to let go. The light shines in on him picking up the curve and the sharp angles of his body. The cut of his hip looking deadly in the early morning dawn cast in an orange glow. Bakugo's mouth waters. If he was a religious man, this sight would be holy. Staring long and hard without interruption, Bakugo takes them all in as he pulls a pair of boxers from his drawer and shifts a leg up to slide into them. He can't help where his mind goes. Gnawing at the skin of his lip, he has an idea. A few more minutes, and finally, they get up fully promising to start the day. Together, they shower, Kirishima for the second time that morning. The tile is freezing under Bakugo's feet in the large expanse of a bathroom. There's a large, freestanding soaking tub that looks so inviting if the electricity were on and hot water available. If he could spend the day going from a warm bed to a warm bath with Kirishima pressed up against him for both, he'd be happy with that. A lazy day of sleeping, fucking, getting up to only snack and lay together in the bath. It sounds perfect, but that's not the reality. They bathe quickly, mostly because the water is just as cold as the tile and Bakugo gets crankier the longer he has to be under it. It's nice, however, when Kirishima's hands run up his back, soaked up with a washcloth to gently rub away the cum and sweat from his skin. The touches linger in places, sliding across his hips and up his stomach. He tickles his ribs and massages at the base of his neck until Baka goes groaning with the push of fingers, turning to pull Kirishima into a wet kiss that progresses until Baka goes against the wall. With a sharp chill of more too cold tile, they part. I really do need to go. Kirishima whispers against his lips, pulling them both back under the spray to wash away the suds. I know. He says and wants that to be different. Let's dry off. This time, when Kirishima dresses, Bakugo doesn't interrupt him. He watches, still, as his body gets covered up, but he does nothing else to pull him back to bed and beg him to stay a little bit longer. He can't be greedy. He has no right to be. He finds his own forgotten pajamas thrown onto the floor and pulls them back on once he's dried off, happy for the warmth of clothing. He curls back into bed under the covers not caring right now that maybe he should go back to his own spare room without Kirishima's company. But the bed is big and comfortable and smells just like the man. So for now, Bakugo plays ignorant and pretends he doesn't remember being a guest. I'm gonna leave you my phone in case you need it. Bakugo perks up, head peeking out from the nest of bedding he's made right as Kirishima sets his phone down on the nightstand closest to him. I'll be with Tetsu for most of the day so if you need me, you can call him. I have everyone else's numbers, of course, just in case you need Mina or Hanta for something. He's thoughtful. Always fucking thoughtful. I'll probably be back later tonight after dark. I'll bring us some dinner, too, so you don't have to cook. Kirishima leans down and moves enough of the blankets out of the way so he can plant a kiss on Bakugo's cheek, his fingers lingering against his skin. Get some more sleep. Bakugo huffs, snuggling deeper into the blankets instead of leaning into the warmth of Kirishima's palm like he wants. His voice is a little muffled as he replies. Don't worry so much about me, stupid. Just go do whatever it is you need to do. I can take care of myself. Okay. He can hear the note of amusement in his voice, not offended at all by his gruffness or insults. I'll be home later. Bakugo says nothing else as he hears Kirishima leave, the weight of his feet against the floorboards announcing his path and then the bark of riot as he follows him through the house and out the door. He doesn't dwell on trying to hear his truck start up outside or already wanting him back to keep him warm. Instead, Bakugo squeezes his eyes shut tight and does his best to go back to sleep. It doesn't really work. He tries for a solid hour, switching from one side to the other to get comfortable 
but it doesn't work. It's too cold. He's hungry, and every time he rolls over to shove his face into Kirishima's pillow, he feels like the bed is too big for just him alone. Bakugo watches the sharp orange glow of the morning turn into a yellow with the sun rising up into the sky, shadows cast on the floor moving slowly with the shift. It's infuriating to say the least. He's tired, body and mind, and still can't settle down enough to let sleep take him. After what feels like hours of staring at the ceiling, he finally groans and gives up. It's no use and his stomach keeps getting louder, so there's no more fighting it. Still, getting up is a slow process, with the blankets still pulled across his shoulders to keep warm on the long trek from the bedroom to the kitchen. They're dirty. He should change the bedding anyway. Bakugo rolls from the bed, nearly tripping himself with the cocoon he's made. No one's around to see him, however, so he cares very little of his small flailing until he can get his feet free from the restraints and shuffle across the room. Before he makes it to the door, however, the dresser and the contents on top catch his eye again. He pauses at the display, looking down the line at all the pictures. Now that he's closer, he can fully make out what each and every frame holds. Instantly, his stomach twists. The rest of the house, beyond the comforts of a home, didn't seem to have too much of a personal touch. Memories were evident in the worn edges, but nothing beyond that. Bakugo had noticed... But here it seemed, on the top of his dresser that he sees each day, this is where Kirishima kept his heart. The pictures were of his family. A man that had Kirishima's nose, a sharp jaw, staring longingly at his new bride who looked just as happily back at him. The photo looked aged, slightly yellowed from time, and wrinkled a little in one corner as if it was pulled out of the frame many times before. Another had the same couple now with a baby between them. Dark hair with his eyes crinkled closed, a wide smile on his face with chubby cheeks and even chubbier hands curled into fists. The one right next to it looked much the same, except the baby was now a just as happy looking toddler staring down at a sleeping infant. Moving along, the family grows. The boys grow into themselves. Kirishima looks like a doting older brother, always smiling, always seems to tug his little brother along. They're dressed for school, dressed for swimming dressed for the harsh winter. Their mother kneels beside them and many of them, arms wrapped around them as though she doesn't ever want to let them go. Her smile looks easy, looks warm. Her eyes are Kirishima's, big and sparkling in the sun. She has an apron on in any picture taken within their house, dirtied with flour or splashed recipes in small little hands. The brothers grow from toddlers into children into young teenagers tall and gangly, but always looking happy and together. Their mother changes too. She gets thinner. Even in the pictures, Bakugo can see how her clothes start to look too big. Her hair thins out. Her eyes look heavier. But her smile is ever-present. Warm, quiet. But there, no matter how much she seems to grow strained over the years, she still looks so happy to be surrounded by her children and husband in every single shot. Bakugo pauses in front of one frame, the picture inside looking to be the most recent. Kirishima looks nearly like the adult he is now, his hair red and a smaller, floppier-looking version of Riot at his side on a leash. His brother is there looking much the same as Kirishima, though his hair is cut shorter and he still sports the natural color. His mother and father both stand between them, their mother looking far smaller than the beginning, eyes looking older. His father looks a little strained with a hand at his wife's shoulder, holding on as tight as he dares. It's winter time. They're all dressed up for the cold, standing in front of the very house Bakugo is standing inside of, with snow all around them. The day looks like it's growing old, the lighting dim in the picture, but behind them their house is bright enough to combat the setting sun. A rainbow wash of light speckled in every single window hanging from every gutter and every bush, shrub, and tree that Bakugo can see in the surrounding area is decorated in the same glow of colorful stars. He picks it up, inspecting it closer. The frame is a simple stained wood, something cheaper maybe, picked up from a store without too much thought. The picture looks to be the last one taken of all of them together. There aren't any further sitting out that look any newer than this, just a still frame of the last time the family was whole.
with Kirishima, a young man looking all the ready to go out into the world instead of preparing to lose his mother. It was a family album spread out for Bakugo to view. A personal journey of growth and then loss, and all he truly knew was the few bits of information Kirishima had told him in the name of his mother and brother. He didn't even know who his father was. He's trespassing. Only then does he realize fully that he's in Kirishima's bedroom, which, given just a second to ponder, means he's in Kirishima's parents' old bedroom. Alone. He wonders how much of it has changed since they slept here and how much it must ache knowing Kirishima was still there. Bakugo puts the picture down as if it had burned him, the frame wobbling in his haste. He doesn't look back at it as he leaves the room quickly, thankful that he did not hear a crash behind him as he goes. He doesn't realize he hasn't taken a breath until he's made it across the house to the kitchen, suddenly bracing himself against the countertop as he inhales sharp and for just a moment starts to hyperventilate. He recognizes the pace immediately and forces himself to slow down to breathe deeply and let it out slow, calming his nerves, trying to not think about the happy family in the pictures or the current one that sits broken in its place. It's not his problem. It's not his burden to carry. Bakugo clutches the blanket in his fist tightly, pulling it ever closer. He takes another breath, calms, and moves on to make himself some coffee. It doesn't sit well. None of it sits well. He keeps thinking about Kirishima, he hates it. He's had two and a half cups of coffee before it starts to eat at him again. A bad decision that he can admit to himself, but right now he can't bring himself to care. He's only able to stomach a few bites of rice and egg that he's quickly thrown together before his stomach starts to twist with thoughts of being in this house. Of Kirishima alone without his family. Of the ghosts that haunt him and guilt starts to eat away at every corner of his body. Kirishima shouldn't be here taking care of him or anyone else. He should be with his dad, his brother. They should be together like they were in the pictures. He's overthinking it, he knows, not wanting to wedge himself into the troubles of this family when he doesn't even want to deal with his own. Still, the guilt is there. It weighs heavy. Bakugo, a stranger off the streets, stealing time away from him spending it with his friends. All he's doing is eating his food, being an asshole, fucking him, running everything. He shouldn't be here. He needs to leave. He needs to make up for being as shitty as he is. It's spiraling. He doesn't know how it's gotten so bad, but figures all the strain he's put on his body and head haven't helped at all. The silent house is too quiet now, and every hallway feels like a maze as he wanders down them, trying to figure out what the hell he's doing. In solitude, he makes a fire. It helps. The warmth drawing out the tension from his body to soothe it away. He remembers his breathing. He counts backwards from 100 and counts off all the furniture in the room until he feels solid again. As soon as he can safely say he's calmed down, he's angry with himself for getting so worked up about nothing. Kirishima is kind. That's the reason he took him in. That's why he brought Bakugo along with his friends to be included, trying to make his holiday still feel special even if Bakugo doesn't see the appeal at all. He's done everything in his power to be accommodating and has only ever smiled at Bakugo's clipped words and snark. He deserves more than this. The guilt is still there, deep in his stomach, and Bakugo figures he'll just have to shove it down like he does with all the rest of it. The earlier panic has now made him tired. He's still hungry, but he doesn't want to eat. Maybe he'll try to sleep again. Hope that the nightmares aren't so terrible in the daylight, which is the exact same lie he'd always tell himself in college. Sighing heavily, Bakugo rises up from his position on the couch, having watched the fire until his eyes are dry, and goes back towards Kirishima's bedroom. Maybe he'll be lucky. On his way over, the picture catches his eye again. A happy family with a dying woman in the center of it, everyone playing ignorant to her sickness just long enough to smile. Everything about the image twinkles with the perfectly white snow and the assortment of lights making the four of them glow. He wonders if he'd ever be able to see Kirishima look that happy. And then, a thought. The exhaustion is ripped from his limbs almost immediately, blanket dropping to the floor from his shoulders in his haste. Bakugo grabs for the phone on the nightstand, forgotten up until now, and swipes it open. 
It's easy to find the phone numbers of everyone Kirishima cares about listed in favorites. Quickly, he picks the one he knows will want to listen to him the most and dials. On the second ring, it's picked up. He's not used to this. Still, he doesn't hesitate. Oh, she do. I need your help with something. Bakugo waits. Ashido is overly enthusiastic about his call. She wanted to chat, rambling almost immediately. She knew that Kirishima had given Bakugo his phone for the day, which meant Kirishima had spoken to her at least briefly this morning. Not a surprise, but Bakugo still wondered how much Kirishima had told. He didn't seem like the type of guy to brag about his sex life, but Ashido seemed like the type of girl to pry. She tried. It was hinted vagueness. Bakugo could hear her winking at every other word of, So, are you still in bed? Or, Kirishima sure did leave late this morning, huh? When he spoke, she quipped back with, Your voice sounds so hoarse this morning, Bakugo. Are you feeling well? He gave her nothing to go off of. Simply let her talk and have his responses be in open silence before she started again. It went on like this for a few minutes long enough that Bakugo figured he was over being polite and completely in the right to snap. Do you want to help me or not? She sputtered. D Duh, of course. What exactly did you need my help with again? He pinched the bridge of his nose, not wanting to explain this over the phone. He needed them here, or else he might chicken out and decide it's just as stupid as it sounds. Just get Saro and the blonde idiot in your ass over to Kirishima's house, got it? Be ready to work. He hung up, and now he waits. It takes them over an hour to get to Kirishima's. He figures it's because none of them have a snowplow for a car, and it takes a little bit to maneuver out of the cabin. It's not snowing right now, but another inch or so seems to have fallen overnight. He's not sure how bad the roads were before Kirishima left. By the time Sero's car pulls up and the three of them tumble out, Kaminari still looking half asleep. Bakugo is standing in the doorway, glaring. He's cold, and he's about to get even colder. So we drove all the way out here. Saro sighs, closing the car door. Are you actually going to tell us what we're doing? Yeah. Bakugo huffs out, humid breath spiraling out in front of his face. Where does Kirishima keep his Christmas lights? Maybe he should have thought about this before. He can't imagine Kirishima having gotten rid of them after his mother's death, with all of the blankets still sitting around to use, all the furniture looking ages old, even the spice cabinet not seeming to have been updated since her death. Bakugo doubted it. He would, however, give them to the people to use for the holidays. He'd decorate the town with everything he had out of the goodness of his heart if no one else had money enough to provide. Damn it. He really hoped he hadn't. Just this once, he doesn't want Kirishima to have thought of others. Christmas lights. Kaminari jumps through the snow, making a new path through the untouched boundaries. It crunched heavy under his boots. Why? He hasn't had those up since, well... He gestures with his hands. You know. Yeah, I figured as much. Bakugo leads them inside. He doubts he's supposed to know. He wonders again how much has been spoken to them, about what they've talked about. Or is Kirishima typically an open book with his family history? Does he speak about it to try and seek comfort or to make it more usual? He's not sure. There's still so much he doesn't know about him, about the other people currently in his house. Bakugo wonders when it was he apparently started to care so much. Is this his guilt complex showing through again or a genuine want to know? To get to know? They follow him quietly until they reach the living room where the fire is burning small behind the gate. The blinds and curtains all drawn at the living room windows to let some sunlight in trying to brighten up the dark space. That's an entirely different issue he needs to tackle too if this is going to work. Wait. Sarah pauses, looking around. There's nothing to see. Do you want us to hang Kirishima's Christmas lights for him? Bakugo doesn't meet his eye. Did he ask you to do this? No. 
Ashido looks between them both before letting out a high-pitched squeal, a terrible sound that makes Bakugo wince. Look. He tries to cut her off before she gets too excited. I just saw some of his pictures. Mistakes. His family photos? Why were you in his room? Yeah, Bakugo. Why were you in his room? Fucking hell, shut up. He finally snaps. He doesn't want to hear this from them. They don't know him well enough to throw judgment on his attempts at good deeds. All of you, just shut up. He does so much stupid bullshit for this town. Why the hell are you arguing with me on this? He used to have this fairy tale look at Christmas house and now it's dark and dim. Is that such a fucking problem that I feel like trying to give him that again? No one says anything. Besides, it won't even fucking work if we can't get the power back on. This time, Ashido and Saro turn towards Kaminari. He blinks stupidly before groaning heavy, running a hand through his hair with a sigh. Damn it. You're all lucky I like Kirishima so much. He grumbles as he snatches up one of the flashlights sitting at the coffee table, clicking it on before moving towards a door attached to the living room, opening it to cast light into what Bakugo figures is the garage. Don't worry about him. Ashido grins, swinging an arm over Bakugo's shoulder. His parents are the electricians in town, and he grew up with them figuring he'd follow in the family business. It's still a touchy subject that he left for a university to study fashion. He knows a lot about wires, though, so if anyone will figure it out, it'll be him. Yeah. Kaminari's voice calls back from the darkness. As long as the fucking power line didn't go down, then we're shit out of luck. You three get the lights out of storage while I figure this out. Storage, as it turns out, is mostly the garage and another closet attached to the laundry room. They find a few more flashlights to help and open up the garage door to give Kaminari enough light to work with without struggling through the breaker box, grumbling to himself as he goes. It's the most annoyed Bakugo has ever seen him. It's almost a funny sight if he knew it wasn't rooted in family issues of parent expectations and their son's own interests and desires. They let him be as he works, getting down to some heavy lifting themselves. Finding the boxes is easy. Everything is labeled and stacked in organized piles, a layer of dust collecting on the exposed edges. Lights, white, rainbow, red, green, ornaments, glass, handmade, indoor statues, garland, Santa's, deer, everything. They move them out into the open garage space to get a better look, and inside, Bakugo is surprised to find the organization extends here, too. Each collection of lights is perfectly coiled with ties keeping them together. Some strands still sat in their original boxes, painstakingly packed back exactly how they came with tape keeping them shut. Bakugo opens one of the boxes labeled as ornaments and pauses when he finds inside all of these origami designs placed in little squared-off sections divided by cardboard, each having their own little cubby to keep them safe. There are cranes, Christmas trees, stars, and various geometric designs. All of them have little strings and ribbons at the top to hang, all made from beautiful, colorful paper designs. Some look better than others. The folds precise and crisp and certain. Some look old, the colors a little faded, with folds that are bent to the corners or not as pressed. Little hands handling the paper, uncertain and wanting instruction and help. A family gathered around for a yearly tradition of making them. Years of handmade ornaments sitting here in a dark garage having not seen the light of day in who knows how long. His mom taught us, Ashido says over his shoulder making Bakugo jump, quickly turning to find her peering down at the handmade decorations. She has a sullen look on her face, but her eyes are warm. Every year, she'd gather us all up and sit us down at the table and give us paper to make ornaments. She was patient and made sure we all understood exactly how each fold needed to be. We'd all go home with arms full of origami that mostly got thrown out or destroyed after the season but she always kept at least one from each of us every single year. She kneels down, pulling one of the little stars from its section. It's made out of a marbled paper, yellow and pink swirling together. Bakugo watches her turn the little creation in her fingers fondly. I'm pretty sure Auntie Akiko is the reason we all still love Christmas so much. She made it feel so special. Bakugo is scared to pick up one of the trees, 
though his fingers hover over the folded edges. He might damage it. Is that what Kirishima does now? Try to make it special? She sighs. Something like that, I figure. Because he knows how much everyone loves the holiday. But also I think he's trying to keep some part of her alive. Going overboard with the stuff is his way of not letting her die twice. He can't fully understand Kirishima's grief. He's never lost anyone like that. Never had to watch without being able to do anything. With his job, he's seen people die. There's been points where he wasn't fast enough or strong enough. But at least he tried. He did something and can move on knowing that. But just having to watch, having to comfort your mother as her own body degrades, he can't imagine. He can't possibly know, but he can try. He can understand the fear above all else, and, in doing so, Bakugo squares his shoulders and knows what he's doing is good. Come on. He says, picking up the box with a solid grip. It's not heavy, all the paper weighing near nothing in his arms. But somehow he can feel how the history weighs him down. He'll take care of them, he promises. We have work to do. It takes hours. The work isn't just throwing lights around. It's clearing out enough snow that they can hook things up where they need to be, shoveling pathways and brushing down bushes and tree branches, shaking the snow away so they could string lights and make sure they can be seen. It's getting up onto a ladder to clean out gutters, nearly falling once or twice in the process. The snow has started falling again, too, the effort at some point seeming fruitless. But the fall is quiet and soft. It bunches up gently in piles that they easily brush away again. There's no harsh wind to burn their faces. The three of them carry box after box, inspecting what's inside each and taking it over as to where each string or decoration should go. Saro and Ashido argue over their memories, about which lights went where when they were children, how the white bordered the windows, but the bushes along the front were flashing red and green, or how the icicles of the surrounding trees were blue, not white or that the rainbow went up trunks in a spiral, not lining the driveway. They bickered back and forth long enough that Bakugo had to go inside and collect the family portrait that had given him the idea for reference. It wasn't a complete picture of the entire house and surrounding wood, but it was enough to direct them. In the arguments that happened after that, Bakugo would break, stating neither of them had an eye for color coordination and take it upon himself to say where lights needed to be hung so the entire image looked good from a distance balanced and bright. After one particular fight that Bakugo stepped between, Kaminari pokes his head out from the garage where he'd been working. What makes you king of the lights, huh? Bakugo rolls his eyes. I've got some experience. He cocks a brow. You decorate the firehouse a lot? No. Bakugo glares. If you must know, my parents are interior designers. It's annoying. Seriously? Fuck off, Sparky. Our house was always decorated for the season. When your furniture changes every three fucking months, you pick up on some shit. This gets Ashido and Saro to stop arguing, looking back at him. Ashido smiles. Your furniture seriously changed every three months? He rolls his eyes, trying to focus on keeping the coil of string lights in his hand organized. Yeah, they like to use our house for photo staging. It was annoying. Everyone thought they were stupid, but apparently my mom wanted to show people she used her own furniture. Plus, it proved their shit always looked good in any space, not just made-up rooms. She was stubborn. He grumbles. I'm sure there's a few old magazines that have pictures of me playing around our couch or some shit. They like to use me as a prop sometimes. You were in magazines? They were in magazines? He didn't talk much about his parents or his home life growing up mainly because he didn't care to share it or any other unnecessary details with people. He's lucky that him and his mother still talk to each other at some points from some of their past fights, but thankfully it was mostly loud. They were both hotheads. Nothing stuck for real. It wasn't that it was bad, that they didn't love him. It was just they worked a lot. He took it out on them sometimes. Kaminari hovers over Bakugo now, having become distracted from his electrical task. It just now dawns on him that maybe Kaminari might be more interested in this and his parents than he first realized. He looks about ready to jump at him and ask a million questions, eyes wide with a curious need and, being nice, Bakugo caves for just this moment. He'll give him something. 
Have you ever heard of Bakugo Masaru? Seiro and Ashido look at each other confused, but Kaminari knows better. He looks like he might have stopped breathing. You've got to be kidding me. Nope. Bakugo pops his pee, looking around trying to pick out the right bush he wants to decorate. He's my dad. Not that he designs clothes anymore, but I know he still has a name that some people recognize. Recognize? I've had to study books about him. There's courses on his designs and collections, and you're just now telling me he's your dad? You never asked. Bakugo replies, having hoped his dad had grown old enough to have this shit not be a big deal anymore. Apparently not. Kaminari is now trailing after him through the snow, still talking to his back. He was everywhere for years, and then just fell off the map after his fall lineup almost 30 years ago, and then suddenly popped up again, married, designing furniture. He's rambling, talking on and on about clothes, collections, colors. It was all stuff he had heard before in vague passing as he grew up. From random people he didn't know at house parties and his parents' assistants that thought he cared far more than he did. He sounds a lot like Deku, in fact, going on and on, to the point that Bakugo has the intense urge to shove snow in his face to shut him up. Being nice, for the moment, he resists. It's hard. He really wants to shove snow in his face. Look. He turns sharp on his heels once all the lights in his hands have been arranged and his ears talked off, snapping to get Kaminari's attention. If you shut up for two seconds about how bad you want to suck my dad's dick, I'll make a deal with you. Kaminari's mouth shuts with a click. Good. Now, if you can manage to get the lights on before Kirishima comes home, I'll give your portfolio to my dad to take a look at. He's silent for a few seconds, mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water trying to figure out why it can't breathe. Bakugo rolls his eyes. He hates when people get like this over his dad. He's the most boring person Bakugo knows, but apparently some people really haven't realized that yet. Deal? Uh, uh. Kaminari chokes on his own tongue, trying to find the words. Y yeah I can't turn that down. Good. Now go back and fix the damn lights. He scurries off so quickly, he slides on an iced over section of the walkway, nearly falling on his ass but manages to catch himself at the last second. He shoots two thumbs up to proclaim he's fine so quickly into the air he nearly loses his balance again. Bakugo is horrified to realize very, very suddenly that this entire plan falls solely on Kaminari's shoulders to work. Fuck. He hates relying on idiots for anything. As the day grows longer, they stop for lunch. Bakugo cooks quickly. Knowing the amount of daylight they have left is limited, and he's still not entirely sure when Kirishima is meant to arrive home. Sarah wants to help, but Bakugo smacks him out of the kitchen with a spoon, insisting that because he's a guest in Kirishima's home, that means the kitchen is his for the stay and no one is allowed in it while he works. Ashido kisses Sarah's wounds as he grumbles about flashbacks about his grandmother doing much the same to him when he was younger. It's a struggle to pull Kaminari out of the garage long enough to eat something. The promise of having Masaru Bakugo look at his portfolio gave him renewed vigor, but he still needed to stop long enough to keep his energy up. Also, Bakugo was almost positive he stopped blinking. The easier lights are all up now. Every bush and tree surrounding the front of the house has some sort of string light spiraling up it or placed upon the leaves and branches. The driveway is lined in a collection of animatronic LED deer family now sit on the front lawn waiting for their time to shine. They still have the roof to do, and Ashido has two more windows to finish up. Plus, Bakugo still wants to figure out how to use the origami decorations. They aren't safe outside in the snow, but there isn't enough time to get a tree inside the house and finish the outside lights before the sun goes down. Bakugo hums in thought as he works his way around the kitchen, zoning out the conversation of the other three sitting at the table all warming their hands on the mugs of tea Bakugo served. Hey. He cuts through their words as he lays down plates in front of them all. Ashido, do you think you and Sarah could handle the rest of the outside? She smiles, somehow knowing. Sure thing, boss. But I thought you just wanted to do the lights. I do. But I think I'll work on the living room, too. Don't worry about it, I just need some white lights. When he looks at them, all three are staring as if they have something to say. He's sure they do. More questions about why. Why go through all the effort? Why try for someone he's known for a few days? He's grateful. 
as he's not sure how he'd go about answering them, as he's still not entirely sure why he's doing all of this himself. They eat quickly before getting back to work. It's tedious. All of it is tedious. Hanging little hook after hook, looping around the lights, draping it to make it look nice. Coiling and curling and adjusting when one strand doesn't make it all the way around. The snow and ice make it difficult outside. Inside, Bakugo works as quickly as he can with the sun sinking lower and lower into the tree line. He's delicate, gentle, but rushed. Every so often, he steps back to look around the room, trying to remind himself to not immediately think it's cheesy. It's Christmas. It's not for him. This is the most effort he has ever put into Christmas before, and he has his doubts. He's not a good judge when he wants to curl his nose at every little tree and Santa he sees, but he fights through because it's for Kirishima, and this is what Kirishima loves. He tries to admire instead, think about the memories that every box holds when they open them up. He thinks about the picture of a happy family together for the last time in front of their glowing house that they've all taken so much care to create. He's biased, but he tries not to be. By the time everything is hung up, every little ribbon is string and looped, the tips of his fingers are getting blisters, the skin rubbed raw from the same action over and over again, but he steps back, looks up, and hopes that Kirishima will like it and hopes all his efforts aren't going to be put to waste if Kaminari can't. The lights flicker for a second, everything glowing with a twinkling dazzle of stars, and then just as they come, they disappear with a very sharp yelp from outside. Kaminari! Shit, are you okay? When Bakugo gets out to the garage, Kaminari is walking around shaking his hands while cursing softly. He looks a little jerky and twitchy, but otherwise alive. The darkness is blanketed enough that the flashlights have been turned back on, giving them a little bit of light in the looming twilight. Ashido and Saro seem to be done, the ladder getting put away, the boxes stacked back up. They just need one more thing. Yes, fuck that hurt. I haven't shocked myself like that in years. Fucking hell. His shoulders shudder, shaking out his arms trying to get them to stop tingling. But I got it. Hold on. Let me just... Wait, I think, are those headlights? Bakugo's blood runs cold. They are, and there's only one person it could possibly be. Shit. Kaminari, get the lights working. As the headlights get closer, Bakugo realizes that it's technically not Kirishima's truck, but Tetsu Tetsu's. The makeshift plow at the front pushes away the light snowfall from the day, but behind it is another set of lights, lower to the ground than Kirishima's truck. The lights still aren't on when they pull up to the driveway, but the rest of the boxes have been stacked back where they were, and some sort of organized pile out of the way. Bakugo is still standing in the dark, eliminated by the headlights, trying to process the black car that stops behind Tetsu's truck, taking note of the banged-up hood before both vehicles turn off and cast the entire area into practical darkness once more. Kirishima gets out of the car. Tetsu out of the truck with both dogs nearly falling over each other to get into the snow. Kirishima looks confused. Bakugo is almost positive his face looks much the same. Bakugo? What are you doing out here? What is everyone doing out here? Bakugo sputters, still staring. Hold up. Is that my car? He can't make out his expression very well in the dark, but he looks a little sheepish. I kind of wanted to surprise. Got it. The night vanishes around them. In its place is a glowing rainbow that illuminates the small section of forest they occupy. Bakugo doesn't turn to look, but instead keeps his eyes on Kirishima, taking in the red, white, blue, and green that mixes across his skin, the reflection sparkling in his wide-open eyes as he looks up at his childhood home dazzling in the winter white. He takes a step back in the snow, staggering, as if the power of the lights coming on is a physical force pushing him his whole body giving way to it. Bakugo thinks he's stopped breathing. Surprise so frozen onto his features, he looks almost like a tragedy that goes on long enough Bakugo gets uncomfortable. He thinks for a second, as he watches the still form of Kirishima start to crumble, that he's fucked up. It's a mistake. There's a reason he hasn't put up the lights in all these years his mother passed. Kirishima's eyes are wet. The flickering lights grow muddled within them as the water collects. Bakugo himself has stopped breathing. Bakugo, 
The silence breaks. Kirishima doesn't look at him. You, you did this. He almost doesn't want to answer. Your friends helped. I just figured, you know, the rest of your insane town is glowing, so why not make your house too, right? If it's too much, we can... His words are stolen from his tongue as strong hands grab the sides of his face, pulling him forward to the point he nearly falls, but a warm chest is there to catch him as he's kissed. Against him, Kirishima is shaking. His lips tremble as they press against his own, breathing out warm, shaky air as he chokes back a sob long enough to kiss him again. Bakugo can feel the wetness of tears touch his own cheeks and knows Kirishima has started to cry. He thinks they shouldn't do this in front of everyone else. He thinks he should stop, but he can't, because Kirishima is holding him so tightly, so warm, as he kisses him desperately in the cold night air with the glowing display illuminating their silhouettes. He can't stop him. He doesn't want to. He thinks he shouldn't get attached, but he might be as he loops his arms around Kirishima's shoulders and tilts his head for a better angle to kiss back, opening his mouth to a probing tongue and welcomes the coiling of his stomach with it. Just for this second, he forgets about what he should and shouldn't do, what every logical part of his brain screams at him, at the edging guilt wanting to eat him, at the doubts that whisper in his ears. He forgets. Right now, right here, all he cares about is Kirishima holding him, kissing him, and realizes, very suddenly, that he truly doesn't want to let him go. Kirishima is gentle. Where he put bruises last time, he creases Bakugo's skin as if an apology for leaving them, to the point Bakugo feels he might need to reassure him that their previous night was exactly what he had wanted what they both had asked for, and there was no reason to say sorry for that. Still, he moved slowly, and the lighting, he admires him. Work rough hands moving along his thighs, his hips, looking too large in Bakugo's own eyes. It's nice. Kirishima kisses him any time he asks, and more. He leaves him gasping, arching up under his every touch as if they had fallen in bed like this more times than they had any right to. He keeps trying to push his way up, to tell Kirishima he too was deserving of letting someone else take control, but Kirishima quiets him with a kiss, with a gentle thumb running over his cheek, lips, neck. He says the Bakugo's done more than enough to deserve an extra present. Really warm and sticky in Kirishima's arms as they shift until pillows are beneath their heads and the sheets mostly cover their bodies. And then Kirishima holds him, wraps his arms around Bakugo's waist to pull him in, presses right up against his back and nuzzles into his hair, peppering more kisses at his neck. Everything about it being warm, intimate. Their bodies touch from head to toe without a barrier in the way. He can feel as Kirishima's chest expands at his back, his heart beating, the way his fingertips just brush his stomach, uncaring of how messy they both might be. Good night. Bakugo feels as though he might suffocate if Kirishima holds him any longer. He doesn't move. Good night. As soon as he closes his eyes, he knows what will happen. Bakugo would be an idiot to think otherwise as though he were good enough to push aside his past trauma like it didn't make up his entire life. Every choice made in a fruitless attempt to do better under the mask of healing. He's a liar. When he wakes up, he's shaking, sitting up in bed already, panting hard as his limbs shake without his command to do so, sweat beating down his back, his legs stick to the sheets, breathing out of control. Hey... Bakugo feels a hand at his back and immediately twists, slapping it away and in the process almost tumbles from the bed as he jerks to escape. He catches himself, though, still trying to catch his breath, and he stares back at Kirishima, looking with wide eyes at him in the dark. They look worried, scared, lost. Bakugo doubts he looks any better, more wild, probably, like an animal trapped in a corner knowing the only thing he could possibly do now is strike out. It's his default. Claw his way out. Snap at Kirishima. Fight. Yell. 
run. He could, technically. I'm sorry. Kirishima raises his hands, showing that he's not going to attack him. Bakugo wants to scream that he should be the one trying to prove he's not dangerous. I didn't mean to startle you. You were just screaming and and thrashing, and I didn't know. It's fine. Bakugo manages to get out. His throat feels raw. It sounds too forced and too harsh, like it's trying to push him away, and right now he's not entirely sure if he actually is or not. It's, it's got nothing to do with you. That's not entirely true, but Bakugo doesn't want to hurt him any more than he already has, than he already will. Pushing him away now would be the easiest thing to do. He throws his legs over the edge of the bed, placing his feet flat on the ground and starts the process of calming his breath. He counts to ten, quiet under his breath, making sure he's able to hear his own voice, before looking up to call out the furniture in the room. The dresser, the nightstand, there's the door to the living room, the door to the bathroom, the windows with the curtains not perfectly pulled across so he knows it's still fully dark outside. He breathes, runs a hand through his hair to feel himself, takes notice of how the strands feel against his fingers, and when he gets too close to his forehead, the little sharp pain from the cut still healing over. He's awake, fully, knows this, knows it's just him and Kirishima in the room can still feel the hands on him, hear the shots of gunfire, the smoke. Bakugo breathes. He stops shaking. There's nothing else here in the room. No one else but the two of them, and it's okay. He's safe. It takes another three minutes for him to lay back down, for him to repeat that he's safe, that no one else is hurt, that no one will be hurt, before he's able to get back under the covers and remind himself not to lay flat on his back. Sorry, he says, because Kirishima is still looking at him as if he wants to reach out and help him, but doesn't know how. It just happens. Kirishima doesn't touch him, but he does pull the blankets back up so Bakugo's shoulders aren't exposed anymore. Under the blankets is still so warm from Kirishima's body heat, a nice little nest of comfort and darkness that Bakugo has to resist the urge to curl up into and never come out again. Don't worry. Kirishima says with a smile, the best he can do when he's so lost. I just wasn't expecting it to be so bad for you. Are you going to be okay to go back to sleep, or do you want to get up? He wants to help. Kirishima is a fixer, but he doesn't know how to fix this. Bakugo wants to tell him he's sorry again, that he wishes he was that easy to fix. We should sleep. It's still late. Kirishima silently agrees, dozing back off slowly, still facing Bakugo just in case. But this time, he doesn't touch Bakugo. He doesn't crowd him or hold him, because Bakugo hasn't said anything. He hasn't given him any information for what might help or hurt, and it should be fine. Because that's how it's always been, after all. Bakugo settles back into the bed without a fuss. He's good at it. He's practiced. In college, he had a roommate, and after the second time it happened, he knew he couldn't keep being so rattled. Rumors would spread. People would talk. Bakugo is the guy who has nightmares so bad he wakes up thrashing, shaking. A tough asshole like that can't handle a little bad dream. He refused. He had to do better. So he learned. He hid it. He forced his body into submission even when he wanted to scream. Forced it to stay calm. To lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, counting backwards from 100 over and over again as his heart raced in his chest. Adrenaline pumping. His body telling him he was in danger. He should run. He needed to protect himself. Fight or flight. And yet Bakugo would stay silent. Breathe. It was just a stupid fucking nightmare after all. And here he was now, doing the same thing with Kirishima. Covering himself up, saying it was fine turning his back so he didn't have to face him, didn't have to see any looks of concern or pity. He wanted Kirishima to go back to sleep. It was better for him. There was no reason to fret over Bakugo. He's a grown-ass man still scared of the fucking dark. He needs to be better than this. Yet. There's a part inside of him, a small part, that tugs him back and says no. Maybe he didn't have to. Maybe Kirishima deserved better than that. 
Maybe this time he could learn to be better. Bakugo never really cared about being palatable. He didn't care if people would think he was a complete and utter asshole, refused to be his friend. He didn't need to lower his voice or censor his words. He never wanted to. But it was so much easier having people be angry with you, be fearful, to have them think you were unapproachable and off-putting than pathetic. He could take their little comments about his attitude, but he couldn't take their pity. The way they looked at him like he was something to be coddled, to be protected, to say, what were you, and give him some pitiful little attempt at friendship or smile because they felt sorry. Bakugo could never handle that. He didn't want anyone knowing his weakness. Didn't want anyone to have an excuse for why he was the way he was. He felt whole as he was. He didn't feel like there needed to be a change. Still, he hid. But maybe with Kirishima, he wouldn't. Bakugo rolls back over. Even with these movements, he tries to be as silent as possible. To keep himself still, in place, a non-issue. He places a hand against Kirishima's chest, staring at where his fingers touch skin. Unable to move his gaze up to look him in the eyes. Not yet. He can't face him yet. Ijiro. Bakugo licks his lips. His throat is so dry, he needs water. His voice is barely audible. Can I tell you about my nightmares? He's never, not with someone like this. No one outside of his parents, his therapist. No one has ever known or heard. Some people know the story, but no one really knows the effects. Kirishima's hand covers his own, doesn't move it, just holds. It's so gentle, so intimate, Bakugo can feel his throat close up. If you want, comes the reply. Not pressing, no force, leaving it in the air for Bakugo to still choose. Yeah. He breathes, the single word shaky in the dark. I think I do. I've almost died twice now, when I was younger. He starts. He isn't looking at Kirishima. He thinks if he actually sees his face, his reactions, he'd chicken out and back off. Right now, his nerves might be frayed, but they're steady enough for him to keep talking. To dig up the past, he tries too hard to forget, so maybe Kirishima might understand some part of himself that no one else does. That even he has a hard time coping with at times, because Bakugo trusts him enough to lay himself bare and pray Kirishima will still be there after. Even if it's for a little while. Because this doesn't matter, right? Another two days, maybe. That's all they'll have left. He can give Kirishima this at the very least. In middle school, I nearly drowned. It's part of the nightmare sometimes, but not the majority. It's just that feeling of choking. It's so shitty, because you know what's happening. I didn't pass out. I just couldn't breathe, and every time I tried, it just made everything worse. Inhaling all this water and mud and... He sighs, pausing long enough to collect himself, tracing a line down Kirishima's shoulder, curving along the muscle feeling the warmth under his touch. It took a really long time for someone to help me. I thought for sure I was done for honestly. But then the stupid idiot Deku came and saved my ass. It's so stupid. Bystander effect, his therapist once explained. When everyone else sees something terrible happening but thinks someone else will be the one to jump in to help. When everyone thinks, even as they watch, that it's such a tragedy, but not enough for them to do anything, someone else will. Someone of authority. Someone more important. Deku was the only one to break it. Him jumping in broke the trance everyone seemed to be in, and before Bakugo actually passed out, lungs full of water, he came back up choking, coughing, dragging horrible, wheezing lungfuls of air even as he threw up. People say he was lucky. He was brave. Bakugo always hated it. I think I should have died then. Bakugo says in his next breath, under his hand, Kirishima tenses. You know all that bullshit about the universe having a plan or some shit. Probably would have been easier just to follow along with that. Think Deku fucked something up by pulling me back up. Bakugo pauses, giving Kirishima a moment to say something if he wants to. But nothing fills the empty space. Kirishima is giving him the opportunity to say what he wants in his own words without judgment. 
his own story without interruption. I'm not a good person. He starts up once more. Especially not back then. Deku had no reason to do what he did. I tormented him for years. We grew up together, and as we got older, I just... He was a piece of shit. A cocky brute of a kid who thought the world revolved around him. He was smart, strong. People praised him near constantly, and it all went to his head. He took it out on Deku, Midoriya, who he saw as weaker than. He was cruel, and still, even now, he doesn't understand why Deku was always so nice to him. Why he forgave him to the point that they're friends now in adulthood. Having mended as much as they were able, even if Bakugo still doesn't think he should have been forgiven. In high school, it just got worse. I got attention. Bad attention, eventually. Some gang figured I would be a promising new recruit. I was an asshole, but they wanted me to be a certain type of asshole that actually hurt people. Not that I hadn't before, but this was... He swallows down the lump in his throat as he remembers. He didn't think he was such a terrible person until they asked. Said he was just like them. Could really go places if he wanted to with all the spitfire he had boiling up in his guts. It was different. I wasn't like them. Like that. I didn't think at least. Or didn't want to. Unaware of his own actions. Or rather, unaware of how his actions affected other people. How others perceived them and in turn perceived him. Being praised all his life. Being able to get out of any situation unscathed without even thinking about it. Coming out on top with no one punishing him for it. It came to a head. It turned sour before he knew it, and suddenly he was looking into the eyes of people who said they understood him. They knew how he felt. Strong, smart, better than anyone else around him. He could be so much better, so much stronger, dangerous. Bakugo's hand curls into a fist against Kirishima's chest, trying to steady his nerves as he remembers. Put enough power behind it that maybe he can edge his trembling away, while at the same time make his skin hard enough that he can't feel how heavy Kirishima's heart lumps behind it. I said no. Told them to fuck off. They kidnapped me. He lets it all out in one breath, just like the singular moment in time it was. He recalls how his therapist always said he didn't have to downplay the event. It happened. It was traumatic. So Bakugo could talk about it like that. Could actually say how it hurt. How he was scared. He was a 15-year-old boy. He's allowed to react like the near child he still was, and that's always been one of the most difficult things for him to accept. It takes him a little while longer to continue, to get all his thoughts straight, to not be so self-destructive for once. Obviously, that wasn't great. But besides just being roughed up, some cuts and bruises, I wasn't really hurt. Not physically, at least. It wasn't like I'd be useful to them dead. They tried to persuade me. Threatened me, threatened my parents, all that bullshit, you know. I still told them to piss off. How long were you with them? It's the first time Kirishima has said anything since he started talking about all this. His voice is low, level, and Bakugo wonders if he's making it so for his sake. He still can't look him in the eyes. It took two days for the cops to come after them find where they were keeping me. Tied up, dehydrated, hungry. Again, he's told he was lucky, that he was brave. And Bakugo never hated hearing anything more. It turned into a firefight. They weren't going to let him go easily. He was supposed to be their promising new recruit, see the world the same way they did and want to tear it down alongside them. Obviously, getting caught, especially in a main headquarters, wasn't part of the plan. Even now, Bakugo tries not to think about it too much. He's talked about it enough with therapists, with his parents, with his teachers that put a hand on his shoulder and said it was okay to not be okay. He was allowed to be hurt, admit that he was hurt, let himself feel that and let it process. He always hated it. There was so much gunfire. So many hands grabbing at him, trying to steal him back or pull him to safety. A fire started, some sort of explosion. Destruction of the city buildings crumbling around everyone and Bakugo was the one stuck in the middle of it all. He was the reason it happened and the reason why everyone was there. He doesn't realize how silent he has gone until Kirishima touches him. Brings him back. 
It's just a light graze of his cheek. Something so soft and hesitant it couldn't have been interpreted as violent. Bakugo tilts his head up and looks. Kirishima is staring back at him with the same type of eyes that have yet to judge him. That gave him space when he asked. That smiled at him, laughed with him. The same eyes that love his friends, his family, and that same look of innocent, open concern that rescued him from a snowstorm. That pulled him from his crushed car with an are you all right and still look him in the eye when he was an asshole. He's too good. Bakugo doesn't deserve that. People got hurt. Good people. One of the detectives was seriously injured. Never recovered. Found out that he died three days after the fact. He's crying. He's getting Kirishima's pillows wet. His brain tells him to stop, but his body won't listen. He died and it was my fault it happened in the first place. Survivor's guilt, his therapist told him. He couldn't blame himself. The actions of others did not reflect back on who he was. He could not hold the blame for this, but how could he do anything else when he was specifically taken because of who he was? It aided him. The nightmares started up after a few weeks. He did a good job of hiding them, but eventually they came out as the terror and trauma built up. He nearly died twice. He should have just died once. Talking helped, says Bakugo, trying to move past it all. Learned how to process, cope with it, I guess. The nightmares come and go still, but it's been manageable until I'm thrown into situations I can't control or unknowns. But you still blame yourself. Kirishima interrupts him with no bite behind the words. He wants to understand more than anything. Bakugo moves his hand, his limbs feeling heavy, to pull Kirishima's fingers away from his face, interlace them together to hold. My entire life after a point has been trying to make amends. I became a firefighter specifically to help people. All we're supposed to do is help people, but it's hard when your intentions are still selfish. I'm still in it for myself to make myself feel better. Like I said, I'm not a good person. Kirishima squeezes his hand. I don't think you're a bad person. He doesn't hesitate saying any of those words. Bakugo's not sure if Kirishima is capable of lying and it hurts. He can feel the tears start to well up again, silently gathering at the corner of his eyes to pull as Kirishima continues. I think you're complicated, like anyone else. I think you're learning and you're trying, which is kind of the only thing we can do, right? So I think that makes you far better than you believe yourself to be. It's okay to be a little selfish sometimes if it means trying to help yourself heal. He's crying, he knows, because Kirishima wipes at his eyes with a gentle swipe of thumb only helping to spread the wetness across his cheek and clump his eyelashes together. He doesn't mind, because Kirishima doesn't mind him. Bakugo wraps both of his arms around Kirishima's neck, awkward and uncomfortable lying on their sides as they are, but Bakugo needs him close right now. He buries his head into Kirishima's neck, smells the scent of lingering sweat, sex, and the woodsman he's come to learn is solely Kirishima over the past few days. He cries quietly because he's cried so loudly in the past, has screamed and pounded his fists and questioned everything about everything, asking why and let out all the anger, aggression, confusion, and sorrows he's had. He doesn't want that. He doesn't feel anger here. No reason to fight and bite and claw. He's warm, wrapped up in strong arms and worn out blankets in a handmade cabin way out in the snowy woods. He feels protected, heard. Even with all the torment still rattling around in his head, he feels like he can get it out slow. Let it go with a steady stream of tears because it's not fixed, but it's better. It'll continue to be better. Thanks. Bakugo whispers into the damp skin of Kirishima's throat. For saving me. I don't think I've said that yet. Kirishima kisses the top of his head, hands rubbing up and down his back, but not letting go. Anytime. They say nothing else. The glow of dawn approaches through the window, but neither are ready to get up. It takes a few more minutes, but eventually they both fall back asleep, lulled into a gentle slumber by the steady breathing of the other and the warmth both of them feel tangled together so close. Bakugo's last thought before he slips back under is one he doesn't think he's ever had before. It doesn't scare him like he might have thought, 
coming over him so subtly that just for a moment he doesn't understand, but then knows it's not a lie, not a fluke, laying here in this man's arms on the cusp of Christmas morning, and just for this moment, this second, he doesn't push it away, doesn't ignore it, embracing it like a warm ember in his palms, not caring of the tender, blistering skin or burnt ash that may mar his skin after. He mouths out the words into Kirishima's throat, wondering if his lips can say without the sound. Press it so deep into his pulse that when Kirishima's blood makes it back to his heart, he'll know. And so, Bakugo sleeps. At this moment, he's content with that what if. We'll hold the hope close and not think of it going away so quickly. He'll have time to mourn after. Right now, it's okay. He'll sleep. Hiroshima is gentle. Where he put bruises last time, he creases Bakugo's skin as if an apology for leaving them, to the point Bakugo feels he might need to reassure him that their previous night was exactly what he had wanted. What they both had asked for, and there was no reason to say sorry for that. Still, he moves slowly, and the lighting, he admires him. Work rough hands moving along his thighs, his hips, looking too large in Bakugo's own eyes. It's nice. Kirishima kisses him any time he asks and more. He leaves him gasping, arching up under his every touch as if they had fallen in bed like this more times than they had any right to. He keeps trying to push his way up, to tell Kirishima he too was deserving of letting someone else take control, but Kirishima quiets him with a kiss, with a gentle thumb running over his cheek, lips, neck. He says the Bakugo's done more than enough to deserve an extra present. Even if it feels good, even if Kirishima leaves him breathless, leaves him clinging to the sheets with a sharp cry as he comes, as he's fucked past the point until he feels like he might come again, still soft, just from the feeling of Kirishima and how perfectly he fills him up, stretches him, drives into Bakugo like he's the only thing that matters. There's panic under his skin, bubbling up in his stomach, a feeling of dread that leaves him a little dizzy with the combination of sex and lack of breath. He tries to ignore it, focus solely on the sensation of Kirishima holding him, fingering him, fucking him. It works for a while. He's learned how to keep up pretense as well, even if he's internally falling apart. Kirishima knows nothing of the turmoil going on inside of him, only the high blush on his cheeks and the moans coming from his lips as they finally collapse onto the bed, tangled in the sheets, panting. It's good. Bakugo's body is humming with the afterglow of orgasm, overly warm and sticky in Kirishima's arms as they shift until pillows are beneath their heads and the sheets mostly cover their bodies. And then Kirishima holds him, wraps his arms around Bakugo's waist to pull him in, presses right up against his back and nuzzles into his hair, peppering more kisses at his neck. Everything about it being warm, intimate. Their bodies touch from head to toe without a barrier in the way. He can feel as Kirishima's chest expands at his back, his heart beating, the way his fingertips just brush his stomach, uncaring of how messy they both might be. Good night. Bakugo feels as though he might suffocate if Kirishima holds him any longer. He doesn't move. Good night. As soon as he closes his eyes, he knows what will happen. Bakugo would be an idiot to think otherwise as though he were good enough to push aside his past trauma like it didn't make up his entire life. Every choice made in a fruitless attempt to do better under the mask of healing. He's a liar. When he wakes up, he's shaking, sitting up in bed already, panting hard as his limbs shake without his command to do so, sweat beating down his back, his legs stick to the sheets, breathing out of control. Hey... Bakugo feels a hand at his back and immediately twists, slapping it away and in the process almost tumbles from the bed as he jerks to escape. He catches himself though, still trying to catch his breath, and he stares back at Kirishima looking with wide eyes at him in the dark. They look worried, scared, lost. Bakugo doubts he looks any better, more wild probably, 
like an animal trapped in a corner, knowing the only thing he could possibly do now is strike out. It's his default. Claw his way out. Snap at Kirishima. Fight. Yell. Run. He could. Technically. I'm sorry. Kirishima raises his hands, showing that he's not going to attack him. Bakugo wants to scream that he should be the one trying to prove he's not dangerous. I didn't mean to startle you. You were just screaming and and thrashing, and I didn't know. It's fine. Bakugo manages to get out. His throat feels raw. It sounds too forced and too harsh, like it's trying to push him away, and right now he's not entirely sure if he actually is or not. It's, It's got nothing to do with you. That's not entirely true, but Bakugo doesn't want to hurt him any more than he already has, than he already will. Pushing him away now would be the easiest thing to do. He throws his legs over the edge of the bed, placing his feet flat on the ground and starts the process of calming his breath. He counts to ten, quiet under his breath, making sure he's able to hear his own voice, before looking up to call out the furniture in the room. The dresser, the nightstand, there's the door to the living room, the door to the bathroom, the windows with the curtains not perfectly pulled across so he knows it's still fully dark outside. He breathes, runs a hand through his hair to feel himself, takes notice of how the strands feel against his fingers, and when he gets too close to his forehead, the little sharp pain from the cut still healing over. He's awake, fully, knows this, knows it's just him and Kirishima in the room, can still feel the hands on him, Hear the shots of gunfire, the smoke. Bakugo breathes. He stops shaking. There's nothing else here in the room. No one else but the two of them. And it's okay. He's safe. It takes another three minutes for him to lay back down. For him to repeat that he's safe. That no one else is hurt. That no one will be hurt. Before he's able to get back under the covers and remind himself not to lay flat on his back. Sorry. He says, because Kirishima is still looking at him as if he wants to reach out and help him, but doesn't know how. It just happens. Kirishima doesn't touch him, but he does pull the blankets back up so Bakugo's shoulders aren't exposed anymore. Under the blankets is still so warm from Kirishima's body heat, a nice little nest of comfort and darkness that Bakugo has to resist the urge to curl up into and never come out again. Don't worry. Kirishima says with a smile, the best he can do when he's so lost. I just wasn't expecting it to be so bad for you. Are you going to be okay to go back to sleep, or do you want to get up? He wants to help. Kirishima is a fixer, but he doesn't know how to fix this. Bakugo wants to tell him he's sorry again, that he wishes he was that easy to fix. We should sleep. It's still late. Kirishima silently agrees, dozing back off slowly, still facing Bakugo just in case. But this time, he doesn't touch Bakugo. He doesn't crowd him or hold him, because Bakugo hasn't said anything. He hasn't given him any information for what might help or hurt, and it should be fine. Because that's how it's always been, after all. Bakugo settles back into the bed without a fuss. He's good at it. He's practiced. In college, he had a roommate, and after the second time it happened, he knew he couldn't keep being so rattled. Rumors would spread. People would talk. Bakugo is the guy who has nightmares so bad he wakes up thrashing, shaking. A tough asshole like that can't handle a little bad dream. He refused. He had to do better. So he learned. He hid it. He forced his body into submission even when he wanted to scream. Forced it to stay calm to lay in bed staring at the ceiling, counting backwards from 100 over and over again as his heart raced in his chest, adrenaline pumping, his body telling him he was in danger, he should run, he needed to protect himself, fight or flight, and yet Bakugo would stay silent, breathe. It was just a stupid fucking nightmare after all. And here he was now, doing the same thing with Kirishima, covering himself up, saying it was fine, turning his back so he didn't have to face him, didn't have to see any looks of concern or pity. He wanted Kirishima to go back to sleep. It was better for him. There was no reason to fret over Bakugo. He's a grown-ass man still scared of the fucking dark. He needs to be better than this. Yet. 
There's a part inside of him, a small part, that tugs him back and says no. Maybe he didn't have to. Maybe Kirishima deserved better than that. Maybe this time he could learn to be better. Bakugo never really cared about being palatable. He didn't care if people would think he was a complete and utter asshole, refused to be his friend. He didn't need to lower his voice or censor his words. He never wanted to. But it was so much easier having people be angry with you, be fearful, to have them think you were unapproachable and off-putting than pathetic. He could take their little comments about his attitude, but he couldn't take their pity. The way they looked at him like he was something to be coddled, to be protected, to say, what were you, and give him some pitiful little attempt at friendship or smile because they felt sorry. Bakugo could never handle that. He didn't want anyone knowing his weakness. Didn't want anyone to have an excuse for why he was the way he was. He felt whole as he was. He didn't feel like there needed to be a change. Still, he hid. But maybe with Kirishima, he wouldn't. Bakugo rolls back over. Even with these movements, he tries to be as silent as possible. To keep himself still, in place, a non-issue. He places a hand against Kirishima's chest, staring at where his fingers touch skin. Unable to move his gaze up to look him in the eyes. Not yet. He can't face him yet. Ijiro. Bakugo licks his lips. His throat is so dry, he needs water. His voice is barely audible. Can I tell you about my nightmares? He's never. Not with someone like this. No one outside of his parents, his therapist. No one has ever known or heard. Some people know the story, but no one really knows the effects. Kirishima's hand covers his own, doesn't move it, just holds. It's so gentle, so intimate, Bakugo can feel his throat close up. If you want, comes the reply. Not pressing, no force, leaving it in the air for Bakugo to still choose. Yeah. He breathes, the single word shaky in the dark. I think I do. I've almost died twice now, when I was younger. He starts. He isn't looking at Kirishima. He thinks if he actually sees his face, his reactions, he'd chicken out and back off. Right now, his nerves might be frayed, but they're steady enough for him to keep talking. To dig up the past, he tries too hard to forget, so maybe Kirishima might understand some part of himself that no one else does. That even he has a hard time coping with at times, because Bakugo trusts him enough to lay himself bare and pray Kirishima will still be there after. Even if it's for a little while. Because this doesn't matter, right? Another two days, maybe. That's all they'll have left. He can give Kirishima this at the very least. In middle school, I nearly drowned. It's part of the nightmare sometimes, but not the majority. It's just that feeling of choking. It's so shitty, because you know what's happening. I didn't pass out. I just couldn't breathe, and every time I tried, it just made everything worse. Inhaling all this water and mud and... He sighs, pausing long enough to collect himself, tracing a line down Kirishima's shoulder, curving along the muscle, feeling the warmth under his touch. It took a really long time for someone to help me. I thought for sure I was done for honestly. But then the stupid idiot Deku came and saved my ass. It's so stupid. Bystander effect, his therapist once explained. When everyone else sees something terrible happening but thinks someone else will be the one to jump in to help. When everyone thinks, even as they watch, that it's such a tragedy. But not enough for them to do anything. Someone else will. Someone of authority. Someone more important. Deku was the only one to break it. Him jumping in broke the trance everyone seemed to be in, and before Bakugo actually passed out, lungs full of water, he came back up choking, coughing, dragging horrible wheezing lungfuls of air even as he threw up. People say he was lucky. He was brave. Bakugo always hated it. I think I should have died then. Bakugo says in his next breath. Under his hand, Kirishima tenses. You know all that bullshit about the universe having a plan or some shit. Probably would have been easier just to follow along with that. Think Deku fucked something up by pulling me back up. Bakugo pauses, 
giving Kirishima a moment to say something if he wants to, but nothing fills the empty space. Kirishima is giving him the opportunity to say what he wants in his own words without judgment, his own story without interruption. I'm not a good person. He starts up once more. Especially not back then. Deku had no reason to do what he did. I tormented him for years. We grew up together, and as we got older, I just... He was a piece of shit. A cocky brute of a kid who thought the world revolved around him. He was smart, strong. People praised him near constantly, and it all went to his head. He took it out on Deku, Midoriya, who he saw as weaker than. He was cruel, and still, even now, he doesn't understand why Deku was always so nice to him. Why he forgave him to the point that they're friends now in adulthood. Having mended as much as they were able, even if Bakugo still doesn't think he should have been forgiven. In high school, it just got worse. I got attention. Bad attention, eventually. Some gang figured I would be a promising new recruit. I was an asshole, but they wanted me to be a certain type of asshole that actually hurt people. Not that I hadn't before, but this was... He swallows down the lump in his throat as he remembers. He didn't think he was such a terrible person until they asked. Said he was just like them. Could really go places if he wanted to with all the spitfire he had boiling up in his guts. It was different. I wasn't like them. Like that. I didn't think at least. Or didn't want to. Unaware of his own actions. Or rather, unaware of how his actions affected other people. How others perceived them and in turn perceived him. Being praised all his life being able to get out of any situation unscathed without even thinking about it. Coming out on top with no one punishing him for it, it came to a head. It turned sour before he knew it, and suddenly he was looking into the eyes of people who said they understood him. They knew how he felt. Strong, smart, better than anyone else around him. He could be so much better, so much stronger, dangerous. Bakugo's hand curls into a fist against Kirishima's chest trying to steady his nerves as he remembers. Put enough power behind it that maybe he can edge his trembling away, while at the same time make his skin hard enough that he can't feel how heavy Kirishima's heart lumps behind it. I said no. Told them to fuck off. They kidnapped me. He lets it all out in one breath, just like the singular moment in time it was. He recalls how his therapist always said he didn't have to downplay the event. It happened. It was traumatic. So Bakugo could talk about it like that could actually say how it hurt, how he was scared. He was a 15-year-old boy. He's allowed to react like the near child he still was, and that's always been one of the most difficult things for him to accept. It takes him a little while longer to continue, to get all his thoughts straight, to not be so self-destructive for once. Obviously, that wasn't great. But besides just being roughed up, some cuts and bruises, I wasn't really hurt. Not physically, at least. It wasn't like I'd be useful to them dead. They tried to persuade me. Threatened me, threatened my parents, all that bullshit, you know. I still told them to piss off. How long were you with them? It's the first time Kirishima has said anything since he started talking about all this. His voice is low, level, and Bakugo wonders if he's making it so for his sake. He still can't look him in the eyes. It took two days for the cops to come after them. Find where they were keeping me. Tied up, dehydrated, hungry. Again, he's told he was lucky, that he was brave. And Bakugo never hated hearing anything more. It turned into a firefight. They weren't going to let him go easily. He was supposed to be their promising new recruit. See the world the same way they did and want to tear it down alongside them. Obviously getting caught especially in a main headquarters, wasn't part of the plan. Even now, Bakugo tries not to think about it too much. He's talked about it enough with therapists, with his parents, with his teachers that put a hand on his shoulder and said it was okay to not be okay. He was allowed to be hurt, admit that he was hurt, let himself feel that and let it process. He always hated it. There was so much gunfire. So many hands grabbing at him, trying to steal him back or pull him to safety. A fire started. Some sort of explosion. 
destruction of the city buildings crumbling around everyone and Bakugo was the one stuck in the middle of it all. He was the reason it happened and the reason why everyone was there. He doesn't realize how silent he has gone until Kirishima touches him, brings him back. It's just a light graze of his cheek, something so soft and hesitant it couldn't have been interpreted as violent. Bakugo tilts his head up and looks. Kirishima is staring back at him with the same type of eyes that have yet to judge him. That gave him space when he asked. That smiled at him, laughed with him. The same eyes that love his friends, his family, and that same look of innocent, open concern that rescued him from a snowstorm. That pulled him from his crushed car with an are you all right and still look him in the eye when he was an asshole. He's too good. Bakugo doesn't deserve that. People got hurt. Good people. One of the detectives was seriously injured. Never recovered. Found out that he died three days after the fact. He's crying. He's getting Kirishima's pillows wet. His brain tells him to stop, but his body won't listen. He died and it was my fault it happened in the first place. Survivor's guilt, his therapist told him. He couldn't blame himself. The actions of others did not reflect back on who he was. He could not hold the blame for this but how could he do anything else when he was specifically taken because of who he was? It aided him. The nightmares started up after a few weeks. He did a good job of hiding them, but eventually they came out as the terror and trauma built up. He nearly died twice. He should have just died once. Talking helped, says Bakugo, trying to move past it all. Learned how to process, cope with it, I guess. The nightmares come and go still, but it's been manageable until I'm thrown into situations I can't control or unknowns. But you still blame yourself. Kirishima interrupts him with no bite behind the words. He wants to understand more than anything. Bakugo moves his hand, his limbs feeling heavy, to pull Kirishima's fingers away from his face, interlace them together to hold. My entire life after a point has been trying to make amends. I became a firefighter specifically to help people. All we're supposed to do is help people, but it's hard when your intentions are still selfish. I'm still in it for myself, to make myself feel better. Like I said, I'm not a good person. Kirishima squeezes his hand. I don't think you're a bad person. He doesn't hesitate saying any of those words. Bakugo's not sure if Kirishima is capable of lying and it hurts. He can feel the tears start to well up again silently gathering at the corner of his eyes to pull as Kirishima continues. I think you're complicated, like anyone else. I think you're learning and you're trying, which is kind of the only thing we can do, right? So I think that makes you far better than you believe yourself to be. It's okay to be a little selfish sometimes if it means trying to help yourself heal. He's crying, he knows because Kirishima wipes at his eyes with a gentle swipe of thumb only helping to spread the wetness across his cheek and clump his eyelashes together. He doesn't mind, because Kirishima doesn't mind him. Bakugo wraps both of his arms around Kirishima's neck, awkward and uncomfortable lying on their sides as they are, but Bakugo needs him close right now. He buries his head into Kirishima's neck, smells the scent of lingering sweat, sex, and the woodsman he's come to learn is solely Kirishima over the past few days. He cries quietly because he's cried so loudly in the past, has screamed and pounded his fists and questioned everything about everything, asking why and let out all the anger, aggression, confusion, and sorrows he's had. He doesn't want that. He doesn't feel anger here. No reason to fight and bite and claw. He's warm, wrapped up in strong arms and worn out blankets in a handmade cabin way out in the snowy woods. He feels protected, heard. Even with all the torment still rattling around in his head, he feels like he can get it out slow. Let it go with a steady stream of tears because it's not fixed, but it's better. It'll continue to be better. Thanks. Bakugo whispers into the damp skin of Kirishima's throat. For saving me. I don't think I've said that yet. Kirishima kisses the top of his head. Hands rubbing up and down his back, but not letting go. Anytime. They say nothing else. The glow of dawn approaches through the window, but neither are ready to get up. It takes a few more minutes, but eventually they both fall back asleep. 
lulled into a gentle slumber by the steady breathing of the other and the warmth both of them feel tangled together so close. Bakugo's last thought before he slips back under is one he doesn't think he's ever had before. It doesn't scare him like he might have thought, coming over him so subtly that just for a moment he doesn't understand, but then knows. It's not a lie, not a fluke. Laying here in this man's arms on the cusp of Christmas morning, and just for this moment, this second, he doesn't push it away, doesn't ignore it, embracing it like a warm ember in his palms, not caring of the tender, blistering skin or burnt ash that may mar his skin after. He mouths out the words into Kirishima's throat, wondering if his lips can say without the sound. Press it so deep into his pulse that when Kirishima's blood makes it back to his heart, he'll know. And so, Bakugo sleeps. At this moment, he's content with that what if. Will hold the hope close and not think of it going away so quickly. He'll have time to mourn after. Right now, it's okay. He'll sleep. When Bakugo wakes up again, he's alone. Maybe he thinks he should just get used to it. He's done it for the entirety of his life up until this point, so it shouldn't feel as disappointing as it does when he looks over to find the pillows of blankets disheveled, but empty. His body feels heavy, mind foggy. It's probably later than he meant it to be by the looks of how bright the sun is shining through the curtains. Getting out of bed, it feels like he's been hit by a truck. Like he just finished an 18-hour shift at the firehouse and only just went to bed a few hours ago before having his alarm go off. Like wrecking his car a few days ago was finally taking its toll. Mentally and physically exhausted, but still, he drags himself up and out of bed with his stomach being the driving force, just ahead of his irritation of being alone. The bathroom is empty after a quick inspection, so Bakugo pulls a blanket over his shoulders and shuffles out into the living room, which is also empty but the soft echo of music does welcome him. It's soft, but he recognizes the song instantly, Last Christmas by Wham, a song which is practically on repeat over the course of the holiday season in every store he goes into, and here, even in the thick forested town hidden away in the mountains, it still haunts him. Typically he'd be annoyed. One of the things he hated most about Christmas, besides the overly affectionate people and the blinding decorations, was the music. The same list of songs on repeat over and over for a month straight every single year until you die. He's threatened physical violence on work shifts that had more than one hour of holiday songs playing over the speakers in their lounge, and Asa physically holding him back because Todoroki found it funny and Kami genuinely liked the overplayed melodies. Standing in the hallway just beyond the kitchen right now had him feeling an entirely different reaction. Hearing the stupid freaking song softly play out over a radio or phone filling up the space of the kitchen and den, but just behind it, a little off-key and softer even, is Kirishima's voice singing along. He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to know what those words sound like when coming out of his mouth. But here he is, frozen in the hall, just listening to the offhand singing of Last Christmas in a manner that suddenly has his chest aching. The anger he felt upon waking up disappears. He schools his expression, clenches the blanket a little tighter in his grasp, and steps forward. There, in the kitchen, stands Kirishima, who looks much the same from the first morning Bakugo woke up in this house. He's shirtless, only in his boxers, stirring the contents of a bowl while singing. At his feet, Riot lays on the tile, making his owner dance around him. At the sight of Bakugo in the hallway, the dog lifts his head and lifts out a boof of hello. Immediately, Kirishima turns around with a smile on his face to greet him. There's what appears to be a little bit of flour dusting his collarbone. Morning, Bakugo. Merry Christmas. He smiles back at him. Merry Christmas. It's genuine. He's not saying it out of obligation, he realizes. Not some automatic response to end a quick store-run interaction or the kind of grunted-out words he would say to his parents typically come this very morning last year or all the years before. No, he says it instead, wanting to. Wanting someone to know for the first time in a very, very long time that it was supposed to be a time of celebration, that he was happy. Bakugo moves to lean over the kitchen island, peering in on what the other man could possibly be making while not wanting to get in the way. He's suspecting pancakes by the batter being beaten away in the bowl. There's a pan heating up on the stove. 
Another right behind it that sizzles with bacon, and a pile of strawberries sits on a cutting board on the counter, washed and sliced into messing-looking chunks. He smiles, looking up at Kirishima, who is back to whisking the batter in hand. Need help with anything? Nope. Kirishima is quick to respond. You just stay right there. You've been cooking for me all week, and I'm finally repaying you. Bakugo shakes his head. Promise it'll be an edible paycheck. Kirishima grins. I'll do my best. To his credit, it is. The pancakes themselves are a little too browned on one side, and Kirishima filled the pan with too much batter, making them squish together, but they're good. The bacon is crisp, and the strawberries are ripe, and Bakugo has nothing bad to say at anything as they settle into Kirishima's little table nook and eat. How are you feeling? Kirishima asks as they start. It surprises Bakugo, but he doesn't let himself bristle like he typically would. He refuses to get defensive with him. Tired, he says honestly. I think I'm ready for a full night's sleep soon. I'm sure. I know all this hasn't been the easiest for you. We've just got a few more things to do today. Ciro's cakes to drop off, and then we typically all get together for dinner. Kirishima starts to ramble. Bakugo watches him do so. It's the kind of mindless, filling up, empty space sort of rambling where Kirishima doesn't seem to want the silence that could otherwise be in its place. Bakugo lets him. He lets him, and he just watches him speak for a minute. Maybe it's two. Just to let his eyes gaze over the man that sits just across from him. He's still shirtless, sitting in the kitchen nook, unfazed by the winter chill that seeps in through the window so close by. The sun is shining brightly through the glass gold falling across tan skin to make it shimmer. Bakugo looks at him from head to toe, making sure it's all saved forever to his memory. Eijiro. Bakugo interrupts. He stares down at his half-eaten plate, the pancakes having soaked up all the syrup pulled over them already. He doesn't even like sweets. I'm going to leave tomorrow. There's silence. Dead, heavy silence. He was almost expecting something more. Kirishima sighs. I know. They don't talk about it any further after that. They finish breakfast and move to get ready. Still, quietly, they take their time. They shower together again, slowly washing the other before pressing together for a kiss. Making out under the fall of water, grabbing at shoulders, arms, legs washing and rewashing just to continue touching with an excuse to do so, not entirely wanting to be the one to say they're finished. It's when the water grows cold and they both start shivering, goosebumps breaking out under their fingers that they finally decide to exit. It's a struggle to get dressed after that, to pull on their clothes, their shoes, for Kirishima to call Siro to say they're on their way when really they don't truly want to leave or let go. But they do. They walk outside Kirishima's front door, lock it behind them, and head towards Kirishima's truck with Riot happily prancing through the new blanket of snow. They don't speak on it anymore out of desperation to ignore it and the clock that's now ticking down between them. But it's easy for them. Easy to ignore. To throw to the back of their minds and drive towards the motel like nothing is wrong. To park, get out of the car, and smile at Kirishima's friends like their time isn't limited. Throwing around Merry Christmas as everyone steps around each other, dancing in the small space of the diner's walkway. Saro has boxes upon boxes of cakes stacked up on the restaurant's counters, counting out each to check off a list he holds in his hand as Ashido and Kaminari tie red bows for decoration. Okay, so we have 25 going out. Saro states with a little clap as he finishes his list checking. Kirishima, Bakugo, here are your addresses. Kaminari, you're with us. Tetsu family, I'm begging you to drive like normal humans and not destroy my cakes. I was up all night decorating them. You spin out one time and mess up a few cakes. Seven. You messed up seven. They were still edible, just a little ugly. More bickering ensues. Saro reprimanding Tetsu Tetsu. Tetsu Tetsu getting defensive. Ashido comforting Saro. Itsuka comforting Tetsu Tetsu. 
Kaminari pipes in at one point to ask why he can't get a car to just go by himself to make it faster, and five other voices pipe up that he's not safe on the road after and while it's snowing out. Apparently, there's a lot of voice concerns wondering how he made it up here in the first place, and then Kaminari is the one to get defensive, snapping back that he's a perfectly good driver, that he's never spun out and run any cake. It starts all over again. There's no true venom in anyone's voice, as it all goes around in a big circle of how dare you and storytelling of past Christmas cake deliveries. Bakugo watches from the edges of it all, looking in. He listens to the conversations overlapping one another as best he can, and wonders how this strange circle of people have kept their friendship so well over these years of growing up. There's something akin to jealousy that starts to eat away in his stomach, but that's not quite right. It's this sudden ache to not be on the outside, to want to know the inside jokes and be a part of the stories they all seem to be fond of talking about, a fleeting feeling of longing where he can't be. Eventually, they all calm down and grab up cakes, armfuls of boxes as much as each can be carried out to cars and trucks, careful to place them in back seats and, in some cases, strap them down so they don't shift too much. Bakugo finds his lap piled with cake boxes, having been given the job of quality control to keep them safe. There are a few down at his feet as well, carefully placed so he cannot easily kick them, but still warned nonetheless. Kirishima holds their list of addresses, driving off as the other groups split off into various parts of town from their assignments. It's only a few minutes down the road that Bakugo suddenly remembers his conversation days ago with Saro, the realization of somehow shoehorning himself into this tradition. Did you deliver these with your mom when she was alive? Kirishima's eyes don't leave the road, so Bakugo can't see his expression fully, but the corner of his mouth does twitch up. Yeah, every Christmas morning. After breakfast, we'd all pile into the car and drive around giving people cake. Saro did it with his grandma, too. She's technically the one that started it all. At first, it was just neighbors, you know. People close by and an extra cake or two. But people loved them, and some people couldn't do it themselves, so we started a full plone delivery service. He says. No charge or anything. They just liked baking. Liked giving and sharing. Sign-ups start in October if people want one, and we drive them out every Christmas so people can have it with their families giving, sharing, the community looking out for one another and being kind just to be kind. Bakugo can see the appeal. They drive down one street into a small neighborhood lined with older houses that look like they're being swallowed up by the snow. All dotted along the hillside with Christmas lights just shining through with fresh white fall from the previous night. Trees scattered among them, barren and white, some with lights of their own. There's decorations of deer and Santas just like the one on Main Street though not as enthusiastic or abundant. They drive slowly and stop at each listed house, Bakugo handing over one cake at a time for Kirishima to carefully jog up to doors and knock. He hands each box over with a smile and a small conversation. Each townsfolk took the time to speak with him, though Bakugo could not tell what was being said from his place still in the car, but he could imagine. Holiday pleasantries, then asking about Kirishima, how he's doing, his brother, his dad. The possibility of awkward fumbling over the mention of his mom or all-out blatancy of an apology for her loss still. A small prayer, a request to maybe come by and shovel snow whenever he could. After the holiday, before the new year. Bakugo can see elderly couples in doorways or parents with babies on their hips. Toddlers with grabby hands snatching up the box of cake before their parents, dashing off back into the house to rip it open. Kirishima carves out time for each and every one of them, not looking to rush anyone not minding as he stands out in the snow for however long it takes. He's kind, caring, wants nothing more than to make the rest of his community happy in any way he possibly can. Bakugo knows he shouldn't hate an entire town, but he's growing more irritated with them by the second. He wants to be greedy, but knows he can't. All right, just two more. Kirishima says, jumping back into the truck to heat up his hands for a few moments. I'm going to run this one up here. Do you think you could maybe take the last one next door for me? Bakugo sputters, trying not to make a face as he hands over one of the two cakes left. Honestly, he doesn't want to. The truck is warm. He doesn't know these people. Why would he want to go greet one with a cake? Don't worry. Kirishima is quick to pipe in. Apparently, Bakugo couldn't hide his distaste fast enough. It's just Dr. Shuzenji. You'll be fine. 
He leaves little room to argue as he's gone from the truck in the blink of an eye, practically running up the walkway of his last house. With a sigh, Bakugo makes sure his scarf is tightly coiled around his neck before exiting the truck. He trudges up the sidewalk to knock on the door, cake in hand, hoping for a quick departure. Oh, I wasn't expecting you. The woman who answers the door is smaller than Bakugo remembers. Much of that night is a blur in his head already. He can only recall the pain, the aches, and the annoyance of nearly dying. But Dr. Shuzenji is small, a shawl wrapped around frail shoulders and a walking stick in her hand. I'm helping Kirishima out, he says. Merry Christmas. The words come out robotically as he tries to hand over the box and turn tail, but she doesn't take it, instead turning to wave him into the house as she shuffles off down the hall. Reluctantly, he follows, feeling more awkward the further and further he gets into her house. The place is all stone and wood, old but warm with a fire smoldering in a living room he passes. There are pictures on the walls, old black and whites of people looking stoic at a camera that's still a new function of the time. There are a few more modern ones, the colors in them slightly off and faded. But these, there are young women in them all smiling, posing for the shots in living rooms and by creeks. Shirt sleeves and pants tied up high, hair pulled back, walking down rocky paths in the woods. I see you're feeling much better. The cut on your forehead you've been taking care of? Yes, ma'am. He remembers his manners as they stop in her kitchen. He places the box on her counter, watching how she pulls the stool out to step up, happily tearing open the box to reveal the strawberry shortcake within. It's all still neat perfectly iced and piped with the strawberries sliced and placed upon mounts of whipped cream with more strawberries piled high in the center. She swipes a finger through the perfectly made whipped cream topping, messing up the symmetry of the cake to pop the dollop into her mouth. That Kana's boy does do the good stuff. It took him ages to get it right. She talks to him like he knows who Kana is, like he knows Saro's struggles in making his grandmother's cake correctly. He thinks maybe that's just a give with this place that so many people never change that it's not uncommon to speak as if everyone around you knows the history. It's not strange. From the sounds of things, it's not usual to have new people come to stay for long. It's not usual to have to explain the past. Bakugo feels more and more like he needs to leave. Here. Dr. Shuzenji grabs his hand in a strong grip, unforgiving as she curls his fingers open and places two little wrapped candies into his palm. Tell Kirishima he should be at home. Boy has a guest for the first time and he thinks he needs to spend the day running errands. On Christmas. His mother is cursing him, I'm sure. Bakugo looks up at her, blinking. His mother. Yes, all she ever wanted was those two to be happy and he's still around delivering cakes and shoveling driveways. You tell him to go home. Her tone is unquestioning forcing another yes ma'am from his lips before she's bringing him back out the front door, candy in hand, and a message to pass on. All finished? Kirishima asks once he's back in the truck. Bakugo glares softly, handing over one of the wrapped candies which Kirishima happily takes and pops into his mouth, a peppermint. Yeah, I just got scolded for you. Really? She said you work too much. He laughs in return, heading back towards the inn, not fearing any wrath from the doctor at all. But Bakugo doesn't forget her words as they make their way back. It's made even more evident when, upon returning and eating a light lunch, Kirishima heads outside with a shovel from his truck to start clearing the pathways of the inn. It's not asked, unprompted, and Bakugo just sits on his stool in the diner watching him shovel snow. Since he's been here, he noticed that Kirishima hasn't stopped. Beyond the actual force of nature that was a blizzard to keep him pinned down, Kirishima doesn't appear to like being in one place for long. He runs around town doing things for people near constant, not appearing to want to stay still long enough to do much else. Even the moments they've had together, alone, private, was because they were driving or the night had fallen. So there was little else to do. Ashido. Oh, he calls out, still staring at Kirishima, slowly piling the snow up along the edges of the sidewalk. Why does he do that? She comes out from the kitchen, a teapot in hand, and pours a few mugs full. Do what? Keep working. 
She follows his gaze to peer out the window, watching Kirishima move up and down the end to clear the path. Oh, it's a distraction. It keeps his mind occupied. He doesn't talk about it anymore. Anymore? She pauses, sighs. After everything that happened with his mom, he never really, I suppose, processed is the right word. It's not like he ignored it, but he just kept moving, working, anything to distract himself, but that's all it is. He stays in one place, but he keeps moving in circles. He watches Kirishima pause in his clearing, putting the shovel up against the wall and kneel down into the small snow pile he has created, starting to press it all together into a ball. He does it again with more snow, packing as much as he can into it before piling the two on top of each other. It's all crunchy, lopsided, smudge gray from the snow in the walkway, but still, Kirishima pokes out two little holes and carves a curved smile onto the makeshift snowman's face. He stands back and Bakugo catches him smiling, hands on his hips, looking proud at his strange little creation. He's the happiest I've seen him in a long time since you've come here. Bakugo sputters, turning to face Ashido, who's not even looking at him, but staring much like him at Kirishima, who's far too pleased with the snowman. I didn't mean to, you know. She snorts. Didn't need to be on purpose. I'm still happy you're here. He's happy you're here. He doesn't have the heart to say anything to that. He's a stranger that was never meant to have these interactions. He's supposed to be up in a ski resort avoiding his parents for a week and staying up on a mountain until the dark makes it dangerous and his legs want to give out under him. He's never supposed to have met Kirishima or Ashido or any of the rest of them. He's just a coincidence making it worse by intermingling. Bakugo was never meant to be here, which means he's never meant to stay. Bakugo cannot voice how this happiness is not permanent. They don't go back to Kirishima's house. They stick around with this group of old-time friends to play games, sing songs, and day drink a little. They end up out in the empty streets of downtown, running through the day-old snow, crunching new paths in the ice, and falling down in piles to make monstrous snow angels smeared across the street. Eventually, the rainbow of streetlights flicker on with the setting sun, making the disappearing light almost not even matter beyond reminding them they should eat. Saro and Ashido head in first, with Ashido shoving her ice-cold hands under Saro's shirt, making him yelp, shoving at his girlfriend who laughs even as his cold hands grab at her cheeks in payback. Tetsu Tetsu and Itsuka are next to follow their stomachs, and Kaminari soon after that, complaining of the night getting colder as his nose burns red. And there, together, leaves Kirishima and Bakugo, laying in the middle of the snow-covered street, watching the sky above them slowly turn from pale blue to dark. The stars coming out to pinprick the sky. Their breath spirals above them on every exhale, coiling up to dissipate as they continue to look onward. They lay just close enough that their hands touch outstretched. The cold is starting to seep in. Bakugo's back feels numb even through his layers. He can feel how his shoulders are starting to shiver with it. His stomach rumbles. He moves to stand, but Kirishima's hands grip his, holding him, keeping him still. Not yet, he says in a whisper. Not yet. They eat. It's not a quiet affair, but Bakugo can't help but feel choked. He wants to tell Kirishima they should leave, but doing so would likely break whatever spell this is, so he sucks it up. He eats everything that is served, even if it's tasteless in his mouth. Even the cake. One that has clearly been made with an extra layer of sponge compared to the others delivered earlier that morning. is like mush on his fork. He hates it. He knows it's good, but with that knowledge and the time that keeps ticking away, he feels like he simply can't bring himself to enjoy it. He finishes it still, wipes his plate clean, and manages a smile of some sort all the same. When they arrive back at Kirishima's, the lights are on. The display illuminates the entire yard and looks just as beautiful as it had the night before. Bakugo packs. He's not sure if faster or slower is better in this instance, which means he just sits there staring at jeans and socks for far, far too long until finally, somehow he blinks and all his belongings are put back in the bags they came in. Stacked up in the spare bedroom that he hasn't slept in for a few nights. 
He makes his way towards the other side of the house, blanket thrown over his shoulders in a manner that feels natural, and climbs into Kirishima's bed with him, laying atop his chest and their legs tangled together under the blankets. Everything is warm. The weight of Kirishima next to him feels familiar. It's cruel to do this to them both at this point. Hey. Bakugo says, breaking the silence they're under. I'm going to ask you one more thing. Yeah. Just stay here until I wake up. Actually stay. Bakugo feels the rumble of soft laughter through his chest. Okay. Only because it's still technically Christmas. It's a joke that Bakugo doesn't believe for a second. Still, he wraps his arms around Kirishima, settles in, and falls asleep holding on to him. Just in case. When he does wake up, Kirishima is still next to him, sleeping, snoring softly, hair in his face. He has one arm thrown up over his head and the other thrown across Bakugo's waist. His movements wake him up. Kirishima lets out a little groan, huffs, then drags Bakugo in with both hands to bury his face against his neck, mumbling something into his skin about it still being early, which it's not, but Bakugo is kind enough to say nothing. They stay like that a while longer, just until the sun looks bright and warm and Riot insists on not being ignored any longer. Slowly they rise. They change. They head outside. There's no breakfast. No burnt coffee or helping hand in the kitchen or sitting at a table for two with the forest being their view outside. Kirishima helps Bakugo pack his bags in the car as Bakugo remembers which pocket he put his keys in. Nothing is lost or forgotten or left behind. Bakugo corrects the position of his seat before starting up the engine, which comes to life with a quiet rumble, sounding like there would be no reason not to. Still, there's a pause. A moment after everything is settled, right before Bakugo puts the car into reverse to pull out of the driveway, through town, and back towards the highway. He looks up at Kirishima, who looks at him, the pair staring in the cold morning air the day after Christmas. Kirishima is the first one to break the quiet. He smiles. Bakugo would be disappointed if he did anything less. It was fun. He says. Bakugo feels his chest tighten as he replies. Yeah, it was. Kirishima leans forward to close the distance between them, kissing him one last time. Both of their lips are chapped from the cold, sticking together as the moisture is quick to connect and want to freeze, but is easily broken as they pull away. One more. Just one more to remember it by. Thank you. Kirishima says against his lips for everything. Bakugo cracks his own smile, sharp. He tries. I think that's my line. They break apart. Kirishima backs away, the distance between them feeling so much more than the five steps Kirishima takes. Bakugo puts his car in reverse and pulls away, the distance growing further. He can't manage to look in his rearview mirror to watch Kirishima wave him goodbye. Can't manage looking back to see the handmade cabin in the woods, covered in Christmas lights and feeling like home disappear beyond the tree line as he turns down the road. He keeps his eyes straight, focused, and unwavering as not to look at the other homes speckled in the hills or the street that would lead downtown where he's sure Ashido and Saro and Kaminari still sleep. Even as his vision grows blurry and tears slowly slide down his cheeks, Bakugo simply grips the steering wheel tighter and pushes his foot down against the pedal harder. He can feel the sharp edges of his heart stabbing into his lungs. He follows the signs towards the highway, down the mountains, and towards his entire life below. Bakugo doesn't look back. He drives on. Kirishima watches. He stands in the middle of his driveway watching. He watches Bakugo pull away and watches his car grow smaller in the distance disappearing down snow-plowed and salted streets that he helped with. He carved the path allowing Bakugo to leave, and so he must watch him go. He stands there watching for a long while. Bakugo's car has been out of sight for minutes now. There's nothing else around, nothing to make a sound besides Riot crunching through the snow just a small distance off. The dog finishes his morning stroll and comes to stand beside his owner in time. 
sitting right beside him and looking up as if to wonder why Kirishima hasn't moved from his spot. He appears frozen in the cold, mind distant as he simply stares at the tree line and the small patch in between where he last saw Bakugo's car before it escaped his view. Quiet, calm. The world around him with his cabin in the woods feels big and vast and empty. It feels so far away and distant from everything else sitting on the edge of the world where no one else can see or find him. Riot whines. The sharp noise breaks Kirishima's spell as he looks down at his dog, his only companion, and smiles. After all these years, he's gotten used to the empty aching that's made a home in his chest. Well, come on then. He sighs, giving Riot a pat on the head. Let's get you some breakfast and head out, yeah? The dog barks in response tail wagging slowly as he finally trots off when his owner moves and they head back inside for food. He makes Riot his breakfast and doesn't think about coffee. He moves around in his world, feeling like everything's been tilted slightly on its axis. Kirishima finds his usual routine easy enough. Feed the dog, change clothes, put on shoes, warn Ashido and Saro that he was heading over. One, two, three, back and forth. The exact same thing he's done day in and day out, even when Bakugo is still here. But now he does it. Slower. It feels off. He thinks he should maybe clean tonight. Not that Bakugo was very dirty to begin with. Looking around at his living room, keys in hand, scarf wrapped around his throat, he looks to see what can maybe be done when he comes back. His bed is actually made, however. All the used towels hung up. He could change the sheets, put fresh linens out, but the idea of actually washing them leaves his stomach twisting. All of the spare blankets have been picked up and folded, thrown over the arms of the couches, or nestled into the little baskets he keeps specifically for them. There are no dishes in the sink to clean. The guest bedroom has been picked up, bed made. No trace of Bakugo remains beyond the absence of the lamp at the bedside table. The fireplace has even been cleaned. Old ash swept out, new logs in place. He wonders when that happened. He thinks of all the little things Bakugo had to touch along the way. Kirishima sighs and pushes cleaning to the back of his mind. He loads Riot into his truck and drives away. He thinks about taking a left for a second towards the highway. It's fleeting, but still there. A pool of want. But he pushes that down much like he's done everything else and takes the ride headed in towards downtown. You're up early. Kirishima grins as he passes by Kaminari, who slumped over on the countertop of the diner. Steaming mug of coffee in his hand still filled to the top. He looks half dead. Kaminari manages a groan, obviously not dead. Would it be bad if I told you I hadn't actually slept yet? Kirishima takes a seat right next to him couldn't sleep. Not that. I was giving Atoshi some company because he couldn't sleep. Ashido comes out from the back of the house, moving through the double doors with a small tray of food in hand. His boyfriend's an insomniac, so Kaminari falls victim to it too. Apparently, he didn't realize the sun was coming up. She sets down a plate piled high with pancakes smothered in fresh cream. Now eat your carbs, go into a coma, and I don't want to see you again until noon. She pulls the mug of untouched coffee from his hands, replaces it with a fork which he doesn't protest at. He slides the plate closer to him, humming happily as he starts cutting into them. Kirishima is not sure at this point if he even needs the extra help, or if pushing him down onto any soft surface would have Kaminari passing out immediately. By the way, where's your boyfriend? Ashido nods at Kirishima. I can put a fresh pot on for him. Kirishima sputters a bit, sitting up a little straighter, trying to not focus on how much he likes the idea of that when it's already out of his grasp. He's not my boyfriend. He quickly corrects. Fine, future boyfriend. Kirishima tries to ignore her, not dwelling on it. He left this morning. He had to get back to his own life. Aww. Kaminari pouts, cheeks full of food. He didn't even say goodbye? Rude. Well, when are you seeing him again? I'm sure he'll be busy going into the new year, but after that? Kirishima pauses, 
blinks. He stares at Ashido, who stares right back at him, looking almost just as perplexed by his confused expression. What are you talking about? Ashido stares. Kaminari stops eating. The blonde looks very suddenly more awake than he did just a second before. You did get his number, right? Said, don't worry, I'll call you. You can come visit and snowboard any time. Kirishima looks more and more confused by the second. Why would I do that? Everyone in the room stops, stares. The entire restaurant is completely silent beyond the soft sizzling of a grill from the kitchen window. Ashido finally breaks that silence with a voice that's soft and quiet as she whispers out, I'm gonna kill him. What? You better come in here before I kill your stupid friend. What? What? Ashido's got a foot up on the counter before Saro comes out of the kitchen, apron around his waist, a spatula in hand. He stepped out into utter chaos. Kaminari is wide awake now as he gets mixed up in the mayhem in an attempt to get Ashido and Kirishima separated. She's got her hands out, grabbing, clawing, pulling Kirishima closer to her as Kirishima tries to push her away. But her hands are quick and her nails are long like talons sinking into his clothes. She's mostly on the countertop now, one foot dangling behind her as she tries to get the height advantage and loom over Kirishima in an attempt to make him suffer. What the fuck is going on in here? Saro cries out as he looks upon the tangled mess of bodies that are his friends and girlfriend. I don't know. Kirishima is quick to respond. Bullshit. Ashido says right back. He let Baka go leave. He didn't even get his number, Hanta. He what? Saro throws himself into the mix after setting down his utensil. They're a mob of limbs and half-shouted words all grabbing at one another. The extra force of Saro being added to the mix knocks Kirishima off his stool and has him tumbling down to the ground. Ashido and Kaminari coming with him to land heavy on top. They scramble and curse, still continuing to wrestle even on the floor. Saro runs around the corner and grabs Ashido by the waist, quickly lifting her up and pulling her away. Somehow he manages to get her claws out of Kirishima's clothes, so she's dragged off, kicking and screaming, while Kirishima and Kaminari lay there on the cold floor, now panting, still gripping one another. You need to calm down. The hell I do? Ashido snaps. Kirishima finds the perfect guy and he just lets him go? Kirishima sits up, rubbing at his cheek where Ashido got a good swipe in. How's he perfect? He lives hours away and he has his own life. He was just here by mistake and I helped him and then he left. That's what was always going to happen. That's because you just assumed. She's still flailing, even as Saro still holds her up off the floor so she can't get a good stance to attack again. You didn't even want to try. What's there to try? Everything. This last part came as a surprise. The word yelled from Kaminari's mouth, not Ashido's. Kirishima sits there on the floor looking at Kaminari, who's glaring at him. He looks up to Ashido and Saro, who both look just the same. Aggravated, angry, disappointed. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand why they're so angry about it all. There was never anything there. Nothing substantial to hold on to. They lived in two completely different worlds, and only just ran into each other by a freak chance accident that in the end meant nothing, as it didn't change either of their situations. Kirishima had his life here. Bakugo had his life back in the city. He didn't know why they couldn't see that. I think you guys are too hopeful. No, Ashido says. We just saw how happy you were together. How fucking happy you made each other. We had fun. He made you cry, Ichiro. Like, good crying. This comes from Saro, who finally puts his girlfriend down when she doesn't immediately look like she's going to jump back into the fray. In fact, they all kind of look a little... sad. He's a guy who hates Christmas and everything to do with it, and still had the idea to decorate your house for absolutely no reason other than he knew it would make you happy. You. Someone he knew for, what, four days before that? He's just a nice guy. That's some bullshit. Kaminari huffs. 
He definitely seems like the type of guy who doesn't care about making people happy. Especially random people. Well, you weren't random people to him, he. Kirishima looks around, feeling lost. He doesn't know what to say, but the deep swelling in his chest makes him still want to defend having to say goodbye this morning. He needs the excuse to make sure he knows he did the right thing. The correct thing. Even if Bakugo was nice to him, and Kirishima was more than happy to share his home with him. His food, his bed, his life. I belong here. He tries again, turning his head down as to not have to stare at all their disappointment. He feels his stomach twist inside of him, trying to make all the lies line up in a nice, neat row. I can't just ask him to uproot his entire life. Oh, E. Ashido sighs, stepping back closer without the anger she had before. This isn't about him. It's about you. You don't belong here. His head snaps up, eyes wide. What? What? You don't belong here anymore. She says, words soft but firm. There's nothing for you here. But... And I mean this in the nicest way possible, E. Ashido falls to her knees in front of Kirishima, taking both of his hands in hers and squeezing them tightly. Your family left. All of us are moving on and getting married, and you're just... here. You need to move on, too. Her words feel like a cold knife sinking between his ribs, the tip sliding smoothly into his heart to pierce through the center. The world kind of goes sideways after that, his vision tilting and a sharp bell ringing constant in his ears, louder and louder so nothing else could be heard. He couldn't. He didn't know why. Why, she would say. Somehow, his voice is heard. He himself can't fully hear the words, but he can feel them vibrating from his throat and tumbling past his tongue and teeth. They sound so hollow, he feels gutted. But it's my home. This is my home. My house. It's just a house. Ashido interrupts before he can spiral before his words and thoughts can hold firm in his heart. Her hands let go of his in favor of cupping his cheeks, tilting his chin up so he had to look her in the eyes. I don't know what it means to you, but you have to realize that's not the important part in all this. Your mother was happy there because you were there. Your father and brother were there and it was a home. But she would have been happy anywhere as long as she had you with her. That's what made it a home. You always make the excuse that you have to stick around to help everyone. Who will fix the fences, or who will put up the lights, or who will deliver food. But that doesn't all fall on you. We'll still be here. We can take care of it. You don't have to try to fill in the missing pieces anymore. Kirishima can see her eyes starting to grow misty. Tears collect in them and threaten to bubble over. Run her makeup she puts on every day with a practiced ease. He realizes then, looking at her, that he himself is also crying. One of her thumbs catches a tear, wiping it away from his skin. Ashido sniffles, trying to fight through. I know you miss her. You miss her so much. But staying up there in that house all by yourself is no way to honor her memory. She wanted you to be happy. To have someone to be happy with you, and you need to get that through your thick skull. She jabs him playfully on the forehead, hiccuping on a rough laugh. Right now, before you let it slip away. All your mother ever wanted was for you to be loved and happy just as much as she was. He thinks about Bakugo. About pulling him from his broken-down car half-buried in the snow by complete accident. About how he just barely saw his headlights, and if he had turned his head the other way in that exact moment, he would have missed him. Bakugo would have potentially died alone in that car, but he didn't. Hiroshima saved him. He saved him even when Bakugo was cursing, rumbling, when he seemed more inconvenienced by it than grateful. He thought of him waking up and being bullied out of his own kitchen, about how Bakugo hated the cold and drilled him on his fireplace safety, blankets thrown over his shoulders that Hiroshima himself remembered wrapping up in as a child. How he constantly made him food and was standoffish and tried to keep his distance. 
how still they seemed to fall together, tumble and connect. How Bakugo melded with his friends, baking, decorating, jabbing back and forth. How he felt under him, holding him. How his lips met his in a way that made Kirishima feel like he never wanted to stray too far. How it felt good having Bakugo at his side, within reach. How he looked against a backdrop of sparkling lights, of rainbow twinkling. Of how each tiny folded piece of paper hung with care must have hurt his fingers after a while, after so many being strung up, and still he continued on trying to make it perfect to give Kirishima a memory of his childhood that he himself had nearly forgotten. How when he watched his car disappear beyond reach that morning, how he just stared instead of acted. How he wanted so desperately to have stopped Bakugo from getting in that car this morning, drag him back, hug him close, and make him promise to never speak of leaving again. How Bakugo always said he made the best coffee, even though Kirishima knows that's not true. For some reason, it always tasted good to him. The kind of soft domestic hint that you don't notice until it's gone. The ease of happiness that creeps under your skin to make a home and warms you up so subtly that you can't remember ever being cold. Kirishima thinks about his parents. About the gentle touches and quiet moments and all the small brushes of love they built into their lives together. And knows that his mother would be so disappointed in him. He chokes. He's only ever wanted to make her proud what if it's already too late? Beside him, Kaminari snorts, rolls his eyes. It breaks the tension even as Kirishima still cries. That's bullshit, too. You think a guy like that has someone in the wings waiting for a rebound? Ashido throws a punch at Kaminari, slugging him right in the shoulder and making him wince. Don't be a jackass. What? I meant... Kirishima sighs out. What if it's too late to go after him? I already let him go once. And what if he doesn't feel the same? Then you try again. Saro says, coming to sit on the floor now with the rest of them. His smile is easy as he puts a hand on Kirishima's shoulder. We're not saying sell your house and never come back. We're saying put yourself out there and try. And? Ashido is quick to jump back in. Bakugo feels the same way. Trust me on that. You don't know. Ashido punches Kirishima this time, refusing to let his doubts settle in. Then let's find out, idiot. Again, I don't have his number. And he doesn't even have a working phone. Hasn't he been using your phone to call his parents this whole week? Saro asks. The world tilts back to being right side up. The empty hollow and hurt he felt gives way to the feeling of nerves and anxiety. The idea of chasing after Bakugo to see, ask, say words neither of them wanted to all week. It's the most hopeful Kirishima's felt all morning. Eventually, they rise from the floor with Kirishima stumbling to his feet as he reaches for his phone. His palms are sweaty, hands shaking as he opens it up to view the recent calls and finds two unknown numbers listed. His heart hammers in his chest. Which is it? Who cares? You know, the longer you wait, the further away he gets. Just pick one and call. Kirishima smashes his thumb against the most recent number, trying to steal his nerves as the chime of the phone ringing starts in his ear. It rings twice. The second in between feeling long and drawn out. All three of his friends can hear it through the speaker of the phone with how quiet it is. He's halfway through the third, thinking no one will answer. He'll have to call back or leave a message or... Hello? The drive home feels sluggish. The further Bakugo goes from the tiny mountain town still decorated with Christmas lights, the more he feels the weight of the past week settle in on his shoulders. He thinks twice about turning back. Once when he's still wiping at his eyes trying to stop the tears from clouding his vision and another nearly an hour later when his car makes a noise. Creaking and choking, and immediately Bakugo thinks he could go back, get it looked at. I thought you said you fixed it. He could say when pulling back up to the hotel. Stupid thing sounds like it could fall apart any second. But his car doesn't stop, and the noise only happens once, 
So Bakugo continues on through the mountain roads, keeping his focus straight ahead just like he had when he left, almost afraid to find out what he would actually do if he looked back. He tries not to think about it too much, though it's really the only thing on his mind for the first half of the drive. But as the winding highway and tree line turn a little easier, less inclines with the road slowly widening as nature disappears in favor of buildings, first speckled around and then growing more and more frequent, like its own urban forest cluttered together, reaching up towards the sun. Bakugo finds it a little bit easier to focus on what's ahead of him. Getting home. Going back to Cat. Having to get a new phone call his doctor to get looked at, call the firehouse to tell them he was in an accident but feeling fine and he swears he can go back to work. Bakugo floods his mind with everything in the city, everything that he's been living with before the last week, everything that will continue on after, and it makes it a little easier to continue driving. To pull up to his apartment building, to only grab one bag for now because he's tired, so tired, and let that fatigue settle in, let it creep down his limbs. Because it makes it easier to say all the heartache is just from lack of sleep instead of the thought of what he left behind. As soon as he gets up to his apartment, unlocks the door, drops his bag, and leans heavily against the wall as he kicks his shoes away, Cat is there. She comes to him quickly, meowing loud and nonstop, looking from Bakugo's perspective positively irritated. His apartment feels cold. He sighs, leaning down to her level so she can headbutt him, meowing right in his face as she does so. I know, I know. He says, scooping her up in his arms even as she continues practically screaming in his ear. I wouldn't have wanted to be left alone with Deku of all people for a week too, but it is what it is. I heard you got to fuck him up a little though. She scratches at her ears and she responds with more meowing before biting at his hand. Not hard, but enough that Bakugo knows he too will be on her shit list for a little bit. He takes the punishment as is, letting her chew and grasp his hand tightly with her claws as he walks over to the couch and falls on it with Cat still held in his arms. Bakugo knows he shouldn't sleep. There's so much to do. He needs to unpack. He needs to do laundry. He needs to go shopping for both him and Cat. There's his phone and his doctor and work. He should probably get his car looked at again, just in case. He should probably call his therapist with all the sleepless nights he's had. There's so many things that have gone wrong and right in the last week. So many things he still needs to deal with, to process, to handle. But right now, he can't think of any of them. He's on his own couch in his own home, with his stupid cat in his arms, surrounded by a place he feels comfortable, safe, if not a little bit less warm, a little lonely, with a little less sparkle in the lights. But he pushes all that away and decides, instead, to just let himself not think about it at all. Bakugo closes his eyes and falls asleep. It's two hours later. Maybe three, when Baka goes woken abruptly by pounding at his door. Cat is nowhere to be seen, likely hiding from the intense pounding as Baka go finds he wants to do much the same thing. But the noise is persistent. He tries his best to ignore it, but it keeps getting louder, more demanding, and finally he throws himself up with the intent to kill whoever is on the other side. You annoying son of a- And then the door jiggles. Knob turning, and is thrown open to reveal Midoriya standing there holding the spare key Bakugo lent him, his eyes looking just as wild as his stupid hair always does. Kachan! Bakugo interrupts, snarling. I thought I told you to leave the fucking key when you were done for the week. I don't want your sorry ass being able to come into my apartment whenever the fuck you feel- Then, from behind him, stepping into view, comes Kirishima. Kirishima, who he left behind this morning, who is now standing in front of him once again, looking almost like he just ran a marathon, panting softly with sweat on his brow, clothing looking a little disheveled and his hair pulled back into a messy little ponytail. He still looks so goddamn handsome, it hurts. 
Bakugo blinks. What the absolute fuck is happening right now? Bakugo. Kachan, you didn't tell me you met someone. Bakugo shifts, taking a step back. I didn't. Did. Didn't. But it shouldn't have. He groans, pinching the bridge of his nose. What the hell are you doing here, Kirishima? How are you here? I... He called me. Midoriya practically sings it, eyes wide and sparkling. At first, I was kind of creeped out, you know, but then he was explaining, and I think one of his other friends started yelling, too. Mina? Was her name Mina? And... Deku. Bakugo snaps. Shut up. He watches Midoriya shrink back a little, pouting as he snaps his mouth shut, even though he clearly wants to keep rambling about whatever the fuck has happened to get up to this point. You. Bakugo then snaps at Kirishima, who jumps a little. Bakugo crosses his arms, glaring. Explain. Kirishima hesitates, but steps forward after a moment. He looks big and out of place in Bakugo's entry. He's still wearing his winter coat, a peak of his flannel plaid shirt beneath, with wet spots of melted snow at his shoulders. He looks altogether awkward and sheepish, even being so big and broad as he is. And Bakugo wonders if this is how he must have appeared at first, standing in that hotel, meeting all of Kirishima's friends for the first time. And over his head, lost in a place he didn't belong. He shouldn't be here, just like Bakugo shouldn't have been there. I made a mistake. Hearing this, Bakugo stills. Kirishima looks awkward, still too big and too brash and too not where he's meant to be. But again, he steps forward and makes his presence bigger, makes room for himself, even if the fit is jagged. I made a mistake letting you go. His heart suddenly hammers and Bakugo's mouth goes dry. He stares at the man, stares at him as he gets even closer. As he gets so close, Bakugo knows if either of them reached out, they'd touch the other. He hadn't thought that would be something he'd ever be able to do again after the sun rose, and now that he can do it, that it's possible. Bakugo finds himself frozen, unable to do anything at all. But Kirishima isn't frozen. He's just as warm as ever and takes advantage by closing the distance between them to gently take Bakugo's hand, slowly unfolding his arms from his chest so he can really grasp them. Run his fingers over the back of Bakugo's hands while Bakugo worries he'll be able to feel just how hard and how fast his heart is beating now. I should have told you to stay. The entire world suddenly narrows down to the small pinpricks of existence. Just him and Kirishima. Everything else falls away, and Bakugo finds it all feeling otherworldly as his fingers tingle and his heart jumps even as his stomach twists into an endless knot. He swallows, trying to remember how his body works, how his jaw and tongue need to move to form words. He tries, even if they're all wrong. You know I couldn't. He says, ignoring the taste of bile on his tongue, of the warm hands holding his own. I don't belong there. This doesn't appear to deter Kirishima like he figured it would as the man smiles and squeezes his hands a little tighter. That's fine, because apparently neither do I. Not anymore, at least. Bakugo feels dizzy. What the hell are you talking about? You love that place. I know. Kirishima is quick to respond. I know, and I still do. I'll never stop, but there's... There's nothing left for me there. I... I need to move on and let go. And I didn't realize that until I watched you drive away and I wasn't the one driving off with you. What? Kirishima shrugs. And, well, Mina might have helped beat some sense into me. Bakugo thinks he needs to pull his hands away. He thinks he needs to tell him to leave, to forget about him, 
about all of this. Tell him that the past week was fun, but that's all it was and all it can be. You don't know me. He's been alone and likes being alone. He doesn't have to deal with people or friends or trying to navigate in territory he's unfamiliar with. It's better this way, he thinks. He tells himself. Everything that happened was all just a fluke. This isn't something more. Then give me the chance to know you. Because I think I'd really like whatever I find out. Bakugo chokes and then laughs. The noise is cracked and broken. He might be crying again for the second time today because of this dumb idiot of a man. But he's far too scared to reach up and touch his cheek to actually check. It's okay, however, because Kirishima reaches up with one of his hands instead to wipe at the tear falling down his cheek, ending with him cupping Bakugo's face right after. Again, Bakugo laughs. It all seems insane. Stupid. Altogether irrational and idiotic and irresponsible as well. Still, he recognizes it. He feels the pull, the way his heart beats so heavy, how he didn't think he'd ever see Kirishima again, and now that he's here, standing before him, touching him, that altogether feels so much better. The room is so warm. Did you seriously just drive, like, six hours to ask me on a date? Kirishima laughs too, leaning into Bakugo. Maybe. Are you gonna say yes? Maybe. Bakugo shrugs. But first. He leans over just a little, the world widening again, everything coming back into focus as he narrows in on Midoriya still standing by the door, looking all sorts of too happy and smug, standing practically on his tiptoes watching the entire scene unfold. Deku, you better leave my key and leave my fucking apartment. But I need to know. Bakugo reaches back and throws a pillow at him. You don't need to know shit. Get out of my apartment. Midoriya squeaks a little, but moves quickly. He practically throws the spare key down onto the counter and fumbles out the door before anything more solid can be thrown his way. Still pausing long enough to shout out a goodbye and good luck and to have Kirishima call him as soon as everything is settled. Bakugo would have chased after him if it wasn't for a strong arm wrapping around his waist to pull him back. Be nice. Kirishima scolds. He helped me get here. Besides, I think I already promised we'd go on a double date with him and his girlfriend. Bakugo glares at him. Kirishima rolls his eyes. Come on, he seems nice. I've got to meet your friends eventually, right? Eventually. Bakugo stabs a finger at him. I haven't even said yes yet. Will you then? Kirishima asks. Say yes. Bakugo pouts, but moves his arms around Kirishima, creeping up to wrap them around his neck as he hums softly in thought. Kiss me first and I'll see if you're actually worth it. Kirishima huffs shaking his head, even as he leans down to capture Bakugo's lips with his own, pressing close and holding each other, basking in the warmth as Bakugo happily kisses back, both having thought that their morning goodbye had been their last. Babe, I can't find my tie. Shit, we're gonna be late. Bakugo appears out of their bedroom just as the full-blown panic is starting to settle on Kirishima's face. He's at his side quickly to smooth the wrinkles from the shoulders of his shirt and ease the worry from his brow. I told you already, he says, making sure Kirishima is looking directly at him. This outfit doesn't need a tie. We're just going to have dinner. Relax. Easing him doesn't work very well, it seems. Dinner with your parents. Kirishima is quick to throw out. Christmas dinner. Bakugo scoffs. It's not even technically Christmas yet. It's only the 23rd. 
that doesn't make it any better as Kirishima looks like he'll sweat through his button up before they even get out the door. They do have to leave in the next 10 minutes or they will potentially be late, but Bakugo can't let his boyfriend go if he's in this much of a tizzy over a tie, or rather, meeting his parents, again, for the record. We've had dinner with them three times. They love you already, so stop freaking out so much. My mother might start to actually think she's important or something. She is important. I want them to like me. Ijiro. Bakugo puts his hand on Kirishima's chest, holding him still until he stops breathing so heavily, though he can still feel how fast his heart is beating at the very idea of going out to have dinner with his parents. His parents that have already approved and keep bothering Bakugo about the status of their relationship and if anything else exciting is happening. His parents who are over the moon to finally have Bakugo bring someone home. His parents who still comment about how good Kirishima is for him. They like you. They'll continue to like you. It's gonna be fine. When Kirishima breathes out this time, it's a little easier. The upturn of his eyebrows finally ebbs away as he leans into Bakugo's touch, wrapping his arms around Bakugo's waist as he presses his forehead against his own. I know, I know. Still just feels weird. That my parents are hidden away in a resort fucking right now. Bakugo snorts. I know, tell me about it. You're real fucking important for them to not have their holiday. This makes Kirishima smile, which Bakugo takes as a victory. That I'm living with you, Kirishima says. That I'm going to have dinner with your parents at all. Bakugo hums, rubbing his nose against Kirishima softly. You're right. And on Christmas Day, we'll be going to see your dad and brother and the new baby. Then after that, we get to drive out to visit all your friends. And have the baby shower for Itsuka. Fuck, please don't remind me that thick-headed cousin of yours is actually going to be a dad. Kirishima bumps his nose and Bakugo grins. We're gonna do all that, and it's all gonna be okay. You know why? Why? Because. Bakugo presses a soft kiss to his lips. We're together. Kirishima kisses him back, chasing after his mouth even as Bakugo tries to pull away. As hands start to wander, Bakugo needs to make the decision to smack them away instead of letting them go further, as much as he hates to do so. Bakugo leans back, pushing Kirishima just enough to not be fully tempted. If you start that now, we will be late, idiot. We have all of tomorrow to not leave our bedroom before heading to see your family. All right, all right. Kirishima sighs, letting him go. I don't want to be late. They both grab their coats, put on their shoes, and give Riot and Cat a quick pet goodbye before they go. Don't let her beat you up too much. Kirishima coos at Riot even as he lays there happily on the couch, tail slowly thumping away, with Cat curled up right next to him purring softly as she sleeps through the soft pets of goodbye. They're out the door and into the cold, pulling tight scarves and coats as they head to Bakugo's car. Still think you need to give her a proper name, you know. Kirishima says as soon as they enter the car, shaking off the small flakes of snow that collected in his hair from the short distance. I did give her a proper name, Bakugo argues but everyone shot it down. King Explosion Murder is not a good name for a cat. Fine. Bakugo shifts into gear. God Explosion Murder, then. Kirishima rolls his eyes, but can't help it as he leans across to kiss Bakugo once again over the console of the car before they pull out and Bakugo lets him. Let's him kiss slowly, take his time, Take the few seconds that they have left to just exist as them wrapped in each other's space, in each other's existence, with purpose and desire. Knowing how this almost wasn't, almost never, and now, a year later, they're here, 
living together, not needing to say goodbye as they share their lives and their friends and their families. How they have dinner with Bakugo's parents. How they'll spend Christmas with Kirishima's family, a family he barely managed to see before. How they'll bring gifts and food and little marbled papers to keep a tradition alive. How they'll go north to see all of Kirishima's friends after. How they'll still stay in Kirishima's childhood home and put up lights even with the holiday slowly moving away. How they'll wipe away dust and clean out the fireplace and make sure all the blankets and pillows are warmed. They'll keep this shrine to his mother alive, but still go home after to continue moving and existing and being happy together. Kirishima pulls away, just a breath, just enough to look in Bakugo's eyes and see him looking back. I love you, Kotsky. And here, how both of them thought this would have been too good to be true. Too good of a thing for a stranger to save a stranger in more ways than one. How dumb they would have been otherwise if they hadn't at least tried. Love you too, Ijiro. They kiss again, once more, in the cold of a car in the middle of winter with the sparkle of Christmas lights dotting the apartments and houses around them before finally pulling away to make their dinner reservations, not wanting to be late. 